Part 2. Chapter 17 of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 17. The Ship's Mystery Again. I expected a black mark for the lamb in every little desert difficulty, but to my surprise only our joys were remembered. Those who had stayed in Cairo exchanged tales with the desert travelers, and it was astonishing to hear what a marvelous week we had had. Each day had been better than its brother. In fact, our trip had been one long, glorious stream of golden sands and amethyst sunsets. The camels were as easy to ride as sofas, and combined the intelligence of human beings with the disposition of angels. The camp was as luxurious as the Savoy or the Plaza, and to me and that wonderful Antun Effendi all credit was suddenly due. Not to be outdone, the stayers in Cairo had had the time of their lives. They had not been herded together like animals in a menagerie, as in Colonel Corcoran's day. The girls had not only been to dances, but had danced with darling pets of officers, friends of Ernest Borrow, while their mothers had been asked to those fascinating picnics they get up in Egypt, don't you know, where you dig in ancient burial grounds and find mummy beads and amulets. Somehow or other, all these people attributed their pleasures to me, as they had blamed me for their mishaps, and my spirits were at the top of the thermometer three days later when, after some hard work, the enchantress Isis was ready to start up Nile. Sir Marcus wanted his tours to be different from every other Nile tour, and a little better. He wanted to show what he could do, and he was beginning well. Though the enchantress Isis had had a past under other owners, she looked as if this were her maiden trip, and she was as beautifully decorated as a debutante for her first ball. Her paint was new and gleaming white, her brass and nickel glittered like jewelry, and even those who thought nothing quite good enough for them uttered admiring ohs as they trooped on board. The highway of Egypt was a silver-paved road leading to adventure. The masts of native boats lying along the river bank were etched in black lines crowding over one another on the lightly washed-in background of blue. Nearby, the great Kasser el Nile bridge gleamed with color and life like a rainbow come alive, and the enchantress Isis looked as gay and inviting as a houseboat in fete for Henley Regatta. She was smaller than the most modern of the Nile boats, for she had been sold cheap to Sir Marcus by another firm, but she was big enough for his experiment, though he had turned some of her cabins into private baths and sitting rooms. Her three decks towered out of the water with a superior air of stateliness, such as small women put on beside tall sisters, and her upper deck was a big open-air sitting room. There were Turkish rugs on the white floor, and basket chairs and sofas with silk cushions. On the tables and on the piano top there were picture books of Egypt, and magazines and bowls of flowers. From the roof sprouted electric lamps with brass leaves and glass lotuses, and smiling Arabs in white from turban to slippers had blue larks flying wide-winged on their breasts. Oh yes, Sir Marcus was doing his clients well. That was patent at first glance and became even more conspicuous to the eyes of the set as they wandered into the dining saloon, drawing room, and library, or peeped into each other's cabins. Sir Marcus himself had come on board ostensibly to see us off, really to watch the effect of his boat upon Cleopatra. He lay in wait for her outside the door of her suite, the best on board, pretending to engage me in conversation, but forgot my existence as she appeared. The ecstasy on his big face was pathetic, as his brown eyes fixed themselves on a quantity of artificial blue lotuses she held in her hands. "'Do you like them, Mrs. East?' he ventured. "'Do I like what?' she inquired, that quiver of impatience in her tone, which she kept for her unfortunate adorer. "'The... those flowers,' he stammered. "'I... they're awful!' she exclaimed. "'The rooms are lovely, but these dreadful artificial things some silly person has stuck all over the place spoil the whole effect. I want to find an Arab to take them away. Or do you think I might throw them overboard? No one could like them, I'm sure. "'Of course, chuck them overboard, or hand them to me, and I'll do it,' said Sir Marcus, looking ready to cry. "'But they're lotuses, I suppose you know. I heard say you'd give anything to have some.' "'Not artificial ones,' explained Cleopatra. 
Belle Dame sans merci. I can't stand artificial flowers, even on hats, much less in rooms. Who could have put such horrors all over my salon? I don't know, Sir Marcus lied stoutly, but it shan't happen again. There ain't any real lotuses to be got, so maybe the, uh, the decorator, his meanderings died into silence, as he took the bunch of flowers from Mrs. East and viciously flung them as tribute to the Nile. After all, we oughtn't to do that, said Cleopatra. In the beautiful old days, real lotuses were given to the Nile. These are an insult. They aren't meant as such, the big man apologized, all joy in his fine boat and the compliments he had received crushed out of him. I knew now that he had hovered at Cleopatra's door, hoping for a cry of pleasure. Probably he had ransacked Cairo for the lotuses, or telephoned to Paris, before his cruel lady went from him into the desert. I was sorry for the boss, though a snub or two would be good for him, no doubt, and perhaps were being specially provided by a wise providence. But I had other things to think of than Sir Marcus Lark's love troubles. Monty, for instance, who at last had found a letter from Madame Wretched in Cairo, and had wonderful schemes in her head. On board the Laconia I should have thought such schemes obstinate and headstrong, the wish of a spoiled child to do something dangerous, to meddle in matters which did not concern her, and to have an adventure. But I understood the gilded rose a little better now. I began to see the real Monty as Biddy saw her, bright with the flame of courage and enthusiasm and passionate generosity, behind the passing cloud of superficial faults. She wanted everybody to be as fortunate and happy as she, and was prepared to be exceedingly trying and disagreeable in the effort to make them so. We had not been on board ten minutes when Biddy told me about the exciting letter, and escorted me to find it and Monty. Miss Gilder was in the act of insisting that General and Mrs. Harlow should accept her suite, and that she should take their cabin. The matter had to be argued out before she could spare attention for anything else, but as she made it clear that the Harlows were not to pay extra, their scruples were soon conquered. The baggage hasn't been put into the cabins yet, she explained breathlessly to me, so that's all right. In my astonishment, I forgot Madame Wretched. But why, I adjured Monty in my professional tone as conductor, why on earth should you sacrifice yourself to these people? What have they done for you? I thought you didn't like them. I don't, she replied calmly while Biddy listened, smiling. That's why I gave them my suite. At least it's partly why. I should think the other part of the partly is more convincing, I remarked, and Monty blushed. Perhaps you know that your friend Antona Fendi thinks me the most selfish as well as the most obstinate girl he ever saw, she said, and I don't intend to have foreigners like him go on doing American girls an injustice. Besides, maybe he's right about me, and I want him to be wrong. I hate having all the best things there are everywhere just because I'm rich. The Harlows wanted a suite, and they couldn't afford to take one. They were looking sadly through the door at my rooms and envying me, so I thought I would change. I was determined to change, whether they would let me or not. They're old, I'm young, and I shall enjoy thinking I've done something nice for people. I thoroughly dislike, as much as they will enjoy having their own bathroom. If Mrs. Harlow could hear you calling her old, gurgled Biddy. Well, she is old, and she's perfectly horrid, much more horrid even than Miss Hassett Bean, so I'd rather give my suite to her and her husband than anyone else. Biddy and Rachel are together, and Aunt Clara is alone. I'm robbing no one but myself. How do you know Antoon Effendi thinks you are selfish and obstinate? I inquired. Surely he wasn't rude enough to say so. He was, indeed, the day I would have the Coast Guard camel, and he came after me when it ran away, she confessed. And you're not to tell him about the suite. I didn't give it up to please him. I thought you did, I ventured, in order that Egyptian princes shouldn't do an injustice to American girls. I meant, she explained hastily, that I like to know they're wrong about us. And now, what was it that Biddy and you had wanted to say? Oh, poor Mabel's letter. How thankful I am to get it. I've been wondering if I dared write, and thinking all sorts of desperate plans. But Biddy thought we must wait till Wretched was off his guard. You see, we shall have to rescue her when we get to Asuit. I would have answered, but a look from Biddy enjoined silence. And so we were in touch with the ship's mystery again. I took the envelope, which was addressed to Miss Gilder in a distinctively American handwriting, strange to see coming from an Egyptian harem. The letter began abruptly and showed signs of haste. 
You were so good, I know I can appeal to you, but I'm not sure if there's any way to help me. I began to be frightened on the ship when he behaved so queerly just because I talked about the most ordinary things to one or two men. He made me stay in my cabin, but you'll remember that. Already it's like ages ago. I tell myself now that I was almost happy then. At least I believed I was his wife, and it was better than being poor and a governess to hateful French children in Paris. He was kind, too. He seemed to love me, and I thought it was like living in a romance to marry a Turk. He swore he'd never loved anyone except me, that he'd never been married, and that he wouldn't try to convert me or shut me up like Turkish women. But everything was untrue and different from what he said. I hardly know how to tell you, for you will think it horrible, yet I must tell. When I came here, I found he had a wife already, and a perfectly fiendish little girl. It's legal in this dreadful country to have four wives, but I don't care about the law. I want to get away. I've been cheated. This isn't marriage. I don't know what will become of me, for I haven't any money, but I'd rather starve than stay. I heard Mr. Sheridan say on board ship that it was easy to get a divorce in Egypt or Turkey. Maybe he meant me to hear, thinking some day I might be glad to know. But I can't get a divorce while I'm shut up in this house and watched. Now he suspects I want to leave him, since a scene we had about the wife, and he won't let me go out, even into the garden. You are my only hope. You'll wonder why I don't try appealing to the American consul here instead of to you. I suppose there must be a consul, as Suet seems a big, important town. I'll tell you why I don't. For one thing, there mayn't be a consul. For another thing, the woman who has promised to post this wouldn't do so if she guessed I was writing against my husband, who is her brother-in-law, and she would guess if she saw an envelope addressed to a consul, although she knows scarcely any English. I have to talk to her in French. He thinks she is devoted to him, and that she's explaining the Mussulman religion and ideas of a woman's life to me, or he wouldn't let her come. It's true, she is loyal to him, in a way. She wouldn't help me to escape. But I think women in the harems like to have secrets with each other, which they hide from their men. I've told her about you, how pretty you are, and a great heiress, and she's so interested she's dying to see you. She hopes, if she posts this letter, that you will call on me on your way up the Nile. She can, perhaps, find out what day your boat is to arrive, through her husband, and then she'll try to come to our house on the chance of meeting you. I'm almost sure she'll keep her promise and post this letter. If not, if he sees it, maybe he will kill me. I believe now he would do anything, but I must run the risk. Do come. Do think of some way to help. Mabel. I don't feel I have the right to any other name, for as surely as he has a wife, I'm not truly married. Well, asked Monny, as she saw me finish and fold up the letter. You were horrid about her at first, but just at the last minute on the ship you were good, and kept wretched Bay talking, so I might have my chance with Mabel. If you hadn't, I shouldn't like you as much as I do, and I'm sure even you'll be anxious to do something now. Yet we don't wish Ernest or Antoon Effendi to run into danger, do we, dear? Biddy suggested coaxingly. When you wanted to show the letter, I said yes, but... Monny listened no longer. Her eyes were sparkling as they looked straight into mine. Antun Effendi, she repeated. Tell me first, because you know you are his friend. What would he think about a case like this? Whatever he is, he's not a Muslim, I'm sure. Still, he's not one of us. You're sure he's not a Muslim? I echoed. What makes you sure when you know he's been to Mecca, unless somebody has put the idea into your head? His own head put it there, she answered. I saw it without his turban the night of the alarm in camp. It wasn't shaved, as I've read the heads of Muslim men are. It was a head like, like the head of every Christian man I know, except that it was in better shape than most. So, as he isn't Muslim, he might not mind our trying to help this poor deceived girl. Shall I ask his advice? I inquired, rather dryly, perhaps. She hesitated for an instant, then said, Yes. You seem certain that whatever he thinks, he won't betray your plan. I am certain, she replied, looking rapt. He's not the kind of man who betrays. You're right, I said. He's not the kind of man who betrays. He's the kind that helps. Though in such a case as this, you know, the very meany or forbidden. Still, we shall see. We could not see at once, however, because Anthony had not come on board. Even when the hour for starting arrived, there was no Anthony, no message from Anthony. "'Your friend isn't going to leave us in the lurch, is he?' asked Sir Marcus, watch in hand. 
He had meant to travel with us as far as Beni Hassan, our first stop, and return to Cairo by donkey and train, but had changed his intention and was going off at once. I thought I could guess why. The enchantress Isis ought to be underway this very minute, but Antun and you are our chief attractions. We can't leave him behind. I agreed. We could not leave Anthony behind, but I was not worrying. If he had to drop down out of an airplane, I felt sure that having said he would come, he would keep his word. So, while Sir Marcus stared at his watch and fumed, I rushed usefully about among the ladies who clamored for their luggage, or complained that their cabins were too small for innovation trunks. I showed them how these traveling wardrobes could be opened wide and flattened against the walls, taking up next to no room. I assured each woman in confidence that she had been given the best cabin on the boat. I dealt out little illustrated books about the trip. I advised people which tables to choose in the dining saloon, and consoled them when the places they wanted were gone. Still, the enchantress Isis had not stirred, and a rumor was beginning to go round that something had happened, when suddenly I saw Antun Effendi's green turban. "'Thank goodness,' muttered Sir Marcus, putting his watch into his pocket. And then Mrs. East came swiftly across the deck from the door of her own suite, where she must have stood watching, hidden behind the portiere. "'Oh, Antun Effendi!' she cried, and though her face was turned toward us, she did not seem to know that we existed. How Anthony looked at her we could not judge, for we saw only his back, but her eyes must have told Sir Marcus a piece of news. He glanced from her to Fenton, and from Fenton to her, with the expression of a schoolboy who has been punished for something he hasn't done. Then he turned to me as though to ask a question, but shut his mouth tightly, as if gulping down a large pill, wheeled, and left me without a good-bye. I wondered, Cleopatra fashion, what he had done in his last incarnation to deserve these heavy blows in the hour which should have seen his triumph. What if he changes his mind and doesn't want Fenton in me after all, I asked myself. To my surprise, I realized that it would be a genuine disappointment not to be wanted by Sir Marcus Lark. The mountain of the Golden Pyramid had nothing to do with this. It was borne in upon me that I had begun to enjoy the role of conductor, and certainly I was learning lessons in high diplomacy which might be useful in my career. Anthony, who was free as an eagle from questions of innovation trunks and how to give everybody the best cabins and places at table, looked as if he were bound for the island of Hesperides on a voyage of pure romance. The air of gravity and responsibility he had worn in Cairo and in the desert was gone with the starting of the boat. I knew suddenly, without asking him, that his mission had been of a far more serious nature than the transplanting of a sheikh's tomb, that there had been something else, and that it had finished at the last moment in success. "'Sir Marcus was worrying about you,' I said, when the importance of unpacking left the deck empty save for Anthony and me. "'You weren't, were you?' He was smiling at me in the friendly, confidential way that showed a happy mood. "'Not I. I knew you'd turn up, as you'd said you would. "'Thanks, my good duffer. But now it's over, I don't mind telling you that it was a toss-up. "'You mean there was a chance of your failing us, in spite of the mountain? "'Well, I meant to bring this off somehow, but my first duty was to finish up the Cairo business. "'I simply had to finish it, and I did. "'It was a rather bigger job than the Sheikh's tomb racket, though of course that was on the cards, too. "'Everything's all right now, but I spent last night in getting the full details of an Arab pilot to blow up the house of a rich cop who's been of great service to the government. Some of the young nationalists think that the Christian cops are put ahead of the Muslims by the British, and there are jealousies. The whole set of men concerned in this affair were arrested an hour ago, so all's well with the world. I'm free to turn my face toward the mountain of the Golden Pyramid, free to enjoy myself, though I must stick to my turban still. Are you getting tired of it? I asked. I've been tired of it since the first day I put it on. I don't like play-acting for long, but it was necessary, and it has had its advantages as well as disadvantages for me. I should have liked to ask another question, but dared not, so instead I told him about the letter from Bashid Bey's beautiful American bride, Mabella Hanum, the ship's mystery of the Laconia. Anthony listened as the enchantress Isis slipped past the island of Rhoda, past Giza, past old Cairo, and still older Babylon, then out onto the broad bosom of the river where the Nile Valley lay bathed in sunshine from Gebel Makatam in the east to the Libyan hills, haunt of departed spirits in the west. "'Miss Gilder wants me to help, does she?' he asked at last. 
She told you to tell me about this? I warned her that you mightn't approve, I explained. I said you had more knowledge of Egypt in your little finger than I had in all my gray matter, and you might think that nothing could be done. Tell her I think something may be done, he interrupted me, and before we reach a suet we'll plan out how best to do it. You and I? You and she and I. She has brains as well as courage. She? Of course, I mean Miss Gilder. Oh, is it of course? There are others who answer to that description. Fenton smiled. But it's going to be her show. She is under the impression, I reminded him laughing, that all Egypt, including the Nile, and you and your green turban, are her show. Anthony did not answer. Perhaps already he was thinking of something else. I should have liked to be sure exactly what his smile meant. Was it for Monty? Was it for Biddy? Or only for an adventure which he saw in the distance? End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter Eighteen The Asuet Affair. Nothing could be less appropriate to the spirit of the Nile than our spirit in setting out. We had turned our backs upon medieval Cairo, and our faces toward Ethiopia. Our minds should have teemed with thoughts of early gods and the mysteries of their great temples. But not at all. Medieval or prehistoric, it was all one to us in our secret hearts, which throbbed with passionate excitement over our own small affairs of today and tomorrow. Little cared we, as our white boat bore us southward, on the bosom of the sacred river, Little cared we for the love story of the great enchantress, pupil of magician Thoth, fair Isis, in whose honor that boat was named. Her tragic journey along this river, whose stream she could augment by one sacred tear, should have been followed by our fancy. We should have seen with our mind's eyes the lovely lady asking news of the painted boat, which carried the dead body of her murdered husband Osiris, asking always vainly until she thought of questioning the little children. But instead we thought of our own love stories and amusements. We played bridge and danced the tango on deck. We drummed on the piano or warbled the latest musical comedy airs. Above all, we flirted or gossiped about those who flirted, if for any reason we were off the active list of flirters ourselves. To be sure, we had brought learned books and took pains to leave them in our chairs, open at marked passages of deep interest to students. We even scribbled heterogeneous notes, if for a moment there were nothing more amusing to do, and bits of paper scampered wildly about the deck, informing those who retrieved them that Nub was ancient Egyptian for gold, that Osiris created men and women from the tears he wept over his own body, cut in pieces by Set, that the ivy was his favorite plant, or that scarabaeus was the Greek word for a blue-green beetle, which created itself from itself, becoming the symbol of eternal life. All this, however, was affectation. Each hoped others might think that he or she was not an ordinary tourist. Each wished to pose as a devotee of some phase of history concerning gods, temples, or portrait statues, anything not difficult to study up. But life was too strong for us. The color and glamour of the Nile got into our blood. Hathor, goddess of love, bewitched us into doing queer things which we should not have dreamed of doing if we hadn't drunk Nile champagne. Yet after all, what did it matter? We were absorbing what our hearts, if not our minds, called for, the enchantment of Egypt. More or less conscientiously, I performed the duties Sir Marcus Lark had bribed me to perform. I gave neat little lectures, and tried to remind people, whether they liked it or not, that almost every moment the boat was taking us past places of astonishing interest. The so-called tombs of Beni Hassan, the enchantress Isis stopped for us to see, in order that we might admire wall paintings in rock chambers, and gabble about Queen Hatshetsu, or King Seti, and his mother Paket, the beautiful lady of the Speos. But it was difficult to rouse emotion concerning things which we glided by without visiting. Ruined temples were everywhere, thick as flies, as I heard Harry Snell say to Enid Biddle. But why bother about them when finer ones were waiting further down on the menu card of the Nile meal? 
especially when there was a pretty girl to walk the deck with meanwhile. As for Tel el Amarna, the heretic king's great city, the general vote went against a visit to the ruins. Antun Effendi praised it as one of the most interesting places near the Nile, because with the exception of Queen Hatshepsu and Ramses the Great, Amenhotep IV was the most human personality in Egyptian history. But only Mani, who was making a hero out of Akhnator, really wished to delay at the disc worshipper's utopia. It must have seemed strange to the gilded rolls not to have her will prevail, but there was a clique on board who appeared to find pleasure in thwarting Mani. Her sacrifice to the Harlows was misunderstood. She had made it, said those who did not like her, in order to gain credit for unselfishness, or to have an excuse for displaying herself en route to the public bath, in a dream of a dressing gown and a vision of a cap, carrying a poem of a sponge bag. Rachel Guest was still mysteriously more popular than Monty, and was said to have had two proposals on the first day. She didn't want to get off the boat to see irrelevant painted pavements in the harem of Ankhenaten's royal palace, and her laziness won when the vote was taken. But what did anything matter if the glamour of the Nile was in our blood? Not one of us but thrilled to the droning cry of the Shadoof men on the brown banks, as the dripping water jars went up and down, tier after tier above the river level. Not one but felt a strange allurement in the passing scene, the dark mystery of palm groves, whose slender stems were prison bars against the shining sky, the copper glow of the mud bricks in piled-up villages, the color of the flowing water, where secret gleams as from flooded gold mines seemed to glint through masses of dead violets and floated with the tide. No eye so dull that it could not see how the shadows on land and water were painted at evening with a blue glaze, like the bloom on old scarabs and mummy beads, and broken bits of pottery that art cannot copy now. In her way, even Miss Hassett Bean felt the charm of the Nile, and its shores of brown and emerald and peacock purple. I don't call it scenery, she explained, except when the light is different, or there's some green stuff for cattle growing on the banks. Everything's the same yellow-brown, and nothing happens but palms and mud villages and shadoofs, and a few Arabs or camels or those ugly water buffaloes they say the devil made, to show what he could do. But the funny thing is, you can't bear to shut your eyes for a single minute for fear of missing a tree or a mound or one of those tall-masted gyasias loaded with white and pink pottery. They all seem so ridiculously important somehow. Then there's that bothersome north wind following you and trying to freeze your spine unless you pounce on the best seat where it can't reach. And if you put on your fur coat, you're too hot. If you don't, you're too cold. At night your bed creaks, and so does everybody else's. You hear a creaking all down the line when people turn over, which gets on your nerves. But you soon forget, and the whole experience is so perfectly wonderful that I'd like to spend the rest of my natural life going up and down on a Nile boat. Through the opalescent dream of these first days and nights shot the fiery thought of our mission in a suet. I had been surprised at first that Anthony, who knew so well the dangers and mysteries of the East, encouraged Miss Gilder to meddle in so delicate an affair, and there had never been any explanations between us. But I told myself that his motive was sympathy with Monty's desire to help, or else he had been tempted to associate himself with her in an adventure where again, as once or twice before, he had been able to win her gratitude. Perhaps both motives combined. As for Mrs. East, she frankly sulked. Intuition told me that she had never dared speak to Antun Effendi about the proposal in hieroglyphics, so difficult for me to explain, which she attributed to him. Never had she dared say, You have written me a love letter. Why don't you follow it up and give me a chance to answer it one way or the other? But it was puzzling her, disappointing her, if not breaking her heart, that he avoided rather than sought her on this glorified houseboat where the Egyptian prince was more or less a hero with romantic women. While we four planned, in thrilling whispers, how to rescue the ship's mystery, and Rachel Guest walked the deck with Bill Bailey or Harry Snell, Cleopatra was reduced to writing picture postcards. I thought if Sir Marcus had but the inspiration to reappear at some stopping place farther on, she might be ready to forgive him the false lotus flowers, and perhaps he would come, for the lark type is as difficult to snub as Cleopatra's needle. I was half inclined to send him a telegram on some excuse or other. 
We came to a suet in the morning, and it was to be a long stop, for there was much to see, and every one was excited at the thought of our first Nile town, a town already of Upper Egypt, which made it seem that we had come a tremendous way from Cairo. For us, Egypt existed no longer as a country, but as a golden-brown, purple-green riverbed and a flowing stream of history on which we floated. So it was for fun for those having no special mission to feel that once again bazaars and more or less sophisticated sights awaited their pleasure. I had given my after-dinner lecture the night before, trying to behave as if I were not boiling with emotion, and had told those who deigned to listen that Asuit, city of the wolves, was the capital of a province. I had babbled, too, about the tombs which self-respecting tourists must see, even if they hurry over the inspection of carvings, cartouches, and representations of very small queens smelling very large lotuses. Most Egyptian queens apparently spent much of their time lightly clothed and smelling lotuses, a ladylike pursuit for those about to have their portraits taken, in order to find time for the mummied cats, the bazaars, the silver scarves, the red and black pottery, and the images of wolves, crocodiles, and camels cheap enough to be freely bought for poor relations at home. Antun and I hinted at business which must prevent our joining the sightseers, who would be chaperoned by the dragoman. Luckily, they got the idea into their heads that our affairs were connected with Sir Marcus and the trip. We were pitied rather than blamed, but our real difficulty was with Mrs. East, as Monny did not wish Cleopatra to be let into the secret. If she knew, she would want to be in the adventure, and in Monny's opinion, Aunt Clara was a dear, but unfitted for adventures. We planned that Bridget and Monny should call upon the wife of Rashid Bey, whose house would be easy to find. If they were admitted, they would try to bring her out, as if for a drive, for it seemed a case of now or never if she were to escape. In case she were able to come, they would take her straight to the American consulate, which I was to visit meanwhile in order to explain matters. But if the rescuers were refused admission, the consul must be entreated to give help. I, as a diplomat, was considered a suitable person to deal with this side of the affair, and Antun Effendi was to keep unobtrusive guard within sight of Rashid's house until Bridget and Moni, with or without a companion, should come forth safely. As I said, however, the difficulty was Mrs. East. She would expect her niece, if not Bridget, to go about with her, and would not be easily persuaded to join any other party. As for Rachel, we need not think of her, as she had been annexed by the Biddles, who would otherwise have lost Harry Snell. But Cleopatra! What to do with Cleopatra? It was Anthony who had an inspiration. There lived near Asuit, it seemed, an Italian who bred Sicilian lapdogs, said to be like those which had been the favorite pets in the day of Cleopatra the Great. Indeed, Antony was supposed to have given one to the queen. Now, Fenton asked permission to present his Sicilian lapdog to Mrs. East, a dog so small, so polite, that he could be taken anywhere. Antony could not go himself to select the gift, but would find an interpreter as a guide to the kennel and bring her back to the exploring party. Cleopatra, delighted with her hero's thoughtfulness, caught at the idea, and when the set went tearing furiously away in Arabias or on donkeys, Mrs. East followed sedately in a carriage with the elderly Greek interpreter, and Miss Hassett Bean, who also fancied the idea of a Sicilian lapdog, to replace the lamented marmoset. Everything glittered at a suet. The sun glittered on the water, palm trees and gardens glittered as the wind waved their big green fans, the white or pink facades of large square houses glittered, those fine houses along the Nile, in one of which Rashid Bey was known to live. But brighter than all glittered the silver scarves which Arabs begged us to buy. Hanging over arms raised to show them off, the shining folds glittered like cascades of running water in moonlight. Very cheap, very beautiful, cried the merchants. Ladies, see here, your gentlemen, they buy for you. In spite of Antun's dignified refusals, putting the men off till our return, they ran after us, waving scarves and shawls and robes, white as scintillating hoarfrost, pink as palest roses, pale as sunset clouds, green and golden as Nile water, or sequined black as a night of stars. Their vendors feared that if we did not buy of them, others might beguile us, and saw danger ahead in a distant group of rivals crowding round some tourists from another boat. 
This group we had to pass, and as we did so, who should break out from the glittering ring but better? He came toward us, humble and cringing, giving the beautiful Arab salute. Dear gentlemen and ladies, he exclaimed, I am very happy to see you again. Won't you shake hands to forgive, because I meaned no harm, and did no wrong thing but to obey the sweet lady's wish when they would go to that house of the crocodile? I am too much punished when I've been sent away. That's past now and forgotten, said Monny, shrinking slightly from the outstretched hand. Perhaps it wasn't your fault, that trouble we got into, but we didn't need you afterward anyhow, and probably the people you are with now are nicer to you than we were. Oh, no peoples could be nicer, though they are very nice, my two gentlemen's you seed me with in the desert. They travel with me yet. We go everywhere by trains, because it takes not so much time as the boats. And Miss Guest, that nice good young lady, is she well? Yes, she is very well, replied Miss Gilder, beginning to be restless, her beauty-loving eyes avoiding Better's face, as had been her habit when the man was in our employ. She did not like to hurt his feelings. Monny can't bear to hurt the feelings of anyone below herself in Welter's situation, though apparently she doesn't consider that one is bound to be kind-hearted with the rich. But I could see that she wanted to escape. Never had she liked Better. He had been Rachel's man from the first. Miss Guest has gone to see the tombs, Monny explained. You not go there and to the bazaars? I take my gentleman in a few minutes. We shall go by and by. Just now we've other things to do, said the girl evasively, rather too evasively, perhaps. But in the hope of killing two birds with one stone, luring the man to betray his secret if he had one, and then shunting him, I broke in. How have you been getting on? I inquired, looking into the squint eyes. "'Since that night I saw you at Medinet al Fayum, "'But the eyes opened wide with a stare of innocence. "'You see me there, my lord? "'I thought your party had not come when we went away. "'My gentleman not like that camping place, "'and we stay there not even one night. "'You must make mistake and think some other man me. "'Sure.' "'We could not help laughing at the sure. "'It was spoken in so truly an American way "'that it was funny on those lips.' Afterward, however, it struck me in remembering the scene that the man's accent in speaking English was even more distinctly American than it had been. This was odd if he had been associated with Germans, but natural if his new clients were Americans. Another question was on my tongue, but before I had time to speak, Monty cried out, Oh, there's Wretched Bay in a carriage, all alone with some luggage. I hope he's going away. Naturally we turned, but I saw Biddy raise her eyebrows warningly. The girl looked puzzled, as if for an instant she did not see what she had done that was wrong. But I guessed that Biddy's distrust of Better as a possible spy was still alive in her breast. She did not know of my suspicions concerning the camp thief, for the affair at Medenet, thanks to a white fib or two, had never assumed serious proportions in her mind. It did not need that, however, to make her feel that Better's ears were not fit receptacles for secrets. Monty had not been mistaken. It was Rashid Bey, leaning comfortably back in an old-fashioned but not badly appointed open carriage, drawn by two very decent horses, and driven by a smart, red-sashed, white-robed negro. We saw him in profile as he passed along the road at some distance, but he was reading a paper with an expression so placid that I felt sure that he had not seen us. On the seat beside him was a suitcase with the air of having been made in France, and circumstantial evidence said that Monny's wish was to be granted. I glanced hastily at Better to observe, if I could, whether the girl's impulsive exclamation had aroused undue interest, for it was not unlikely that he had seen Rashid Bey and Mabel landing at Alexandria the night of his first meeting with us. But the ugly face showed nothing. "'If you have things you want to do, my ladies,' he said, "'please excuse that I have kept you. I go to my gentlemen, or they give the men with the silver shawls too much money.' The gentlemen in question were the more interested in observing our movements than in completing any bargain with the street vendors. Nevertheless, Better hastened back as if in great fear that they might be cheated. An Arabia waited for them, and having bought a scarf or two, they drove off before we had parted to go our several ways. An Arabia was in attendance upon us also, and we put Bridget and Monty into it alone, for Rashid Bey's house, the driver informed us, was not far off. "'Good luck,' I said encouragingly, and Bridget smiled gaily at me, but Monny was looking at Fenton. She was telling him something with her eyes, and with a significant little gesture, she touched the small leather handbag she carried. 
"'One would think she was a suffragette with a bomb,' I remarked to Anthony, trying to speak easily, as though I were not at all anxious when the carriage had turned its back on us. "'Instead of which,' said Anthony, gazing at the dark head and the fair head, as earnestly as if he never expected to see them again, "'instead of which she's merely a brave girl with a pistol that she knows how to use. "'Or anyhow, she says she does. "'Good heavens, has she got one in that bag?' I gasped. "'She has, my brownie.' "'By Jove! You gave it to her?' "'I did, last night. "'My heart began suddenly to feel like a cannonball in my breast. "'I felt that I had not understood the situation, "'and that now I did not understand Anthony, "'though that was far from being a new sensation. "'I thought that you thought there was no danger,' I bleated. "'You know Egypt and I don't. "'I didn't want them to go in for this thing, "'but when you said it would be all right, I yielded. "'I wish to heaven I hadn't.' "'Do you think, if you hadn't given in, Miss Gilder would have given up? "'You and I together could have kept them both out of the business. "'Only by sheer force. "'You see, Miss Gilder was interested in this girl and fond of her before she met you. "'So was Mrs. East. "'As Rashid tricked the pretty little governess by making her believe she would be his first and only wife, "'they don't look upon her as married to him, and I think they're right.' Don't you glory in them both for knowing there's a risk, yet taking it so gaily for that foolish child's sake? I glory in them, but I wouldn't have let them go if— You've changed your mind just because I gave Miss Gilder my browning? Honestly, Duffer, I don't think there's actual danger. But anyhow, don't you see, they had to go, and they had to go alone. They would have hated us and themselves and each other if they hadn't answered the girl's appeal. And we couldn't do a thing, unfortunately, as it deals with the harem. If it can be done at all, it's woman's business. These two are the right ones, as they felt bound to do it, and you and I can but see them through from the outside. End of chapter 18、Chapter、Nineteen, Part One of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 19. If at first you don't succeed, Part 1. Now that we were all thoroughly launched on this somewhat chaotic adventure, I envied Anthony because his part in the drama kept him in the wings, within sight of the stage. He was to watch the house of Rashid Bey, and if the rescue party of two did not appear after an hour's absence, the true story of the affair and Mabel's appeal was to be laid before the Inspector General of Upper Egypt, laid before him not by Ahmed Antoun Effendi, but by Captain Anthony Fenton, officially on leave, secretly on a special mission for the British government. My role, less exciting but perhaps no less important, Was to play the diplomat in beguiling the American consul to stand by the wife of Rashid Bey if the attempt at rescue succeeded, or, if possible, even if it failed. Antoun accounted for his presence in front of Rashid Bey's high garden wall by attracting a crowd and lecturing them in his character of Haji, while I dashed off in a jingling Arabia to the American consulate. As in Cairo, my progress was one long adjuration of the crowd by the driver. Who would have reveled in conducting the car of a juggernaut? Shemalak, ya waled, to the left, oh boy, or Yemenik, to the right, he roared, while men dived and dipped under his horse's prancing feet. A hawk flew by on my right side, and my right eyelid twitched as we neared the consulate. In Egypt, these were good omens. Besides, there had been a red sunrise, which in the Nile country had meant, since Egyptians superseded the prehistoric new race, That Ra had conquered his enemies and stained the sky with their blood. Therefore, all should be well with me and the world, and it did seem as if my hopes bade fair to be fulfilled when in the consul I recognized a man I had been able to advise in a small official difficulty in my early days at the embassy in Rome. This was even more fortunate than the case of Slaney. We shook hands warmly, and as soon as was decent, I interrupted a flow of reminiscent gratitude. By flooding Mr. James Bronson with the story of Rashid Bey's unhappy American bride, Mabella Hanim, ill treated as well as cruelly deceived, if her story were true. He knew Rashid slightly, but the marriage was news to him. With an interest, he listened to my account of the lonely little governess in Paris, bewitched by the love making of a handsome Turk as white as herself. 
but when I asked for help, the consul shook his head. Lord Ernest, he said, there's nothing I'd like better than to pay my debt by doing you some favor. But you're asking me the one thing that's hardest, as you probably know. You understand as well as I do that when a girl marries a man, she ceases to be a subject of her native land. And to interfere with the inmate of a harem is just about impossible. But I'll tell you what I will do for your sake. If you can get the girl out of Rashid Bey's house, which, mind you, I doubt, you may bring her to my wife, and we'll cook up some story about her being a relative of mine. So she is, I guess, through Adam and Eve. If you think she's been badly treated, we'll stand by her. Once she's under this roof, which means she'll be on American soil, through thick and thin, whatever the consequences. I can't go farther, and I don't believe that you expected I would. I admitted that I had not, and thanked him for his promise. By this time I thought that Bridget and Monty might be on their way to meet me at the consulate as arranged, escorted by Antoon, and perhaps bringing Mabel. Even the route they were to take was planned, so that I could not miss them if I started. Meanwhile, Mr. Bronson was to interest his wife in our protégé. Back I flew, my ears deafened by more yaweleds, but, though I met many things and many creatures on the congested road, there was no Arabia containing the desired ones. I made my driver slacken pace as we neared the big, square pink house of Rashid Bay, set far back in its garden of palms and impossible statues on the bank of the Nile. No green turban was in sight, and I wondered what could have happened as we drove slowly past the ponderous black gatekeeper, apparently half asleep on his bench. There was nothing to do but crawl along at a snail's pace, lest that droop of crocodile lids should be assumed for effect. I went on, meaning to turn presently, but when the Arabia had taken me beyond eyeshot of Rashid's gatekeeper, an Arab saka, or water-seller, ran forward, striking his musical gong. From his brass jar, protected by crimson-dyed horsehair to keep out dust, he offered a draught, and his look said that he had something more for me than a drink of water. I beckoned him close, stopping the Arabia, and under the tumbler he handed up was a folded bit of paper. None save the water-seller had attention to spare for me just then, as a wedding procession was approaching, with a crude but gorgeous curtained litter drawn by camels, and a number of musicians with raitas, darbukas, the key and bottle, and other eastern instruments which may have been the ancestors of the Highlanders' bagpipes. The street crowd followed, enchanted by the plaintive, monotonous tones, grotesque to newcomers from the west, but enthralling to those who have fallen under the spell of their melancholy magic. Failure for the present, but Miss G and Mrs. J safe, Anthony had scrawled in pencil. Couldn't wait in front of R's house, but you'll find us at an Arab restaurant to which the messenger will guide you. All you have to do is to discharge your Arabia and walk in the direction the man takes, keeping your distance in case you're watched. I obeyed instructions, and in the town of Asuet, far from the gardens along the Nile front, I came to a house between the mosque of the tallest minaret and the great market whether Arabia as well as Egypt sends her wares. It was a house of some pretension, though in a narrow, unpaved street, lined with humble native dwellings. I guessed that it must have been built for a rich man who had died or failed in business, but now a sign in Arabic announced that it was a restaurant. A nod from the water-seller told that I had reached the end of the journey. Nubian servants salaamed in the big room where once the master of the house had held receptions, and in a smaller room beyond I saw Antun, Bridget, and Moni. They were seated at a low table where no forks or knives or even plates were laid. In the center of the white cloth stood a large dish of something sweet and rich-looking, from which everybody pretended to eat, but at sight of me Bridget and Moni began talking together. They told me breathlessly how they had been informed by the gatekeeper that Mabella Hanem was not well. Having insisted that they were intimate friends whom she would desire to see, they had been bidden to return in an hour. Reluctantly coming away, they had as soon as was prudent been joined by Antun. He had taken them to the bazaars, hoping to give them a glimpse of the shops before the set returned from the tombs, but they had met Neil Sheridan, who had something to tell. He had caught sight of Better running after the carriage of a Turk strongly resembling Rashid Bey. The carriage had stopped near the railway station, and after an instant's conversation the horses had been turned to gallop off in the direction whence they had come. "'Of course we were sure the Turk was Rashid,' said Mani, "'so Anton Effendi thought we'd better go back to watch his house. 
When we got there it was too late, for already some time had passed since Mr. Sheridan saw better. Rashid's gateman said that Mabella Hanim was suddenly better, and had gone away with her husband. He could talk a little French, so we understood perfectly, and anyhow you know I'm studying Arabic. It's so discouraging when Arabs answer me in Cockney English, or say sure in American. We believed the fellow, because it seemed exactly what Wretched would do, come back and grab Maybell away at a moment's notice. So unfortunate about Neil Sheridan. Wretched was idiotically jealous of him on the Laconia, and if he caught a glimpse of him today, he's certain to think Mr. Sheridan's here to try and see Mabel. We tore to the railroad depot, but the train was just going out. No doubt Rashid and his wife were both on it. Isn't it heartbreaking? I sat mute, thinking things over, but Anthony tried to give consolation by saying that he still had some hope. He had found out that Rashid Bey owned a sugar plantation with a house on it near Luxor. The train which had left us to it was bound for Luxor. In a very few days our boat would land us there, and we would try our luck again. Not much doubt, Fenton added, speaking as always in French, that this is Better's revenge on us. He must have told Rashid that Miss Gilder had mentioned his name, saying she hoped he was leaving home. That hint of danger would be enough for any Turk. It will be my fault, then, moaned Monty, if he kills Mabel. He's deceived and shut her up and tried to convert her. Worse than all, he has another wife. The next step will be murder. Oh, how can we bear the delay of going on to Luxor by boat? Hadn't we better take a train? Better miss all the things we've come to Egypt to see, rather than leave Mabel to her fate. Rashid isn't the sort to have her put out of the way, said Anthony. He's not a bad fellow, as such men go, and he's hardly had time to tire of his conquest yet. According to his lights, he's right not to allow any interference with his harem from Europeans. He was jealous on board ship of one or two men of your acquaintance, you've told me. This attempted visit of yours will revive his interest in his wife, inconveniently for us, but if I know his type it will die down again the minute he thinks he has covered his tracks. For a day or two he will be a dragon. Then he'll begin to think we're discouraged, or that we haven't found out about his sugar plantation, or that nothing more than a visit to his wife was intended, and he'll turn his attention to other things than watchdogging. It's far better to go on by boat and make a dash when he's off guard again. After a few arguments we agreed with Antun, as we usually ended by doing, and soothed our restlessness by visiting Mr. Bronson to tell him of our disappointment. If it hadn't been for Monty, I think the consul would have taken the point of view that he was now out of the affair. But Monty, sapphire-eyed with generous zeal, is rather irresistible. Fired by her enthusiasm, as he had not been by my beguiling, he volunteered to go to Luxor on two or three days' leave with his wife to visit a Syrian friend who had often vainly invited them to his villa, and arriving, if possible, about the time our boat was due. If we succeeded in our quest, we might bring Mabel to them, and they would smuggle her back to the American consulate at Asuit. Our great adventure thus postponed, we let the Nile dream take us once more, and though we had moments of impatience, the dream was too fair to be resisted. Besides, we were all four dreaming it together. Poor Cleopatra was the only one outside, for Rachel Guest was dreaming her own dream, with an extremely practical side to it, unless Biddy and I were mistaken. She wore Monty's clothes, and used her special perfume, and took advantage of the same initials to accept gifts of filmy handkerchiefs and monogrammed bags and brushes. Also, she had firmly annexed most of the men on board who would, in normal states of mind, have belonged to the Gilded Rose. But they all seemed to have gone mad on the subject of Miss Guest. Even Harry Snell, who had been the property of Enid Biddle on board the Candace, on the Enchantress Isis was gravitating guestward, lured by that meek, mysterious witchery which I was trying hard to understand. We got past Sohag and the famous white and red Coptic monasteries built by St. Helena, without jarring notes of any sort in the Nile dream, save for the failure of our rescue plot, past Achmen, which Herodotus wrote of as Shemus, past Girga, where once stood ancient Thys, that gave the first dynasty of kings to Egypt. But when we arrived at Baliana to visit Abydos, between Enid Biddle and Harry Snell I had an interlude of nightmare. It was Rachel's fault, but it was I who had to suffer for her sins. I, who had engaged as conductor of the set, and found myself their arbiter as well. Other tourists on other boats do not see Abydos until the return trip, but the aim of Sir Marcus was originality as well as exclusiveness. 
This was a special tour, and everything we were to do must be special. Some passengers might wish to stay longer than others at Khartoum, or, from there, go up the White or Blue Nile after big game. Or they might tire of the Nile and wish to tear back to Cairo by train. Sir Marcus was boldly outdoing his rivals by allowing clients to engage cabins for up Nile only, instead of paying the return also, and they were not to miss any temple because of this concession. I consider it an advertisement and a cheap one, he had explained to me, in saying that we were to visit at Abydos on our way south. Beautiful smiling donkeys, adorned with beads and amulets, met us at the boat landing. We ought to have called it al Balyana, but we didn't. We called it Balyana, and we pronounced Abydos according to our education. We had a ride of an hour and a half from the boat to the temple, and having sent off Cleopatra and Lady Biddle in a carriage, my conscience was free, my heart light. The sun shone on tawny desert hills, like lions creeping stealthily out from the horizon toward the Nile to drink. There were sweet smells of unseen flowers, and herbs such as ancient Egyptian doctors used, and I looked forward to keeping my donkey near Biddy's. Of course I ought to have preferred Monny's, but then I could talk of Monny to Biddy, and we had so many subjects in common since childhood that it was restful to ride even the most energetic donkey at the side of Mrs. Jones. No sooner, however, had I begun to urge my gray animal after her white one, than I was called by Enid Biddle. "'Oh, Lord Ernest, I must speak to you,' she pleaded so piteously that I couldn't pretend not to hear. When we were ambling side by side, separated from the rest of the party by a gleaming cloud of copper dust, a few long-haired brown sheep, some blue-eyed water buffalo, and a plague of little birds, Enid turned upon me a pair of tear-wet eyes. "'Why, Miss Biddle, what is the matter? Or is it a cold in your head?' I asked anxiously. "'It's not a cold in my head,' she confessed. "'It's a dreadful, dreadful pain in my heart, and you are the only one who can cure it.' For a fearful moment I thought she was going to propose. One hears of these awful visitations, but I need not have trembled. "'I feel as if I could say anything to you,' she murmured. "'You are so understanding and so sympathetic.' It was on the tip of my tongue to reply that it was my duty as conductor to be so, and that if I succeeded a mountain full of hidden treasure might perhaps reward me. But just in time I realized that this speech would not be tactful. Instead of speaking, I looked at her and let her go on. "'It's Harry Snell,' she said. "'You have influence with him. He thinks you such a great swell. He'd hate to do anything you would call unworthy of a gentleman. He, he is making me so unhappy. He's done everything to win my love, and now... Now he's gone over to that Miss Guest. The donkey, having begun inopportunely to trot, the words were jolted out, one after another, like a shower of pebbles, and they fell on my feelings like paving stones. She expected me to do something about it? Horrible! I should almost have preferred the proposal. My dear Miss Biddle, I soothed her in my best salad oil voice, cultivated at the embassy, you are much prettier than Miss Guest, and you can win Snell back easily if you want him. Probably he's only flirting to make you jealous. It's me he was flirting with, she moaned, but I don't believe he cares for Miss Guest. It's only a case of follow my leader because other men like her so much. Nothing succeeds like success, you know, and other men's admiration is the most becoming background a girl can have. He told Mrs. Harlow it was haunting him that Elaine and I would get fat like our mother, and the men who married us would have to spend dull years seeing us slowly grow into mother's likeness. Wasn't it cruel? And we eat scarcely anything except pickles on purpose to keep thin. But that's only his excuse. It's the romance of the situation and the secret that appeals to him. What secret? I felt entitled to inquire. Why, the secret between those two girls, Miss Gilder and Miss Guest. You know what all the men believe about them, don't you? But of course you do. But of course I don't. Why, that they've changed places to deceive people, just as heiresses and poor girls do in old-fashioned plays or guidebooks. They think Miss Gilder, I mean the girl we call Miss Gilder, is really the schoolteacher, and the one we call Miss Guest, and that all the men are after, is Rosamond Gilder, the cannon heiress. Phew, I whistled, bumpily, as my donkey kept up with Enid's. For goodness sake, what makes them think that? I don't know exactly how the story started, but it seems authentic. Have you known them long? Only since Naples, but then you can't be certain whether it's true or not? I paused, swallowing an answer. So this was the explanation of the Monty puzzle. Yet it was but the first word of another enigma. Who was responsible for the wild story? 
there was more than met the eye or ear in this. I could hardly believe that Monny would have chosen or Rachel dared to start this rumor, though it might have amused the real heiress and suited the false one to watch it run. I dared not contradict it flatly without consulting Bridget or the gilded rose herself. It was not my business to be a spoil sport, if there were sport to spoil, no matter how sternly I might disapprove. In the matter of actual knowledge, I have very little about Miss Gilder, I decided to reply, except that she's charming enough and pretty enough for any man to fall in love with if she hadn't a penny. As for Miss Guest, Miss Guest is a cat, and if you'll only tell Harry Snell so, I'll bless you all my life. Good gracious, I couldn't do that. I mean, tell him you think she isn't the heiress, and that she's only what she seems to be, and nothing mysterious or interesting. He'll believe you. Why, she can't have any money, or even a nice mind. She always writes no with her finger on top of her cold cream at hotels. She told me so herself. Not that it's any good with Arabs, they don't want to steal cold cream. But such a trick would never occur to a rich girl, would it? She grows vainer every day, too, till one can just see vanity spouting from the top of her head. She intends to use this mistake people are making about her to bag a rich man like Harry Snell or a successful one with a big growing reputation like Mr. Bailey, the American sculptor. You will help me save Harry from her and bring him back to me, won't you? You're the only one he'll listen to. If you don't speak, I shall simply jump overboard into the Nile, and Sir Marcus Lark would hate that. End of chapter 19, part 1「Chapter 19, Part 2 of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 19. If at first you don't succeed. Part 2. So should I, dear Miss Biddle, I assured her. But what can I possibly do in such a very intimate matter? Why, you're a diplomat, aren't you? I thought they always knew what to do. You make us all dance your tune like puppets and imagine we're prancing about to please ourselves. Tell him he's breaking my heart. By Jove, you're not in earnest. I am. Oh, he must come back. I thought on board the Candace we were as good as engaged. I, I submitted to his kisses and now... Submitted is a good word. I sneered to my inner self. But outwardly I submitted a handkerchief to the lady as she had lost hers in one of the last donkey jolts, and ventured to insert sympathetically into a pause a small suggestion. It was usual, I reminded Miss Biddle, if a gentleman's intentions had to be asked, that the father did the asking. This hint, however, fell flatter than a flounder, and all the way to Abydos, most sacred temple of ancient Egypt, I was persecuted with Enid Biddle's woes, when I should have been free to meditate upon the tragic history of Isis and Osiris. It was here that the head of the murdered god was buried, and perhaps his whole body, when the magic secret of Thoth had enabled Isis to collect the fourteen separate pieces Set had hidden. Many temples claimed the sacred body of Osiris, ruler over departed spirits and Amenti, their dim dwelling place beyond the western desert, Philae and Memphis among others, but it was Abydos to which the Egyptians give their most reverent faith as the true burial place of the beloved one. It was there they wished to lie when they died and were mummied, in order to rest through eternity near the relic of their most precious god. Thus a necropolis grew like a poppy garden of sleep, round the temple, and a city rose also. But even in the long-ago time of Strabo, the city was reduced to a village, and all traces of the shrine had vanished. The great white jewel of the temples, Temple of Seti I, and the temple of his son Ramesses II, remain to this day. However, with the tablet of ancestors, which has helped in the tracing of Egyptian history. Therefore, it is that this treasure of the Nile desert is still a shrine for travelers from the four corners of the earth. After the long, straight road and a high, sudden hill, we came face to face with the marble-white columns of the outer court. If I had been with Bridget or Monty, I could have run back into the past, hand in hand with either, to see with my mind's eyes the white limestone palace of Memnon, copied from the labyrinth, standing above the city between the canal and the desert. I should have peered into the depths of its fountain, and with a hand shading my eyeballs from the sun, I should have gazed at the grove of Horus's sacred acanthus trees, dark against the burning blue. 
I should have found the royal tombs which Ramesses restored, grouped near the buried body of Osiris. But bad luck gave me Enid Biddle for my companion. She would not let anyone else come near me, even had the right somebody wished to dispute my battered remains with her. Anton Effendi had the others hypnotized, and I wondered if they noticed how like his boldly cut profile was to certain portraits of the youthful Ramesses, carved in the glittering white walls. So splendid were they that had I been a woman, my spirit would have rushed back along the sand-obliterated, devious paths of Egypt's history to find and fall at the feet of their original. But there was Antun, much easier to get at, and perhaps better worth the gift of a woman's heart than Ramesses the Great, with all his faults and cruelties. Crowds of birds lived in interstices of the broken columns, and their tiny faces peeped out like flowers growing among rocks, their eyes bright and arresting as personal anecdotes in a long, dull chapters of history. They seemed to look at me and sympathize, cocking their heads on one side as if to say, Poor, foolish, modern man! Why don't you make a virtue of necessity and get rid of this still more foolish modern maid, by promising her anything she asks? Then you can go listen to that princely-looking person in the green turban, who might be descended from the kings our ancestors used to behold. He does seem to know something about the history of this place, on which we are authorities. The dragomans who bring crowds of tourists to our temple and gabble nonsense put us really off our feed. Peep, peep! Just hear him tell about the staircase we're so proud of. Did you know there was a picture of it in the Book of the Dead, with Osiris standing at the top, like a good host waiting to receive his guests? Well then, if you didn't, do anything you must to escape from that lovesick girl, while there's time to hear a real scholar talk of him who is at the head of the staircase. Peep, peep! Hurry up, or you'll lose it all, silly. Of course, the real staircase is in Amenti, which your Roman Catholics call Purgatory, and no doubt Osiris is standing on it to this day. So I took the bird's advice, and promised Enid to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Harry Snell. Satisfied that she had got all that was to be got out of me, she powdered her nose, in the same spirit that David anointed his head, and attached herself to Rachel, in whose train was the desired one. Thus, basically, did I free myself to enjoy the society of Biddy and Osiris, with lovely carved glimpses of Isis thrown in, to say nothing of Seti I and Ramesses II. Trying to push into the background of my mind the nauseating thought of my vow and its fulfillment, I helped Bridget and Monty take snapshots of King Seti, showing his son Ramesses how to lasso, and also how to catch by its tail the most fascinating of bulls. They were on the wall, of course, Ramesses and Seti, I mean, not Bridget and Monty, but seemed so real that they might leap off at any instant, and so charmed was Monty with Ramesses' braided lock of youth that she resolved to try one over her left temple in connection with an Egyptian princess costume she was having made for some future fancy dress ball. I can't take a grain of interest in anyone but Egyptian princes and princesses and their profiles, she exclaimed, then blushed faintly and added, I mean princes and princesses of the past. We got some good pictures of the Temple of Seti, for Monty had an apparatus for natural color photography, which gave sensational results in ancient wall paintings, when anyone except Monty herself did the taking. It was better still in the seven chapels, the Holy of Holies at Abydos, and in the joy of my first color photography I forgot the doom ahead. Appropriately, the sword I had hung up over my own cranium descended in the necropolis, at that place of the tombs called Um el Kaab mother of pots. Nobody wanted to see the fragments of this mother's pots, but I insisted on a brief visit, as important discoveries have been made there, among the most important in Egypt. It was a dreary place where Harry Snell strolled up and caught me alone, gazing at a desolation of sandy hillocks, full of undiscovered treasures. Look here, said he, you're supposed to know everything. Tell me why they call seats outside shops and bazaars, and tombs of the ancient empire by the same name, Mustaba. I explained that Mustaba was an Arab word meaning bench. Then, realizing that it would be flying in the face of Providence not to get the ordeal over while my blood was up, I spoke of Enid. Among the shattered pots and yawning sepulchres, I racked up her broken heart and blighted affections. I talked to Snell like a brother, and when he had heard me through in silence, to the place where words and breath failed, I thought that I had moved him. His eyes were downcast. I fancied that I saw a mist of tears as a man's slow tears. Then suddenly he opened his eyelids wide and glared, a glare stony as the pots and as the desert hills. 
Barrow, he said, I thought you were a good fellow and a man of the world. I see now that you're a damned sentimental ass. With this he stalked off, and I could not run after him to bash his head, because what he said was perfectly true. I was almost sorry that evening, on board the boat, when he apologized and the Nile dream went on as if I hadn't broken it by being the sort of fool Snell had said that I was. In the dream were Nile cities, with crowding houses whose walls were heightened by tier upon tier of rose and white pots, molded in with honey-colored mud. There were stretches of sandy shore and green gloom of palm groves. There were domed tombs of saints, glittering like snow palaces in the sun. There were great golden mounds, inlaid with strips of paler gold, picked out with ebony. There were sinister hillsides cut into squarely by door holes, leading to cave dwellings. There were always shadoofs, where giant soup ladles everlastingly dipped water and threw it out again, mounting up from level to level of the brown, dike-like shore. The wistful, musical wail of the men at the wells was as near to the voice of nature as the sighing of wind, or the breaking of waves, which has never ceased since the world began. Sometimes the horizon was opal, sometimes it throbbed with azure fire, or blazed ruby red, as the torch of sunset swept west and east before the emerald darkness fell. When our enchantress landed, great flocks of kites, like in form and wing to the sacred vulture of Egypt, flew to welcome us with swoopings of wide purple wings. Their shadows on the water were like passing spirits. And at night, when the Nubian boatmen danced, their feet thudding on the lower deck to the cry of the Darabuka, the Nile whispered of the past, with a tinkling whisper, like the music of Hathor's sacred sistrum. Gyasas glided by, loaded with pots like magic melons, long masts pointing as though they had been wands in the hands of astrologers, and the reflection of the piled pots as they moved gave vague glimpses of sunken treasure. Dendera meant work for Fenton. There had been trouble there, and tourists had complained of insults. It was the Haji's business to find out whether natives or Europeans had been more to blame, and whether there were wrongs to right, misunderstandings to adjust. But to the rest of us, Dendera meant the sacred temple of Hathor, goddess of love, in some ways one of the most beautiful of all the Nile temples, though, being not much over two thousand years old, it was built upon ruins more ancient than King Menzies. Archaeologists like Neil Sheridan class it as late Ptolemaic, uninterestingly modern. Mrs. East had been looking forward to the Temple of Dendera more eagerly to any other, because she had read that on an outer wall was carved the portrait of Cleopatra the Great. That of Caesarian was also there, as she must have known, but Cleopatra's son was never referred to by her reincarnation, who chose to ignore the Caesar incident. Mrs. East had not yet deigned to mount a donkey, but to reach the temple she must do so, or walk, or sway in a dangerous-looking chaise à porteur. Rather than miss the joy of seeing herself on a stone wall, as others had the privilege of seeing her for two thousand years, she consented to accept, as a seat, a large grey animal, tasseled with red to keep off flies and evil eyes. "'Won't you ride with me, Antun Effendi?' she asked. "'I'm afraid.' This creature looks as large as an elephant and as wild as a zebra. I feel you could call him. But Antun Effendi was not going to ride. He had other fish to fry, and poor Cleopatra's luminous dark eyes were overflowing lakes when he had politely excused himself on the plea of a pressing engagement. I felt sure that she would have been kind to Sir Marcus if at that moment he could have appeared from behind the picturesque group of bead necklace sellers, or emerged from one of the huge, bright-colored baskets exposed for sale on a hill of brown-gold sand. I don't know whether it made things better or worse that the gray donkey should be named Cleopatra, but it was evidently a blow when the animal's white-robed attendant announced himself as Anthony. "'I can't and won't have the creature with me,' she murmured as I helped her to mount when she had pushed the boy aside. "'Thank you, Lord Ernest, you're very kind, but and who not to have been here.' Fancy seeing this temple, of all others, without an Anthony of any sort on the horizon. A pity it isn't your middle name. If you could spare time to ride with me, that would be better than nothing. I'll be delighted, I said hypocritically, for I had been dying to talk with Bridget about the Mani and Rachel Imbroglio, which, as a hard-worked conductor, I had not since Abydos found a chance to discuss. Besides, Biddy had whispered in passing that a letter just delivered at Dendera had brought exciting news of Esme O'Brien. 
but I was sorry for Cleopatra and wondered whether I could manage, after all, to hint an explanation of the hieroglyphic love letter, that fatal letter of mine which had stealthily made mischief between Mrs. East and Anthony. I didn't quite see how the subject was to be broached. Still, some way might open. I'm sorry about the middle name, I said, but if I assumed it, like a virtue which I have not, I should be the third person connected with his trip, labeled in some fashion. Who is the second person? she asked abruptly, as all the animals of the party started to trot vivaciously through the blowing yellow sand. Sir Marcus, surely you've heard that his A stands for Antonius. Good heavens, she gasped, and I hardly knew whether it was the shock of my news or a jolt of the donkey which forced the exclamation. Whatever it was, the emotion she felt bound her to a silence after that one outburst. She said not a word, and did not even groan or threaten to fall off when both our beasts broke into a thumping gallop. In silence we swept round that great bulk of rubbish heap, Roman and early Christian, under which lies Anne, the town of the column. Cleopatra did not cry out when suddenly we came in sight of Hathor's temple, honey gold against the turquoise sky, and vast as some Wagnerian palace of the gods. The tasseled donkey, or I, had given her cause to think. Or perhaps she did not consider me worth talking to, as we approached the temple toward which all her previous traveling had been a mere pilgrimage. Still silently, when we had left our donkeys and were following the crowd of the dromos, Harry Snell actually with Enid, thanks to me and the wisdom of second thoughts, Cleopatra's eyes wandered over the Hathor-headed columns with their clinging color, and over the portal with its brilliant mass of yellow, of dark Pompeian red, and the green-blue sacred to Hathor, whom Horus loved, Venus Hathor, whose priestesses danced within these walls in Cleopatra's day. "'Oh, this red and this green-blue are my colors, I remember,' she murmured, and then hardly spoke when I walked with her in the gloom of the temple itself the rich gloom under heavily ornamented ceilings. She wanted to save the portrait till the last, she announced, until after she had seen everything else, and she didn't care what Mr. Sheridan said about her temple. It was wonderful. I tried to interest her in the crocodiles, which had been detested and persecuted at Dendera in the late Cleopatra's time, as ardently as they were worshipped at Crocodilopolis and other places. I joked about old Egypt having consisted of crocs and non-crocs, just as the inhabitants of Florence had to be Guelphs or Ghibellines. I explained carefully the geography of the place, or rather, reminded Cleopatra of it, adding details of the canal which once left to Coptos, where the magic book of the wisdom of Thoth lay hidden under the Nile. I could not waken Mrs. East from reverie to interest, as Antoon would have had the power to do, but my vanity was not hurt. It was only my curiosity which suffered, for I wanted desperately to know whether the donkey had seriously jolted the lady's spine, or whether the news that Sir M. A. Lark was Marcus Antonius, not a more obvious Marcus Aurelius, had fired her imagination. In any case, I devoted myself to her while Monty and Bridget frolicked with others, and I had a reward of a kind. When we had seen all the halls and chambers, and the crypt with its carvings all fresh as if made yesterday, when we had been on the roof where chanting priests had once awaited the rising of Sirius, when I had taken her outside the temple where blowing columns of dusty sand rose like incense from hidden altars of Hathor, we stood at last alone together, gazing up at the figures of Cleopatra and her son. The wall on which they were carved rose behind the Holy of Holies, where the golden statue of the goddess had been kept. But alas, the figures themselves! Alas! I knew how Cleopatra must be feeling, and I dared not speak. But I did not look. Instead, I gazed helplessly up at that exposed, misshapen form, that flaccid chin. "'Thank heaven it's only you who are with me,' breathed Mrs. East. That was my reward. Or should I call it a punishment? Anyhow, it made it easier for the insignificant person in question to unburden his conscience about the hieroglyphic letter. I stammered it all out, on the way back, apropos of the rubbish heap which had been Tantira. I let it remind me of Fustet on our digging expedition. I had meant to follow Mrs. East's advice and propose to Miss Gilder, I explained, but Monty had not found my buried love letter. What had become of it, I, uh, had never been told. All I knew was that it hadn't come into Miss Gilder's hands, and I should never have as much courage again. Oh, Cleopatra exclaimed with a curious light in her eyes, more like relief than disappointment. 
You really do want to marry my niece? You delayed so that I wondered. I wasn't sure sometimes if it were Monny or... But I'm on your side, Lord Ernest. It isn't too late yet for any of us, perhaps. Trust in me. I'm going to help you. I could have bitten my tongue out, though I had blundered with the best intentions. Mrs. East, I protested almost ferociously, you mustn't do anything. I said before I began that I was going to tell you a secret. I won't betray your confidence, but I will help. I want to. It would be a good thing for Monty to accept you, Lord Ernest, a very good thing in more ways than one. Mrs. Jones wants it too, or did. I promise you I'll be discreet. With that, we arrived in sight of the boat. Once more, necklaces and scarabs and baskets were thrust under our noses. Anthony had returned from his mysterious whisperings in cafes or mosques in the new town, and was waiting for us. Cleopatra called him, with a note of gaiety in her voice, to help him off the elephant. He came. I felt she was going to hint to him that I was in love with Monty, hint to Bridget also. Virtue may be its own reward, but it makes you very lonely. I hadn't another easy moment for dreaming the Nile dream, and we all woke out of it when, with the pink dawn of a certain morning, we saw a vast temple, repeated column for column in the clear river as a mirror of glass. We were at Luxor, and somewhere not far off, Mabella Hanem was praying for release. End of chapter 19, part 2「Chapter Twenty of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter Twenty: The Zone of Fire. Just at the first moment of waking, when I was moved by my subconscious self to roll out of my berth and bound to the cabin window, I forgot that we had anything more active to do at Luxor than worship the glory of sky and river and temples. I had room in my mind only for the dream beauty of that astounding picture, into the foreground of which I seemed to have been thrust, so close upon my eyes loomed the line of lotus columns. It was as if the ancient gods had poured a libation of ruby wine from their zenith dwelling into the translucent depths of the Nile. Even the long colonnade of broken pillars was deep rose-red against a pale rose sky, repeated again in deeper rows down in the magic world beneath the pink crystal roof of shining water. Then, suddenly, bright windows of sky behind the dark rose columns flared to the color of primroses, were shot with pansy purple, and cleared to the transparent green of unflawed emerald. The thought came as I gazed at the carved wonder, reflected flower for flower and line for line in the still river, that here was illustrated in unearthly beauty the chief religious legend of ancient Egypt. As each human soul was believed to be part of the world soul, Osiris, reunited with him beyond the western desert after death, so did these columns made by human hands unite themselves at sunrise with the soul of the Nile, the life of Egypt. I caught a glimpse, as if in an illuminated parable, of the Egyptian cosmos, the heavens, the earth, the depths, three separate entities, yet forever one, as is the Christian's trinity. Almost I expected to see the sun-boat of the gods steered slowly across the river from the city of kings, westward to the tombs of kings, and the little white-breasted birds, which promenaded the deck of our boat as though it belonged to them, which might have been heart-birds from the world of mummies across the Nile, escaped for a glimpse of Ramesses' gaily painted, mosaic white palace with its carved brass balconies, its climbing roses, its lake of lotuses, and its river gardens. I was sure that if I told these tiny creatures that the pharaohs and all their glories had vanished off the earth except for a few bits in museums, they would not believe the tale. I wasn't even sure I believed it myself, and deliberately blotting out of sight the big modern hotels and the low white line of shops away to the right of the temple, I tried to see with the Ba-birds, eastern Thebes as it must have been in the days of Ramesses the second. I pictured the temple before Cambyses the Persian, and the great earthquake felled arches and pillars, obelisks and kingly structures. I built up again the five-story houses of the priests and nobles, glistening white and fantastically painted in many colors. I laid out lawns and flower beds and set fountains playing. Then, with a rumbling shock, a chasm many thousand years deep yawned between me and ancient No, the city of palaces. It was the voice of Sir John Biddle which opened the ravine of time and let the Nile pour through it. He was on deck, in pajamas and overcoat, with General Harlow, 
holding forth on his favorite topic of mummies, an appropriate subject for this neighborhood of all others, yet I should have preferred silence. Poor Sir John! He had been disappointed in Cairo because a villain had not lurked behind each tree of the Esbekia garden, and notes tied with silken black hairs had not tumbled on his respectable bald head from the mystery of latticed windows. But he was thoroughly enjoying his Nile trip, and learning something every day to tell at home. Lady Biddle had humiliated him twice, once by asking me if those old hieroglyphics were written in Arabic, again by inquiring whether the stone-barred temple windows had been filled in once with pretty stained glass. But he had forgiven her because yesterday had been their silver wedding day, and he meant to buy her a present at some curiosity shop at Luxor. A pity it isn't the wooden wedding, I heard him say to General Harlow, for I might give a handsome mummy case. I suppose silver will have to be Persian or Indian, unless I can get hold of one of those old bracelets or discs the Egyptians used for money, but that's too good to hope for. It certainly was, though no doubt some industrious manufacturer of antiques would cheerfully have made and dug up any amount on the side of Ramsay's palace, could he have known in time. We were to have three days at Luxor, three days when three months would have been too little, and the second attempt at abducting an ill-used lady from the harem of her treacherous lord would take place as soon as we could learn that our auxiliaries, the Bronsons, had arrived. Until they were on the spot, even a success might prove an anticlimax. Meanwhile, I had plenty to do in playing my more obvious part of conductor, and arranging the last details of our excursion program. Everyone had bundled out early to see the sunrise. Consequently, most members of the set were cross or hungry or both. Nothing could be less suitable than to clamor for porridge on the Nile, but they did it, and called for bacon, too, in a land where the pig is an unclean animal. They were the same people who played coon can and bridge on the deck at twilight, when moving figures on shore were etched in black on silver, or against flaming wings of sunset, and in gathering darkness the blue-robed shadoof men who bent and rose against gold-brown dikes were like Persian enamels done on copper." Hundred gated Thebes, the dwelling of Amun-Ra, whom Greece adopted as Jupiter Amun, used to lie on both banks of the Nile, the east for the living, the west for the dead, and those who lived by catering for mummyhood. I had arranged to take our people first round Luxor, making them acquainted with the temple, which had already introduced its reflection to us. As for the town, they were capable of making themselves acquainted with that, its hotels and curiosity shops, when there was nothing more important on hand. Next was to come Karnak, the father of temples, once connected with the younger temple at Luxor as if by a long jeweled necklace of ram-headed sphinxes. And for those whose brains and legs were intact, by evening I thought of a visit to the thrilling temple of Mutt. This last would be an adventure, for Mutt, goddess of matter, the mother goddess, has apparently not taken kindly to Muslim rule. Any disagreeable tricks she and her attendant, black statues of passion, fierce Seket, can play on a devout Mohammedan are meat and drink to her, but she can work her spells only after dark. Therefore, none save the bravest Arab will venture his head inside her domain past sunset. I was sure we could get no dragoman to go with us, and equally sure that the adventure would be more popular for its spice of horror. The second and third days I allotted to western Thebes, the city of the dead, the tombs of the kings, the tombs of the queens and the nobles, then the Ramesseum, the musical Memnon with his companion Colossus, and the great temples wrapped in the ruddy fire of the western desert, where Hathor receives the setting sun in outstretched arms. As I was about to unfold these projects at breakfast, a telegram was handed to me. I read it, and while bacon plates were being exchanged for dishes of marmalade, I cudgeled my brain like a slave to make it rearrange the whole program without a hitch. The American consul wired from Asuet that he was detained by an important personage who wanted to know things about Egyptian cotton and its enemy, the bullworm. But Mr. and Mrs. Bronson would arrive at the Villa Sirius, Luxor, day after tomorrow, ready for emergencies. Of course, being conductor of a tour and next a man, I ought to have put the interests of Sir Marcus and his lark pie, as we were called by rival firms, ahead of personal concerns. I ought to have emoliated myself in the western mummy land with the consciousness of duty done, while on the eastern side of the Nile, Anthony Fenton and Monty Gilder and Biddy played the live, modern game of kidnapping a lady. But I determined to do nothing of the sort. I gazed at the telegram with the air of committing to a heart instructions from my superior officer, and without sign of inward tremor, 
announced that we would explore the wonders of the west before visiting those nearer at hand. The weather being cool and the wind not too high, I said, it would be well to seize this opportunity for the Valley of the Tombs of the Kings, an expedition trying in heat or sandstorms. Tomorrow also would be devoted to the west, and our third day would belong to Luxor and Karnak. As a bon bouche, I dangled the adventure of the Temple of Mutt to sweeten the temper of the grumblers, but there were no grumblers. The set listened calmly to my honeyed plausibilities, and the alarmed stewards dare not betray their consternation at the lightning change. No doubt they thought me mad, or worse, because a day in western Thebes meant a picnic, magical apparition at the right moment in a convenient tomb of smiling Arabs and Nubian men with baskets of food and ice drinks. Somehow the trick had to be managed, however, for I must be in eastern Thebes, alias Luxor, on the day when the Bronson's presence would render our second attempt at rescue feasible. I had to interview the chef, a formidable person, hypnotizing him and the stewards to work my will, and above all I had to make sure of boats and donkeys for the party at short notice. Only by a miracle could all go well, but I set my heart upon that miracle. Antun, hurriedly taken into my confidence, volunteered to arrange about the boats and the donkeys for the other side. Fortunately, there was no rival ahead of us, and with juggling of plans and a jingle of silver, Anthony's part was done. Just at the moment when, by dint of bribes and adjurations, I had induced the chef and stewards to smile, Fenton dashed on board to cry, Victory! Somehow, less than an hour later than we should have started, we got off in two big boats with white sails and brown rowers. The canvas did its work in silent, bulging dignity, but the rowers exhausted themselves by breathlessly imploring Allah to grant them strength, and shouting extra prayers to some sailor saint whose name was calculated to pump dry the strongest lungs. On the mystic western side, where once landed with pomp and pageant the sunboat of the gods and the morning boats of the dead, we scrambled on shore with a ribald mirth which always made the set feel it was getting its money's worth of enjoyment. Many donkeys and a few carriages awaited us, the whole equipment previously engaged for tomorrow, and an opaline sunshine which stained with pale rose the Theban hills and piled the shadows full of dark, dulled rubies, we started across an emerald plain, kept ever verdant by Nile water. The touch of comedy in the dream of beauty was the queer, mud-brick village of Kurna, with its tomb dwellings of the poor and immense mud vases shaped like mushrooms standing straight up on thick brown stems before the crowded hovels. In each phase reposed sleeping babies, brooding hens, dogs, rabbits, or any other livestock, mixed with such rubbish as the family possessed, and the most ambitious mushrooms were decorated with barbaric crenellations. Almost as far as the Temple of Seti I flowed the green wave like a lake in the desert, but beyond, to join the Sahara, rolled and billowed a waste of pink rose sand, shot with topaz light and walled with fantastic rocks, yellow and crimson, streaked with purple. In the heart of each shadow, fire burned like dying coals in a mass of rosy ashes, and the light over all was luminous as light on southern seas at moonrise and sunset. Before our eyes seemed to float a diaphanous veil of gilded gauze, and white robes and red sashes of donkey boys, animals' bead necklaces, and blue or green scarves on girls' hats, were like magical flowers blowing over the gold of the desert. Everything blew, above all, sand blew. We found that to our sorrow, after we had seen the Temple of Kurna, with its noble columns and its fine fragment of roof, where squares of sky were let in like blocks of lapis lazuli, I rushed here and there on donkey back, assuring people that this was not wind we felt, it was only a breeze. We could not have had a more favorable day for our excursion into this world of the dead. Why, if we'd waited till tomorrow, we might have met a real wind, perhaps even Kam Sin, alias Simun, the terror of the desert. To make Miss Hassett beam and Cleopatra forget the smarting of their eyes, I told them what a true sandstorm was like, and how its names in Arabic, Turkish, and Persian all come from the fiend Samuel, who destroyed caravans, just as devil came from the Persian Div. Our little breeze was from the east, which at Thebes in old days was considered lucky. The west wind used to bear across the river evil spirits disguised as sand clouds, and these wicked ones had not far to travel, because the Tuat, or underworld, was a long, narrow valley parallel to Egypt, beginning on the west bank of the Nile. Red-haired Set was ruler there, the god who had to be propitiated by having kings named after him. But Ra, greater than he, could safely pass down the dim river running through that world. 
could pass in his golden sunboat, guided by magic words of thoth instead of oars or sails, and the guardian hippopotamuses, whom Greeks turned into the dog Cerberus, dared not put out a paw. Mrs. East remembered that Thebes was tape in her day, at which Miss Hassett Bean snorted, and when out came that familiar story about Cleopatra making red hair fashionable, Miss Hassett Bean stared coldly at the lady's auburn waves. I wonder if the queen got the color at her hairdressers, as people do now, she murmured. I've read that they had beauty doctors in those days, and used arsenic for their complexion, and all sorts of mixtures. Besides, I can't imagine anything natural about Cleopatra, except the asp wanting to bite her. Upon this, Mrs. East retaliated by calling her companion Miss Bean without the hasset. I shall always think of the Valley of the Tombs as a place of terror and splendor, meant to be hidden from mortals by the spells of Thoth, who circled the rock houses of the dead with the zone of fire, as Wanton hid Brunhilda, and decreed that they should be lost forever in the blazing desert. Despite Thoth and his magic, men have burst through the blazing belt and found in the gold rose heart of the rocks sacred shrines the wise old god would have protected. They have found many, but not all, for in the breast of some, one among Thoth's sleeping lions, which masquerade as rocks, may yet be discovered a tomb, better than all those we know with their buried store of jewels and their painted walls like drapings of strange tapestry. We broke through the zone of fire, and it pursued us with burning smoke of sand, pink as powdered rubies. Always it was beautiful and terrible as we rode in the blowing pink mist, and still it was beautiful and terrible when half days we slipped off donkeys or slid out of carriages to enter the tombs which the desert had vainly striven to hide. It was hot and breathless in those underground chambers, scooped out of solid rock thousands of years ago, that great kings and their queens and families and friends might rest with their cause in eternal privacy. Enid Biddle waited until Harry Snell happened to be exactly behind her, and then fainted, with dexterity beyond praise. Cleopatra, however, was in her element. She felt at home, and did not turn one of those auburn hairs scorned by Miss Bean at a sight of the royal mummies lit up by electricity in their coffins. These gave the rest of us a shock, our nerves being already in the condition of Aladdin's on his way down to the Cave of Jewels. When the guardian of the tomb of Amenhotep, the king had several other names, which annoyed Sir John Biddle, darkened the painted royal chamber of death, and suddenly lit up several white, sleeping faces. The ghostly dusk was alive with little gasps. There lay Amenhotep himself, in a disproportionately large sarcophagus of rose-red granite from Suan, and in companion coffins were a woman and a girl, all three brilliantly illuminated. They had the look of the light hurting their poor eyes, and being outraged because, against their will, they were treated as if they had been painted by old masters. The dreadful rumor ran that the woman was none other than the great queen Hatsetsu, never mind her more scientific names, her mummy never having been found, or at any rate identified, and it was pitiful seeing her so small and female, when in life she had wished to be represented with a beard and the clothing of a man. Our dragoman, who read English newspapers, and whose idea of entertaining his crowd was to make cheap jokes, just as his family, doubtless, manufactured cheap scarabs, announced that Hatsetsu was the first suffragette. But even those who thought her downtrodden nephew, Tutmos III, justified in erasing every trace of her existence, wherever possible, did not smile at this jest. In fact, having Antun and me to refer to, the set as a whole sat upon the unfortunate dragoman, trying to talk him down in tombs and temples, or ostentatiously reading Vigal, Maspero, Petrie, Sladen, and Lorimer when he attempted to give them information. A few, with kinder intentions, however, interrupted his flow of historical narrative by exclaiming, Why, yes, of course, I thought so, and now I remember. He revenged himself by advising everybody to buy antiques from an extraordinarily old gentleman, extremely like a galvanized mummy. The antiques were extraordinary, too, so everybody took the dragoman's advice, neglecting the other curiosity merchants of the squatting row near the luncheon tomb and the glorious three-tier temple, in that vast copper cup of desert and cliff which is called Deir el-Bahari. The sail in mummied hawks, gilded ram's horns, broken tiles with beetles flying out of the sun, boats of the gods and gods themselves, was brisk round this ancient gentleman, who advertised a blue mummy cap by wearing it on his bald pate, and seemed to possess as many royal scarabs as dressmaker has pins. 
Afterward I learned that he was our dragoman's father, but I was loyal and did not tell. It was a wonderful day, all the more wonderful, perhaps, because it left in the mind a colorful confusion. Pictures of painted tombs hidden deep under red rock and drifted sand, tombs which we should perhaps never reach again through their guarding zone of fire, tombs of kings and queens and nobles forgotten through the thousands of centuries, saved by their cause and vase, their friends and servants, painted or sculptured on the walls with the sole purpose of caring for or entertaining them eternally. Already we had ceased to remember which was which, and back on the boat, in the hour of sunset, when dizzling tinsel and pale pink cloud flowers sailed over a lake of clear green sky, the set argued whether the king with the horses or the queen with the retroussé nose was in this or that tomb. Sir John Biddle recalled the fact that Egyptian horses had been celebrated, and that it was as swell a thing to be a charioteer then as it was now to be a Vanderbilt with a coach and four. As for a retroussé nose, it didn't matter where it was, on a tomb wall or a girl's face. Monty thought differently. She and Biddy were glad that the sand and rocks would still hide many secret treasures, while the world lasted. It would be dreadful to think that everything was dug up, for tourists to pry into or to cart away into museums, and no mysteries left. As for Mrs. East, she was doubtful whether to rejoice or grieve that Cleopatra's mummy had not been found. If, however, it were like the incised portrait on the wall at Dendera, it would be well that it should share the fate of Alexander's body and remain lost forever. The next day gave us another trip to the west of the Nile, not again in the burning desert, but only as far as the Ramesseum, and then to see the Colossi, seated side by side on their green carpet of meadow, looking out past the centuries toward eternity. We had a dance on board that night, and next morning it came out that Rachel Guest, who had disappeared during a turkey trot and a castle walk, had got herself engaged to Bailey. I was not as pleased about this event as was Enid Biddle, who now saw her title clear to Harry Snell, for I had bagged Willis Bailey and Neil Sheridan for Sir Marcus in order to gain kudos for myself. But Biddy, appealed to, consoled me by saying that it served Bailey right if he were mercenary, and that both men would have come in any case. The third day was to be the great day for us, the day with big fate for Mabella Hanim, and the first thing that happened was a letter sent by hand from the Bronsons at the Villa Sirius. They had arrived. The fireworks could begin. End of chapter 20「Twenty One of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 21 The Opening Door Not half an hour after the first word from Bronson came another hurried note. An unexpected obstacle had cropped up. So confident had he and Mrs. Bronson been of their friend's cooperation that rather than put such an important matters on paper, they had waited to explain by word of mouth. The owner of the villa was a rich Syrian with a French-American wife. He was a Copt in religion, hating Mohammedism in general, and the father of Rashid Bey in particular. This had seemed to the American consul a providential combination, but to his disgust he found that there had been a reconciliation between the families. Demetrius Nakian would not betray the Bronson's confidence, but he could not allow his roof to be used as a shelter for Rashid's runaway wife. No, not even if Rashid had three other wives in his harem. Here was a situation. And as Monty remarked, in neat American slang, we're right up against it. She thought that, if Antoon and I put our heads together, maybe we could think of some way out. So we did, almost literally put our heads together across a table no bigger than a handkerchief in my cabin, and decided that the visit to Rashid Bey's harem must be made by Bridget and Monty in the late afternoon. They must time their departure from the house at about the hour when the set would arrive at the Temple of Mut. Anton would be waiting for them, and they would drive in a closed arabia to the temple, where Mr. and Mrs. Bronson would happen to be sightseeing. If Mabella Hanim had been rescued, she would then be put in charge of the American consul, whose very footprints created American soul around him as far as his shoes could reach. Rashid would be unlikely to search at the temple of Mut, nor could he induce any Arab servant to accompany him there after sundown. We would escort Mabel and her two protectors to the town and to the train for Cairo, Mr. Bronson promising to take the girl to Alexandria whence she could sail for home. 
It was the best plan we could think of in the circumstances, and Monty approved it, though her patience was tried by having to wait through nearly all of another day. Mabel must have begun to believe that we had ignored her prayer and meant to do nothing. I argued that the girl would believe we were working for her in our own way. I said, too, that if Rashid were spying, his suspicions would be disarmed by seeing us go the ordinary round of tourists. Everyone came to Luxor. We had come, leisurely, by river, and were sightseeing every moment. Even better, if he were on the spot, intended to finish his revenge as neatly as he had begun, could have noticed nothing suspicious in our actions. The mention of better in this connection seemed to startle Biddy, and I was sorry I had let his name slip. But, as I had said, everyone came to Luxor. Better had, with apparent frankness, explained that he was traveling up the Nile by rail with his two clients, and, if that were true, he would arrive at all our destinations in advance of us. Probably it would depend on the clients whether they lingered at Luxor long enough for us to run across them again. "'What are you afraid of?' I asked Biddy, when I had a chance with her alone, even if Better is a spy. "'Surely you kept your promise and left that chamois skin in a Cairo bank.' It wasn't a promise, she reminded me. I only said I'd think about it. Well, I did think about it, and I couldn't put it in a bank. I told you it was the sort of thing one doesn't put in banks. You didn't tell me what it was. I mean, what was in it besides money? No, I couldn't. Will you now? Oh, no. Well, then, will you give it to me to keep till we get back to Cairo? No, indeed. But, Duffer, dear, honestly and truly, it isn't for myself I'm afraid. You know that, don't you? Of course. Yet if people are believing that Monty Gilder is Rachel Guest, a poor little schoolteacher, then no one who heard the gossip would bother to risk kidnapping her for ransom. And also, there will be no further danger of those you fear mistaking her for. Oh, don't speak the name. I wasn't going to. I was merely about to use the word another. Good, Duffer. Yours is a consoling argument. Still, I never liked better or wanted him with us. And even now, there seems something mysterious about Rachel thinking so much of him. As if there were a secret arrangement between them, you know. I've never got over that, or understood it a bit. He flattered Miss Guest, perhaps. She loves flattery. But she's made her market now, and all through Monty's charity. She couldn't want to do her benefactress harm. No, I suppose not, unless it were to do herself good. Don't those eyes of hers say to you that she'd sacrifice anyone for herself? I've been thinking more about a different pair of eyes, and there were such a lot of men crowding round Rachel's for some reason or other. Now we know what the reason was, as she and Monty must have known all along, since their joke together began. Oughtn't you to tell Bill Bailey the truth? No, my dear girl, I must draw the line somewhere. I've gone about at people's beck and call, telling other people disagreeable truths till I'm a physical and mental wreck. Bill Bailey knows all about statues, and with and without glass eyes. Let him find out for himself about a mere girl with cat's eyes, Biddy snapped. If one triumph leads to another, Anthony could afford to be hopeful for the ending of our stay at Luxor. He had not done as much sightseeing as the rest of us, but when we had been asleep in our beds or berths, dreaming of temples or of each other, he had been out whispering and listening in places where his green turban opened doors and hearts. He had traced the mysterious trouble to its source, and learned the inner history of that regrettable incident which, like a dropped match, had lit a fire hard to extinguish. A party of young men traveling with a bear leader had laughed at some Arabs prostrating themselves to pray, at that sacred moment, just after sunset, ordained by Mohammed lest his people should appear to worship the orb itself. One of these youths, fancying himself a mimic, had imitated the Muslims. They were old men, unable to resent with violence what they thought an insult to their religion, but they had told their sons, and the story had spread. Later that night, the joyous tourists with their nearsighted bear leader had been attacked, apparently without reason, on coming out of a native cafe. Having forgotten the sunset prayer, they honestly believed that they had been set upon by men to whom they had given no provocation. They had uttered statements and complaints, and disgusted with the beastly natives had pursued their journey up Nile, visiting their grievances on the innocent, and making more mischief at each stopping place. Murmured threats, with dark looks, insulting words, and jostling of strangers by the inhabitants of Upper Nile villages, had occasioned anxiety at the British agency. It had proved impossible to get at the truth, and the influence of the young nationalists had been suggested. Our Haji had now turned the green light of his sacred turban upon obscurity, and those in power at Cairo would know how to set about repairing damages. 
In spite of private anxieties, those which I shared and others which I didn't share but suspected, I think Anthony was happy on that third morning at Luxor. He must have been tired, for much of his work had been at night, but he showed no fatigue. The true soldier look was in his eyes, the look I knew far better than the new and strange expression which had said to me lately, A woman has come to be of importance in Anthony Fenton's life. We spent our morning and a good part of the afternoon at Karnak, lunching irreverently but agreeably in the shade of fallen pillars, canvases, or the other great earthquake had thrown down. Neil Sheridan, who had been to California, likened the ruddy columns of the Great Hall to the giant redwoods. He was enjoying Karnak because there was practically nothing modern and Ptolemaic about it, but I thought how quickly he would lose this calmness of the student if someone blurted out a word of our plan for that evening. According to Monty, he had been taken with poor Mabella Hanim on board the Laconia, admiring her so frankly that Rashid had banished his bride to her cabin. If Sheridan regretted her, as a man regrets a woman vainly loved, he had confided in no one, not even Monty, who had risked seeming to seek his society in order to reach the secret of his heart. He had, however, been graver in manner than at first, so said the girl, who had been much with him before my appearance on the scene. Whether it was intuition or sheer love of romance which inclined her to the opinion, she believed that Sheridan was unhappy. It would make things worse for Mabel if our scheme failed were Neil Sheridan mixed up in the plot. Therefore, even impulsive Monty admitted the wisdom of keeping him out of it. But I could see by the way she looked at him, almost pityingly, when he discoursed of lotus and papyrus columns, how she was saying to herself, You poor fellow, if only you knew. The thing being to see the Temple of Luxor at sunset, we gave it the afternoon, as if condescending to do it a favor. When I remembered how I had meant to linger here week after week, I felt that I was paying a big price for my share of the Mountain of the Golden Pyramid, making a knockabout comedian of myself, rushing through halls of history followed by a procession of tourists as a comet tears past the best worth seeing stars, obediently followed by its tail. Still, I had Bridget and Monty as bright spots in the tail, and my old dreams of Luxor had been empty of them. These ideas were in my mind, while on donkeys and in Arabias we dashed as if our lives depended on speed, from the Temple of Karnak to the Temple of Luxor, along the dusty white road trimmed with sphinxes. This description was Enid Biddle's, she being happy and therefore frivolous. She rode with Harry Snell, as queens may have ridden along that way, guarding a captive prince who had been subdued forever. Sunset illuminated the world, as for a New Year's festival of Amun-Ra in his ruby-studded boat of gold, when we were ready to leave the glorious temple and turn to the region of little bazaars and big hotels, fair gardens, and girls with tennis rackets whose shape reminded our Egypt's steeped minds of the key of life. Monty and Bridget had slipped away. Their real day was just beginning. My heart was with them, Anthony's too, and his work permitted him to conduct his heart along the way that they must take, while I had to conduct the set to the Winter Palace Hotel and give them tea on the terrace. When everybody was rested and had had enough strawberry tarts, view and flirtation, we were to make for the Temple of Mutt, and having returned at last to Enchantress Isis, were to steam away just as tourist boats and dahabiyas were lighting up along the shore. We were to dine late, after starting, and anchor in some dark solitude, so as to enjoy a peaceful, dogless night on the Nile. But what would have happened to Bridget and Monty before the sounding of that dinner gong? What did happen at the beginning I must tell as best I can, because I was not there, and can speak for myself only from the Temple of Mutt. When they stole almost secretly away from Karnak, they took an Arabia which was waiting, and drove to the sugar plantation of Rashid Bey. This place of his is not prepared for a lengthy or luxurious residence, but as I have said, there is a house. There is also a small gatehouse, in a somewhat neglected condition, but a gatekeeper was there, the usual stout negro. Monty and Biddy were quivering with fear lest they should be refused admission, as at Asuet, but this time their coachman was Ahmed Atun, carefully disguised as a common driver of an Arabia, a rather exaggeratedly common driver, perhaps, for his face and turban were not as clean as the face and turban of a self-respecting Muslim ought to be. He had been helped to play this trick by one of the secret friends he had made in some cafe or other, the cousin of an uncle of a brother of him who should have sat on the box seat. But the motive he had alleged was not the real one. The two beating hearts in the Arabia had confidence in him. If the gatekeeper tried to send them away, Antun would bribe him or threaten him with black magic, or say some strange word which would be for them as an open sesame. 
The fat creature at the gate had no French, but the driver of the Arabia addressed him in Arabic and translated his answers. Yes, the great lady had come hither with her husband, the bay. Word should go to her. It should be ascertained whether it was her pleasure to receive these friends who had journeyed from a far country to pay her a visit. Monty and Bridget sat in the Arabia to wait, but they dared not talk to the dirty-faced driver, lest some spy should be on the watch, where every group of flowering plants might have ears and eyes. Even if the big gatekeeper came back with an excuse, as seemed too probable, there was hope from Anton's diplomacy, but the chances were two to one against success. Rashid Bey had almost certainly been put on his guard by the revengeful better who had shown himself all grinning friendliness to us. Rashid might have tired of playing dragon, as Antun prophesied, yet it would be strange if he had not given instructions that no European ladies were to visit his wife. Maybella Hanem had been snatched in haste from Asuet, but if she were still in Luxor with her husband, she and her women in the harem would be guarded by eunuchs, as in the more ambitious villa which Rashid called his home. I suppose Anthony, slouching on the box seat in his unattractive disguise, must have been as much astonished as Monty and Bridget, when the gatekeeper returned with another big negro to say that the ladies would be welcomed by Mabella Hanem. The two girls were wildly delighted. Fenton's emotions were mixed. He wanted to save the American bride from the consequences of her tragic mistake, but he cared more for his friend's safety than for hers. He knew that Monty and Bridget were brave, and that Monty had his browning, but the thought that she might need to use it could not have made him comfortable in the box seat of his borrowed arbia, outside Rashid's gate. It was arranged that he should give Maybelle's visitors one hour, thus allowing for delays and emergencies, but if they did not appear at that end of that time, he would dash off to tell the Luxor police that two ladies were detained against their will in the house of Rashid Bey. Once in charge of the chief eunuch, who had come to take them to the harem, Bridget and Monty might almost as well been deaf and dumb. But Bridget knew practically nothing of Arabic, and Monty, though she had been vaguely studying since her arrival, had been too passionately occupied with other things to give much time or attention to the language of Egypt's invaders. Her blood was beating in her veins now, and she could think of no words except Ishmi, Malish, and Masalama. These buzzed in her head like persistent flies, as she and Biddy followed their silent, white-robed, and turbaned conductor along a narrow pink path, toward a modern villa almost shrouded with bougainvillea. And they were the last words she needed. She didn't want to tell the ponderous negro to get out. On the contrary, she wished to be polite. So, far from saying no matter, everything mattered intensely. And unfortunately, it was not time yet to bid the creature farewell. Behind the white house, with its crimson embroidery of flowers, rose a thick growth of tall sugar cane, the shimmering green, pale as beryl, in the dreaming light which precedes sunset. The dark red of the bougainvillea looked like streaming blood against such a background. Though the villa appeared to be comparatively new, it was built according to Turkish, not European ideas, as it might have been were the owner a copt instead of a Mohammedan. The building was in two parts, entirely separating the Semelik from the Haramlik. The latter was small and insignificant compared with the former, for this was not a place prepared for family life. It was but a temporary dwelling, where the master would more often come alone than with the ladies of his harem. The eunuch opened a door leading into the woman's building, and Bridget and Monty entered the same secretive sort of vestibule they must have remembered in the house of the crocodile. A screen wall prevented them from seeing what was beyond, and the dead silence frightened them a little, so easy was it to make of this place a trap. In the vestibule was a long, cheaply cushioned bench, the resting place of the woman's custodian, and upon it lay spread open the eunuch's well-used Koran, which he had deserted to meet the visitors. Who had given him the order to go, and why it had been given, the guests began to ask themselves. Beyond the screen wall they entered an anteroom. Through a big window door they could look into a small grassy court that served as a garden, and opening from the anteroom was a second room much larger, which also gave upon the garden court. At the door of this the eunuch bowed himself away, but an involuntary glance which Monty threw at him over her shoulder showed that he was grinning. The grin died quickly as a white flash of heat lightning fades from a black night sky, but though the heavy face composed itself respectfully, there remained a disquieting tinkle in the full-lidded eyes. It struck Monty that the negro was amusing himself at the expense of the visitors because of something he knew which they did not know. 
We're not going to be allowed to see Mabel, she thought, with a jump of her pulses, and even when a negress, smiling invitingly, beckoned her and Biddy into the large room, whose three windows looked on the garden, she still believed that they had been deceived. She did not, however, speak out her conviction to Bridget. Nothing could be done yet. They must wait and see what happened. The room was furnished in abominable taste, with cheap trench furniture upholstered with blue brocade that clashed hideously with the scarlet carpet. There were several sofas and chairs stiffly arranged round the walls, but no tables save low maidas of carved wood inlaid with pearl, such as they had seen in Cairo bazaars and hotels. The windows were closed, and the air heavy, as in a room seldom used. The two seated themselves close together, on one of the ugly sofas facing a door through which the beckoning negress had gone out. There was no sound except the harsh ticking of a huge, bulbous clock, all gilding and flowers which stood in a corner. Monny's and Bridget's eyes met with a question. Who would open the door just closed? Would it be Mabel, or would Rashid Bey stride in, to reproach or insult them? Are you sure it's loaded? Biddy whispered. No need for Monny to ask what she meant. Sure, she answered. The handle of the door turned. End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter Twenty Two The Driver of an Arabia. Thank God, cried Biddy, as a slim figure in a loose white robe framed itself in the doorway. With a sob, Mabel ran toward them, both hands held out, and in an instant she was being hugged and kissed and cooed over. "'You found me! You've come!' she cried. "'I never dared think you would when he rushed me away from a suet. He said he would keep me here all the rest of my life to punish me for complaining to you.' "'But how did he know?' Monny asked. "'Did your sister-in-law tell him about the letter?' "'I don't think so, unless he has made her confess. It was like this. He was coming to his place here on business.' I felt so thankful. It seemed providential he should be away then, just when you were starting up the Nile. I was almost happy that morning, when suddenly he appeared again, and I was ordered to put on a habera and a yashmuk, and travel with him. Yina, the woman who acts as my maid, had to get ready in a hurry, too. The chief eunuch, a hateful, hypocritical wretch, followed. Some clothes have been sent to me since, but not many. At first I couldn't guess what had happened, and he was in such a fiendish temper I daren't ask questions. It wasn't till after we arrived that he explained. I'm sure he took pleasure in hurting me. He said that he left home early the morning he was going to Luxor, because he meant to stop and make a business call on the way to the depot. Otherwise he wouldn't have been able to rush home and fetch me as he did, and still be in time to catch his train after the warning. It was some dragoman you employed in Cairo, he told me, who had seen us getting off the Laconia, and who ran after his carriage in the street in Asuet. The wicked creature warned him that you were all there, and that he'd heard you say something which sounded as if there was a plot to get at me. Just at that minute, by the worst of luck, Mr. Sheridan passed. You know how foolish and cruel he was about Mr. Sheridan on the ship. Well, he hadn't forgotten, so he turned round and almost snatched me out of the house, rather than I should be left in a suet with him away. "'This is exactly what we thought must have happened,' exclaimed Monny. "'That beast better! And to think that I and Rachel wasted our time trying to convert him! How I wish I hadn't let Aunt Clara engage him at Alexandria! She thought he'd come from a man with her favorite name, Antony, but she wouldn't have insisted if I hadn't encouraged her. I feel as if this trouble were partly my fault. And if I hadn't been thoughtless enough at Asuet to blurt out your husband's name— "'You're not to blame for anything, dearest,' Biddy tried to comfort her. "'It was your unfailing resolve to help which has brought us here.' "'You're both my good angels,' said Mabel. "'Oh, it's heavenly to see you. "'But I can't understand why I'm allowed to, after all the threats and punishments. "'I'm afraid I shall be made to pay somehow. "'He loves to torture me, and he knows how. "'I believe he hates me. "'Now he's begun to realize that I'd give anything to leave him, "'that I don't consider myself his wife.' "'If he hates you, why isn't he willing to let you go?' Monny questioned her. "'Partly because he's very vain, and it would humiliate him. "'Partly because he has no son yet, only that horrid little brown girl, "'and he set his heart on a boy who's to possess all the qualities and strength of the West. 
No, he won't let me go. Well, you'll do it in spite of him, then, said Monty eagerly. That's what we're here for. We shall take you with us. You must say to your servants that we've invited you for a drive, and you've accepted. There's nothing in that to make them suspect. Lots of Turkish ladies go driving and motoring with European women in Cairo. And you can have that fat black man sit on the box seat with, with our coachman, if it would make things easier, taking him to guard you. He can be hustled or bribed or something when the right time comes to get rid of him, never fear. Oh, it's going to be a glorious adventure, and at the end of it you'll be free. Nobody could blame you, as the man has another wife. Mabella Hanem shook her head. You're splendid to plan this, but it's too late. It was too late from the moment that dragoman warned my husband. Why you've been allowed to come into the house and talk with me, I can't think, unless he is watching and listening through a hidden spy hole. There's sure to be some secret reason in his head anyhow, a reason that's for his good and not mine. And I shall not be able to get out if you do. If we do, echoed Biddy, a catch in her voice. She glanced furtively at Monty. What had we all been dreaming of when we let this beautiful girl run into danger? I know Biddy well enough to be sure that her thought was at that instant for Monty Gilder, not for Bridget O'Brien. But the fear in her heart was vague until the next answer Mabel made an answer that came almost with calmness, for Mabella Hanem's whole being was concentrated upon herself and her own imbroglio. Everything else, everybody else, even those friends who were risking much to help her, were secondary considerations. I don't suppose any real harm will come to you. I don't see how he'd dare. And yet there may be something on foot. Three men had come today, one who might be a dragoman and two Europeans. They came together. I saw them. And I haven't seen them go away. They're in the men's part of the house, the Selimlik. They must be with my husband. Perhaps there's only some business about the sugar cane. But did you see the men distinctly? Biddy asked in a changed tone. Yes, quite distinctly, for they glanced up at the window where I was peeping out. Of course they couldn't see me through the wooden lattice and the bougainvillea, but I had a good look at them. The dragomen seemed to have one blind eye. Oh, I hadn't thought of that before. Can it be the man who gave the warning? What were the Europeans like? Biddy questioned without answering. Were they wearing light tweed knickerbockers with big checks? No, they were in dark clothes, not very noticeable. Had one a scar on his forehead? Why, yes, I believe he had. The eyes of Bridget and Monty met, but there was none of that deadly fear in the girls, which Biddy was trying to keep out of hers. Even now it was hardly fear for herself. It was nearly all for Monty, but Monty must not know lest she should lose her nerve when it was needed most. That idea of Bridget's about Monty being mistaken for Esme O'Brien by members of the organization O'Brien betrayed had seemed foolish and far-fetched, although Esme was hidden from her father's enemies near Monaco, and it was at Monaco that Miss Gilder and Rachel Guest and Mrs. East had joined Bridget on the Laconia. I had laughed at the suggestion, and Biddy had been half ashamed to make it. But now, in this lonely house where she and the girl had been unexpectedly welcomed, in this house where the master watched, entertaining three strange men, the thought did not appear quite so foolish, quite so far-fetched. Indeed, Biddy marveled why it had occurred to none of us that one of the three dangers to be run in rescuing Mabel might come through better, the same danger which had perhaps threatened in the house of the crocodile. Too late to think of this now, the fact remained that we had not thought of it when there was time. Not even Biddy had felt certain that there was a secret motive for taking the girls to the hashish den, or that Better had been guilty of anything worse than indiscretion. His warning to Rashid Bey we had put down to a petty desire for revenge, to pay us out for his discharge. Though Biddy had never felt sure of his new employer's German origin, and though she had qualms at the side of the party, following or arriving before us on our pilgrimage through the desert and up the Nile, she had never associated their possible designs with Rashid Bey's grudge against us. Yet how obvious that Better should take advantage of it for his client's sake, if those two men were what she sometimes feared. Bridget had never spoken out to Monty what was in her mind about Esme O'Brien. She had known that Monty would laugh, and perhaps say, What fun! For the girl had invited Biddy to Egypt because she attracted adventures, and because Monty badly needed a few, her life having been, up to the date of starting, a kind of fruit and flower piece in a neat frame. Now, perhaps, Monty wouldn't laugh, but it was not the time to speak of new dangers. 
Well, if your husband thinks that creatures like Better and his Germans are going to help him stop us from getting out or taking you out, he's wrong, said Monty stoutly. Better's the most sickening coward, as Rachel Guest and I have reason to remember. But I'm glad we know what we have to expect, aren't you, Biddy? It was hard to answer, because the girl was, in reality, so far from knowing what she might have to expect. Bridget tried to smile her reply as Monty began to tell Mabel something of their plan, about the friends ready to rally round them once they were in the carriage waiting outside the gate, and about the motor coat and veiled hood which had been brought for Mabel to put on at a safe distance from the house. "'You'll have to start in your own things,' the girl was saying. "'Otherwise your servants would think it odd. "'Ring now, dear, for your woman, and have her give you your habara and yashmuk.' "'There are no bells,' said Mabela Hanem, with her soft air of obstinate hopelessness. "'When I want Yina, if she isn't in the room, I clap my hands as hard as I can. "'But I can tell you it is no use. It is too late.' "'As she spoke, throwing up her arms and letting them fall with a gesture of hapless despair, "'both Bridget and Monty felt that Islam had already raised a barrier between them "'and this delicate creature it had taken into its keeping.' In the white wool robe she wore, the kind of loose dressing gown affected by Turkish women, she looked more like a Circassian than an American girl. Always she had seemed to her would-be rescuers a charming doll, a feminine thing of exactly the type which would appeal to a Turk, weary of dark beauties. Her hair was so very golden, her eyes so very big and blue, her lashes so very black, her mouth so very red and small, but now she had become an odalisque. Mabel's friends realized that she would do nothing to save herself. They must do all. Hesitating no longer, Monty struck her hands loudly together. Yina did not come. The girl clapped again and yet again till her palms smarted, but nothing happened. Yina is in it, whatever they mean to do, said Mabel. She's had her orders. Very well, then, Monty persisted, her eyes shining and her cheeks carnation. You must go without your wraps. Come along. Don't be frightened. "'Isn't it better to risk something to get away "'than to stay here all alone when we're gone?' "'The pretty doll, with a little moan, "'gave herself up to her friends. "'Bridget, as well as Monty, realized that the moment had come. "'They must take her while she was in this mood. "'Let me go ahead,' said Monty, in a low, firm voice. "'You know why.' "'Bridget did know why. "'Monty had Anthony's Browning, "'and she alone understood the use of it. "'Yes, she must lead the way, "'yet Bridget longed to fling herself in front.' to make of her body a shield for the tall white girl she had so loved and admired. Biddy put Mabel in front of her and behind Monty, keeping her between them with two cold but determined little hands on the shrinking shoulders, and so pushing her along, protected front and rear, in the piteous procession. Of course, if the door leading toward the house entrance had been locked on the outside, there would have been the end of the endeavor, for the moment, but it opened to Monty's hand, and all three went on unchecked, until they came to the vestibule, where on the wall bench they had seen the Koran of the fat negro, awaiting his return. They had come tiptoeing, and had made no more sound than prowling kittens. Yet he sat there, facing the door, no longer heavy-lidded, a black mountain of lazy flesh, but alert, beady-eyed, as if he had been counting the minutes. As they swept through the doorway, hoping to surprise him, the eunuch jumped to his feet as lightly as a man of half his weight, and smiling with pleasure in the excitement of an event to break monotony, he blocked with his great bulk the aperture between wall and projecting screen. No wonder they had not needed to lock doors with this giant for a jailer, and a big Sudanese knife conspicuously showing in a belt under his open galabia. Rashid had perhaps wanted the white mouse in his trap to feel the thrill of hope, and then the shock of disappointment. He had counted completely on the guardian of his harem, but, though he had chosen an American wife, he had not counted on the courage of another type of American girl. The knife looked terrible, but it was sheathed and tucked into a belt. Anthony's browning was in Monty's hand and hidden only under her serge coat. Out it came with a warning click of the trigger, and with an astonished, frightened gurgle in his throat, the negro involuntarily fell back. Run, Monty breathed, prisoning him where he stood with the little bright eye of the browning cocked up at his face. She had to be obeyed then, and they ran, the two of them, flashing past the black man, touching his clothes as they squeezed by, yet he dared not put out a detaining hand. When they were away, safe or not, she could not tell, Monty still kept the pistol in position, but began slowly to turn, that she too might pass the dragon, 
holding him at her mercy till the end. Not a word of Arabic could she recall, but the Browning spoke for her, a language understood without the trouble of learning by all the sons of Adam. When she had backed through the doorway, the girl still faced toward the inner vestibule, and it was well she did, for scarcely was she out of his sight before the black giant was after her, taking the chance that she would have turned to run. But there was the resolute young face, with eyes defying his, and there was the weapon ready to blow out such brains as he had, if the hand on the knife moved. Again he fell back, and then Monty did run, making the best use she had ever made of those long limbs which gave her the air of a young Diana. She ran until she had caught up with the other two, flying toward the distant gate, for something told her that the negro would have hurried to tell his master of the trick the woman had played, preferring the lash on his back, perhaps, to a bullet through his head. She was right, no doubt, to trust her instinct, for the eunuch did not pursue, though his tale of failure was not needed. Rashid Bey had been watching from the window of the Selimlik, as Mabel, his wife, had watched when he received visitors. He did not wait for the negro's warning, but dashed out of the house, followed and then passed by several long-robed men in Arab dress. The faces of these were almost hidden by the loose hoods which desert men pull over their heads in a high wind, but had they been uncovered, the women would not have seen them. The thing was to escape, not to take note of the pursuers, and it was only Biddy, looking over her shoulder for Monty, who even saw that they were followed. She cried out to her friend to hurry, that someone was coming, that they must get to the gate or all would be ended. Then, feeling Mabel falter, she held her the more tightly and ran the faster. Rashid and his companions were shouting, not to the women, but to the gatekeeper, and as the master's furious voice rang out, just in front of the fugitive, all three together now, appeared the big form of the man at the gate. Monty did not know what to do, for in whichever direction she faced with the browning, she could be captured from the other. She might kill the negro, and then turn to keep the pursuers back, but the thought of killing a man sickened her. She had meant only to threaten, not to take life. Suddenly she felt afraid of the browning. She hesitated, in a wild second of confusion, hating herself for failing her friends, yet unable to decide or act. But hardly had the gatekeeper sprung in sight than he went down, flat on his face, struck in the back of the neck by the shabby fellow who had driven their carriage. "'Go on,' the dirty-faced Arab said in French. "'There's someone else to drive you. I'll follow. I'm armed.' The three sped by him as he stood aside to let them pass, showing to Monty a pistol which matched the one he had lent her. This consoled the girl in obeying, for as Antoun had trusted her courage in this adventure, so did she trust his, and his strength and wit against four men or four dozen men, if need were. There was the waiting Arabia, and there on the box was a much cleaner, more self-respecting Arab to drive it than the soiled figure which had left the horses and stayed in the garden. Afterwards they learned that the new man was the sister's cousin's uncle of the Haji's cafe acquaintance. He had been engaged to stroll past in the road, stop, speak, offer the gatekeeper a cigarette, drift into conversation, and be ready to jump onto the box seat the instant Antun left it. His instructions included the furious driving with the three ladies, once they had all bundled into the Arabia, to the temple of Mut. Rashid Bey had every right, according to his own point of view, to resent the kidnapping of his wife, and to get her back in any way he could, even if blood had to be spilt. But his companions, they who were muffled in the cloaks and hoods to save their faces from the sharp wind, had perhaps not the same right or interest. In any case, when they saw that the woman had a man, or men, to help them, and that so helped they had passed from the privacy of the garden to the publicity of the road, the three fell back. Publicity, it may be, did not please them, or else, thinking to have only women to deal with, they were not armed and did not like the look of the pistol. Rashid, evidently no coward, or past feeling fear in the rage at the failure of his counterplot, ran on, wheezing slightly, he was fat for his age, toward the erect Arab and the prostrate Negro. Beast! Devil! he panted breathlessly, and cried out other words of evil import in both Turkish and Arabic threatening the silent man of the pistol with death and things even worse. But before he had gone far, the hooded men caught up with him, and surrounding urged him back. What they said Anthony could not hear, or what he said in return, but he thought they were proposing some plan which appealed to Rashid's reason, for he showed signs of yielding. There was now no longer anything to detain the protector of the ladies, for by this time he hoped and believed that their arbia must be far on its way toward the temple of Mut 
the meeting place agreed upon. Accordingly, he stepped over the unconscious gatekeeper, who lay with his nose in the grass, and backed calmly out of the garden. Not far off, an Arabia was crawling along the road, so slowly that one might have thought the driver half asleep. But this supposition would have done him an injustice. Dusk had fallen now, the purple dusk which drops like a curtain just after the pageant of sunset is finished, yet the driver was wide awake enough to pierce the purple with a pair of sharp eyes, and recognize a figure expected. He whipped up his horse, and the dirty Arab running to meet it, in a few seconds the latter was on the box beside the coachman. Then the Arabia turned, and dashed wildly off according to the custom of Arabias, back in the direction whence it had been crawling. Two dark-faced men in the vehicle talked rapidly in low voices, speaking the language not only of the country, but the patois of Luxor itself. Your brother passed you in his Arabia? Yes, Haji, he passed with the three European ladies you told me had been in secret to visit their friend. Then Anthony knew that Bridget and Monty had been able already to carry out their plan of wrapping Mabella Hanim in one of their own cloaks. This was well and would save gossip if the occupants of the Arabia were stared at by passers-by. And at the temple also it would be well, for if possible the set were to know nothing, now or later, of the adventure. But though Anthony was glad of the news he had got from this Arab ordered to meet him at the gate, he did not settle down comfortably and say to himself, Thank goodness the thing is over. Those men back there in the garden would not so easily have persuaded Rashid Bey to let his wife go unpursued if they had not offered some alternative plan that could be carried out quickly. Still, so far so good. Bridget and Monty had won out and secured the prize, as Anthony had prophesied that they would do. They were on their way to the temple, where I would be with the comfortable, commonplace crowd from the Enchantress Isis, and where the American consul and his wife would just happen also to be wandering. Instead of driving straight there himself, Anthony went with a friend to an obscure, mud-built house in the village. When he came out of that house, his brown-stained face was no longer disfigured with dirt. It was immaculate, as noble as the proudest Haji's face should be, and above it was wound the green turban. Ahmed Atun Effendi's own dignified, old-fashioned robes of the Egyptian gentleman flowed around his tall figure, when once more he took his place in the waiting Ahabia, this time not on the box seat, and drove off at a more furious speed than ever toward the temple of Mut. End of chapter 22「If It Happened in Egypt」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « It Happened in Egypt » by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 23. Bengal Fire The Temple of Mut, I think, must always be mysterious, even by day. That night it was more than mysterious. It was sinister. Darkness shut us in among the pillars and the black, lion-faced statues. The least imaginative of my charges seemed to feel the influence of the place. Not an Arab, not even the superior boat dragoman, would come inside with us, because, after the sun has set, dethroned Sekhet comes into her own again. Strange stories are whispered by Arabs of the Temple of Mut, and of the ghostly golden Dahabia that once a year sails slowly by to a faint sound of music on the sacred lake. We had brought candles with us, protected by smoky glass from the wind that swept down the avenue of broken sphinxes outside, and hissed like angry cats through the dark courts lined with granite statues of the cat goddess. Yet despite the mystery, or because of it, people seemed curiously happy. The spirit of the past, of old Egypt, touched them in the shadowy places of this ruined temple, brushed them with its wings, and whispered half-heard words into their ears. They talked to each other in low tones, as if not to miss the whispers or the soft footfalls of unseen things and they did not laugh and make jokes or ask silly questions according to their irritating custom. I blessed this mood, for my nerves were jangled, more than ever after the Bronsons unobtrusively appeared, waiting for Bridget and Monty to come, wondering if they would come or what we should do if they didn't, because suddenly in this place of gloom and eloquent silence all the clever little plans Anthony and I had made in case of accident seemed futile. How could we have let those two walk alone into a trap? I blamed myself, I blamed Anthony, and sometimes I gave the wrong answers to Mrs. East, 
who walked with me, trying to keep out of the way of the crowd. She was anxious to talk of her niece, and to relate how she had been singing my praises to Monty. "'You mustn't be discouraged,' she said. "'Never mind about the hieroglyphic letter. Oh, no, you needn't worry. I haven't told her it was yours. Better let her think what she thought at first. Did I tell you what she thought? Please answer me, Lord Ernest. I don't mind your knowing, now, that I believed it was from Antun to me. Believing so did no harm. Why should it, to me or to him?' I soon guessed that there was a mistake somewhere, when he didn't, didn't follow the letter up. I was not offended by the proposal as Monty would have been. Oh, not if she'd known it was yours, but if she'd supposed Antoine was making love to her. Don't you see, you must have seen, you're so quick and observant, that she's been caught by the romance of him, just as she was afraid she might be by some thrilling prince when she came to Egypt. She's miserable. She's hating herself, and you won't save her, though I've prepared her mind. So that's what you meant when you hinted that I could spare her humiliation, I said, half in laughter, half in bitterness, suddenly able to concentrate my mind upon the talk. Do you think a man would want a girl to take him for such a reason when she's caring for someone else? But if it would be impossible for her to marry this someone else, why should it be impossible? She would think it impossible. Would she if... I checked myself, but Mrs. East understood instantly. If he has a secret, she said, then none of us has a right to suggest it to her. Every man for himself, Lord Ernest, in love. Antun Effendi has no reason to feel too kindly to Monty. You'll be robbing your friend of nothing if you speak to her. If he's in love with anyone, it isn't my niece. At least it's not you. Perhaps it's Biddy, after all, my thoughts interpolated. To care for Monty would be beneath his dignity, considering all that's past. "'And you can make her happy, as well as yourself, by taking my advice,' Mrs. East went on. "'Aren't you going to be sensible?' Just then came a murmur expressing surprise, or some other new emotion, from one of the outer courts where the crowd had wandered, Cleopatra having lured me, yes, lured is the word, into the sanctuary itself. "'Something has happened,' I said. "'Let's go back and see what it is.' "'Perhaps Antun has come,' Mrs. East caught me up eagerly. "'He was coming, wasn't he, when he'd finished his business? "'Or maybe it's only Monty and Bridget.' "'Only Monty and Bridget?' "'In the hope of seeing Antun, Cleopatra turned her back upon the dreary sanctuary not unwillingly, "'even though the burning question was left unanswered. "'I hurried her through the dark passages which lay between us in the courts, "'lighting our way with a glassed-in candle.' and it was all I could do not to cry aloud, thank heaven, or hurrah, or something else that would have opened people's eyes, when I saw that indeed Bridget and Monty had arrived. It was Rachel Guest and Willis Bailey who had hailed them from afar as candlelights flashed across their faces, and suddenly, to my eyes, the gloomy temple seemed to be brilliantly illuminated. I don't know how exactly I contrived to leave Cleopatra and get to the newcomers, but I did get to them in less than a minute. Perhaps I was a little rude to Mrs. East. I wasn't thinking of that at the time, however, nor of her. I separated the two I wanted from the others. Their faces radiated excitement, but I was not sure if it meant success. I was sure only that they had been through an ordeal and were feeling the reaction. You're safe, I said, and shook hands with them feverishly. Then I shook hands all over again. Safe, yes, Monty answered, and Mabel, why don't you ask about her? Oh, Lord Ernest, we've done it. We've done it. Thanks to Antun Effendi. We should have failed at the last if it hadn't been for him. Just look over there at the Bronsons and see if you can guess who it is they're talking to. I looked and saw a tall, thin Mr. Bronson and short, plump Mrs. Bronson trying to form a hollow square around a little figure in a long gray coat of biddies and a hood with a veil. I remembered her wearing the day we motored to Heliopolis. It seemed about a hundred years ago. I had conducted so much and so violently since, but I was not too old to remember Biddy's hood. What if Neil Sheridan, poking about alone with a candle, could see through that veil? Triumph, I exclaimed, you're heroines. I didn't know then how true were my own words. Was it a great adventure? Was it, Biddy? the girl asked, half shyly of her friend. So great that I can't talk about it, Bridget answered, and her eyes implored mine not to ask questions. Also, they said that she had things to tell me, not now, but by and by. Things for me alone. Biddy's eyes could be wonderful. Where's Antoine Effendi? Monty broke in when I had taken Bridget's hint, and was beginning to say that we must go and speak to the Bronsons. He hasn't come yet, I answered, and then her eyes, too, began to implore. 
Not come yet, but it's a long time. We found Mr. and Mrs. Bronson outside, hoping for us to arrive, and we talked to them and introduced Mabel and explained things. They would have liked to go and take her quickly away, but Biddy and I begged them not to. We said it would be better to wait for the rest and all the crowd to be together in case of trouble. Oh, we discussed everything for ages, minutes and minutes. I do think Anton Effendi ought to be here unless... I caught her up quickly. Unless... Well, you see, we left him inside Rashid's gate, where he'd just knocked down a big negro, and was keeping back Rashid and lots of other men, anyhow three, with a pistol, not the one he lent me. He told us to go, so we went. He told them to go, so they went? A change, this, for the gilded rose. She spoke at the moment like an obedient little girl. If he told you to go, it was all right, you may be sure, I said encouragingly. But despite my faith in Anthony as a fighting man, I felt, well, somewhat dismayed at the picture called up. Rashid and anyhow three men. It was rather a large order. If with a wish I could have sent every member of the set back to their peaceful homes in England and America, and thus rid myself of them in a second, they would have all found themselves walking in at their respective front doors. I wished this wish, but having a mere smoking candle in my hand, and not Aladdin's lamp, it didn't work. There they inconveniently remained in the temple of Mut, looking twice as large as life. What if I tell them they've seen everything, I muttered. They haven't, but that's a detail. If I could rush them all back to the boat, and you with them, of course, and get Mabilla Hanim and the Bronsons off safely, I could go look for Anth for Antun. Of course we were to wait for him, but I don't like the picture you've painted. Oh, do look for him, broke in Monny. Leave us to care for ourselves. I'm sure we can. There are enough of us, and Mr. Bronson is a consul. Go and get the police. I can't leave you, I said. Antun would be the last one to forgive me if I did that. But I'll start off the party now. The Arabias and donkeys are waiting. Listen to the stentorian voice of the conductor announcing. I tried to speak gaily, but the announcement, which I opened my mouth to roar through the temple, was never made. There came instead at that instant a rival roar from outside. Mine would have been the roar of a sucking dove. This other was a wild bull roar of rage. What it was for, who was making it, and whether it concerned us, we did not know. But it was the sound of many voices, and flowed to us on the wind. Driving nearer out of distance, it was startling and caused the heart to miss a beat. Suddenly the thought sprang into my mind that this was like something in a theater. We were on the stage, in a play of ancient Egypt, and a mob of supers was yelling for our lives in the wings. They would pour out upon the stage and attack us. Only the hero and heroine would be saved. All the villains and other unnecessary people would be polished off. Everybody had stopped talking. Involuntarily, groups drew together. We looked over our smoking candles, past the standing statues and the fallen statues, away toward the columns of the temple entrance. Mr. and Mrs. Bronson and the girl in Biddy's veiled hood and cloak walked across the court and joined our party of three. Neil Sheridan was at a distance. His prophetic soul told him nothing. I hope that fellow Rashid Bey hasn't worked up any trouble against us, the American consul from Asuet said in a low, somewhat worried tone. Instantly I was certain that what he hoped had not happened, was indeed the thing that had happened. I seemed to see Rashid stirring up a crowd of his fellow Muslims, telling them that dogs of Christians had robbed him of his foreign wife, who was on the point of accepting Islam. Nothing easier than for Rashid to find us. All Luxor knew we were in the Temple of Mut. These men of Luxor and the other Nile towns of Upper Egypt had not yet settled down after the outburst against Christian insults which had alarmed the authorities in Cairo. In three days, Anthony Fenton had discovered the dregs at the bottom of the teapot, and had doubtless done something toward calming the tempest in it, but the troubled water had not time to cool. It could easily be brought to the boil again, and the despoiling of a harem by Europeans, the harem of an important man, would be oil thrown into the dying fire under the tempestuous teapot. The furious voices grew louder. From the wave of sound, words spattered out and up like a spray. Perhaps in all that astonished crowd gathered in the Temple of Mut, Bronson and I were the only ones who knew enough Arabic to catch their meanings. His question was answered, and this was not a stage. Those shouting men were not supers in the wings, they were in earnest. 
Foolish and dreamlike and utterly unreal as it seemed, their hearts were hot with savage anger against men and women of an alien race. And, though what they might do to us would be visited on their own heads tomorrow, they were not thinking of tomorrow now. As for us, it was just possible that owing to this silly dream we were having about a mob of common, uneducated Arabs, for some of us there might not be any tomorrow. "'Is there a back door where we can dash out and give them the slip?' asked Bronson. I was thinking hard. Mine was the responsibility for my charges, these rich, comfortable tourists from London and New York, Birmingham and Manchester, Chicago and St. Louis. None of them yet knew that they were in danger.' They were thinking about their dinner and their pleasant, lighted cabins on board the Enchantress Isis, waiting for them not far away. They realized that something was the matter out there, that a lot of Arabs were making a row, but it interested and amused them impersonally. If somebody had robbed or murdered somebody else, morally it was a pity, of course, but it added to the picturesqueness of the scene and would be nice to tell about at home. I felt myself overflowing with a sudden new tenderness for the set, so often troublesome. This that was going to happen, unless we could stop it, was in truth the affair of Monty and Bridget, Mabella Hanem and the Bronsons, Anthony Fenton and me, but all would be involved, the innocent with the guilty, unless very quickly the duffer of the company could think of some way out. No, I heard myself say with decision, we mustn't leave the temple. They're superstitious about it. Few, if any, will venture in. What they want is to lure us into the open, and there must be no panic. Certainly, my friend, unless he's been hurt, is working for us somewhere. It's only a question of minutes. He borrowed my browning today. I wish, I glanced toward Bridget and Monty. They stood at a little distance with Mrs. Bronson and Mabel, but the faces of both were turned toward us. I saw that they guessed the meaning of the uproar outside. Biddy's great soft eyes spoke to mine, spoke, and told me the truth about myself. How I loved her, Biddy O'Brien, and no one else on earth. How I would die for her, and let all the rest die, if need be, yes, even Monty Gilder, to whom I had been idiot enough to write that letter. If I could save Biddy, what did anything else beside matter? But yes, it did matter. I must save them all. And the light that had lit up my dim soul gave me an inspiration. Because I loved Biddy, I knew what to do. I've got a little surprise for everyone, I yelled, to be heard over the noise outside where Rashid Bey's mob was now probably trying to make our donkey boys and Arabia men join in the fight or the siege. Mr. Neil Sheridan will kindly lead the whole party to the sanctuary, which his knowledge of architecture will enable him to find on the axis of the temple. Down that passage, please. In fifteen minutes the surprise will be ready, and you will receive the signal to return from Mr. Bronson, American Consul at Asuet. No time for introductions now. Sheridan, amazed, but perhaps not displeased, emerged from the dark corner where, until the row began, he had been examining a half-erased wall carving. "'Come along, then, everybody,' he shouted good-naturedly, and as the procession formed, discussing the surprise and the noise, now mysteriously linked together in the minds of my charges, I saw the veiled and hooded Mabel shyly try to pull Mrs. Bronson into place with her, as near as possible to Sheridan." She must have suspected that there was trouble brewing and guessed the cause. Her timid, self-centered little soul instinctively sought shelter in the neighborhood of a friend, who would perhaps have been more than a friend if he could. So she followed him, he not knowing what eyes the gray veil hid, but Mrs. Bronson broke away from the small hand and hurried back to her husband. "'What am I to do?' she asked. "'Go with the others,' he said quietly. "'Take care of the girl. Lord Ernest has some plan.' She went reluctantly, but Bridget and Monty and Mrs. East lingered at the tail of the procession, returning to us as the others vanished down the passageway that led toward the sanctuary. I motioned them away, but Monty ran forward while Biddy kept Cleopatra from following. They talked together and argued, Biddy's arm round the taller woman's waist, as Monty came straight to me and put into my hand Anthony Fenton's pistol. I didn't have to use it, she said. It's all loaded and ready. And I'm going to stay here with you and Mr. Bronson to help. What are you planning to do? Please run away, I said, and take Biddy and your aunt. You must. That's the only help we want. Not till you tell me what you mean to do. Oh, only to try a trick to frighten those Arab sheep out there. They funk this temple at night anyhow. And I've just remembered that I brought some Bengal fire to light the place up and amuse the crowd. 
I thought if a red blaze suddenly burst out, it would give those fellows a scare, and the police are on the way. But the Arabs will see that you're only two. They shan't see us at all. We'll hide behind those statues and pot at them if they do come in, which I doubt. Now off with the three of you, and I was getting my illumination ready. To my surprise and relief, Monty obeyed without further argument. Dimly it passed through my mind that she had been profiting by her lessons lately. I threw one glance over my shoulder, more, I'm afraid, to see whether my dear Bridget were on her way to safety than through anxiety for Miss Gilder. The three figures had already disappeared in the darkness, and Bronson and I gave ourselves to the work of lighting up. An ocean roar of voices surged round the temple entrance now, but the red light flamed like the fires of hell, and I, peeping from behind a statue, revolver in hand, saw that the temple itself had not been invaded. The flare lit the foreground of the darkness outside, and the columns of the front court. I could see a moving throng of black and white clad figures, gesticulating, running to and fro, seeming to urge each other to some action, yet none coming forward. I sprinkled on more powder, and up blazed the bangle fire again. Now somebody was taking the lead. A tall man was pushing through the crowd. Would they follow this brave one? My fingers closed round the browning. He was between the columns at last, but the light was dying down. I threw on all I had of the powder, and stared through the red dazzle to make certain what was happening, since this might decide our fate. The tall man's back was turned us. He seemed to be motioning the crowd away instead of urging them on. How to make sure, in the blood-colored glare, whether a man's turban was white or green or crimson? But that gesture, that lift of the head, no mistaking that, the man was Antun, Ahmed Atun, the worshipful Haji, haranguing the mob. Hardly would they let him speak at first. Those on the outskirts tried to yell him down. I heard the word traitor, and before the light ebbed, I thought I caught sight of Rashid's pale face under the red tarbouche, Rashid's broad shoulders in European coat, edging past Jebas and Galabias toward the columns. Then, just as the light died, from behind us in the temple came a cry. Above the shouting of the haji, who was beginning to make himself heard by the crowd, it rang out shrill and clear, a woman's voice, Monty Gilders. She called on the name of Antoon, and then was silent. I lifted my candle lantern, all that was left to illuminate the darkness, and saw at the far end of the court shadowy figures struggling together. It seemed to me that there were not two, but four or five. I ran toward them, and Bronson ran, but someone bounded past us both, a tall man in a green turban. A shot was fired after him and hit a statue. I heard subconsciously a miniature crash of chipped granite, but I don't think Anthony heard or had heard anything since that call for Antoon. He had dashed ahead, though we had the start and were running fast. Rounding a group of statues, erect and falling, I saw a candle lantern on the floor, and knew that Monty, and perhaps Biddy, had not obediently followed the procession to the sanctuary after all. They had waited to watch and listen, hiding behind the black statues of Seket, and men who had crept in by another way, doubtless by the small Ptolemaic gate opening on the lake, had taken them by surprise. Anthony had got to the shadowy mass, which, moved like black wind-bone clouds, vague and shapeless, before Bronson and I were near enough to distinguish one form from another. As for our eyes, his tall figure blended with the waving shadows. Two revolver shots exploded with thunderous reverberations. We did not know if he or another had fired, but almost simultaneously with the second shot, two black shapes separated themselves from the rest, fleeing into darkness. They took the way by which they must have come, the way leading toward the gate on the lake. Three seconds later we were on the spot, and the only shadows left resolved themselves under my candlelight into the forms of Bridget O'Neill, Monty Gilder, Anthony Fenton, and Mrs. East, somewhat in the background. Monty's hat was off, and Biddy's was apparently hanging by a hat pin. Their hair was in disorder, a rope of Biddy's falling over one shoulder, a shining braid of Monty's hanging down her back. Monty seemed to be more or less in the arms of Antun, but only vaguely and by accident. Dimly I gathered that she had stumbled and that he had saved her from falling. Biddy was fastening up the front of her gray chiffon blouse, which was open and torn. Her hands trembled and I could see that her breast rose and fell convulsively, for, though the light was dim, I was looking at her, while I merely glanced at the others. 
Mrs. East was crying, but Bridget and Monty had smiles for Bronson and me as we came blundering along, stumbling over unseen obstacles. Someone stole up behind me with an electric torch and tried to drag me away, said Monty, in a weak little voice, scarcely at all like her own. It sounded as if a ventriloquist were imitating her. Someone called me Esme O'Brien, whispered right in my ear, and I screamed and fought and Antoon came. I think, then, that the man pushed me down as he ran away. Anyhow, I fell, and Antoon picked me up. Oh, Biddy, are you safe? Why, your dress is torn. Yes, but I'm safe, answered another small, weak voice. I fought, too. I, I think they wanted to rob me. Thank goodness I didn't have it on. The bag, dearest? Yes, darling, the bag. I thought I wouldn't wear it today. Out in the night the yells had subsided since the Haji's harangue, if not wholly because of it. The police have come, said Anthony. It occurred to me that Rashid and some friends of his were cooking up a plan, and while I was getting into my clothes in the village it jumped into my head what it might be. So on my way out to the temple I stopped and left a warning. We're all right now, and I don't think the Arab lot would have dared venture in anyhow. These chaps who sneaked in at the back and attacked the ladies were dressed like the rest, but I doubt they were Arabs. He would have doubted still more if he had known all that I knew. But the one secret I'd kept from him was Biddy's secret. The words Esme O'Brien whispered to Monty as yet meant nothing save bewilderment to Fenton. The fifteen minutes are up, and no signal yet for your famous surprise, called out Sir John Biddle's complaining voice from the end of a dark passage. Has anything gone wrong? Oh, I was going to give you a Bengal fire illumination of the temple for a climax, I explained, coming suavely forward to meet him with my candle. But the beastly stuff er, sort of went off by itself, and it's all used up. I was uh, just going to call you. Well, not much harm done, said Sir John. We've seen the sanctuary, such as it is. A little disappointing, perhaps, especially as Mr. Sheridan found a friend with Mrs. Bronson, the consul's wife, and preferred talking with her to giving out information to us from his stores of knowledge. But luckily, not more than twenty minutes wasted. By the way, what's become of the row outside? Seems to have fizzled down while we were away, like your red fire. Yes, a great man of some sort was addressing the crowd, but the police came and made it move on. There's been a bit of a negative grumbling in the Nile towns lately. You may have read some paragraphs about it in the Cairo papers, so the police are rather quick to break up meetings. Why should men meet near the Temple of Mut? inquired Sir John. I shouldn't think of doing it. Perhaps in the beginning they hoped to get something out of the Europeans, I said lightly, but they'd given that up, evidently. I hope they haven't seduced our donkey boys and Arabia drivers, exclaimed Sir John. I'm hungry, and I'm in a hurry to get home. Not they. Donkey boys and Arabia men aren't easily seduced when there's a question of bakshish. They're all right. I'm only sorry about the Bengal fire. Well, it was a good idea, anyhow, Sir John patronized me. C'est vrai, I heard a murmur in his chosen language. The haji who had saved the situation. C'était une idée très bien pour un duffer. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter twenty four. Playing Heavy Father to Rachel. Never had the enchantress Isis looked so enchanting to my eyes as she looked that night. I felt, as the set trooped on board, like an anxious hen-mother, who, contrary to her fears, has safely returned a brood of ducklings to the home chicken coop after a swim out to sea. I valued each duckling, even the last downy, far more than I had dreamed it would be possible. But there was one duckling valued so much more than all the rest, how much more I had realized only when, cackling on the bank, I saw it on the wave, that knowing that it was safe made me hysterical with joy. I could have kissed its napkin when it slid it off its lap and I picked it up. The napkin, not the duck, at dinner. The drawback was that I had not saved it, as Anthony had saved Monty. It had no reason to be grateful to me, or care more than it had always cared for a friend. And still another drawback presented itself when the confusion of dressing in haste and dining, as the enchantress Isis steamed out of Luxor, gave me time to think. The duckling was not my duckling, and considered that it had calmly laid plans for me to capture an heiress, 
considering also that it had not yet abandoned these plans, I saw little reason to hope that, now I had come to a few, just a few, of my senses, it would ever take the idea seriously of becoming mine. To abandon, once and forever, the duckling simile, the first thing I did on board the boat, after recovering from the excitement of seeing Mabel off by train with the Bronsons, was to wonder how I could make up for all this hideous waste of time when I might have been making love to Biddy. But there was no chance to say anything personal to her that night. I had to hear, and wanted to hear, the story of all that had happened from the moment she and Monty entered Rashid Bey's gate to the moment they came out. Then there was Antun's story to follow, and after that we had to compare notes, how everybody had felt, what everybody had thought, what everybody had done. This subject was inexhaustible and kept cropping up in the midst of others, but that of Mabella Hanim, her escape from bondage and from conversion to Islam, and what revenge Rashid was likely to take, was almost as engrossing. When at last, late that evening, I managed to get Biddy alone for a moment, she could no more be induced to talk of herself than if she had been a ghost without visible existence, a mere voice to speak of others, Monty by preference. What a heroine Monty had been from first to last! And what did I think now about the foolishness of that theory, the theory that Better was a spy and had led his employers to believe that Mrs. Jones was traveling with her stepdaughter concealed under an impeccably important nom de guerre? What I thought was that we must get a hold of Miss Rachel Guest and question her as to her whole acquaintance with the Armenian, learning how, by all that was incredible, the double mystery of mixed names had originated. Monty knows only that Rachel was supposed to be the heiress, testing her personal attractions by pretending to be the poor school teacher, said Bridget. The child's been wildly enjoying the situation, for she was tired of young men. Rachel wasn't, and Rachel's been profiting by it far more wickedly. As for Esme, I'm sure no thought of her name coming into this business ever entered Monty's head. We must try to find out what Better said to Rachel at the beginning, as you advised of her, and all about it. After what I told you that I heard from Esme about an exciting love romance, any mistake of this sort might be particularly dangerous. The organization might think it had more right than ever to be bitter against us. And now I don't mind your confiding in your friend Captain Fenton. I think I'd like him to know my story. What Biddy had told me about Esme was that the girl had confessed in a letter, having been made love to during a summer holiday in the mountains with friends, by the son of a man her father had deeply injured. The accidental meeting had been a real romance. The girl and the young man thought that no one save themselves shared their secret. But who could tell when fate itself stood between them with a drawn sword? The love of Romeo for Juliet was a safe and simple affair compared with the merest flirtation between the daughter of Richard O'Brien and the son of John Halloran, whom O'Brien's testimony had sent to prison for life. Sometimes I thought, as the days went on, that Biddy guessed, not my change of heart but my new understanding of it, and that she wanted quietly and gently to show me, according to Bill Bailey's pet expression, there was nothing doing. Her expressed wish that Fenton should hear her story looked to my suddenly suspicious mind as if his strong personality and his extremely picturesque position had made an appeal to the romance in her, as it had in the case of Mrs. East and perhaps Monty Gilder. Always interested in Mrs. Jones from first sight, when he had laughingly said that the little sprite of a woman would be almost too alluring if surrounded by an air of mystery and intrigue, Anthony was now frankly preoccupied with her affairs. He was not even annoyed that, unaided by me, her quick mind had grasped the secret of his identity. It was like her to spring on to it by instinct, he said, smiling that thoughtful smile of his, which was more than ever effective in his Arab get-up. And like her not to give anybody else a hint, except you, of course, though she must have been tempted sometimes. I suppose, and he looked up quickly, she hasn't given anyone else a hint? I'd swear she hasn't. Miss Gilder, you're sure she hasn't the slightest suspicion? As sure as a man can be of anything about a woman. You aren't trying to evade the question, Duffer. On my word, I'm not. I feel morally certain Miss Gilder labors under the impression that you're as brown as you're painted. That somehow or other you can't be Muslim because she's seen you without a turban, and you've got the hair of a Christian. Maybe she thinks you're a cop. I heard her learnedly arguing the other day that the cops are the only real Egyptians. She has the air of studying you sometimes, 
but with all her study, she sees you only as an Egyptian of high birth and attainments, with a few drops of European blood in your veins, perhaps just enough to make things aggravating, and a vague right to a princely position if you choose to overlook something or other and claim it. There you have her conception of you in a nutshell. There would still have been room in that nutshell for Cleopatra's ideas concerning her niece's feelings, but if she were right, it was Anthony's business to discover those feelings for himself, provided that he cared to do so. And of this I was not sure. There was the doubt that it might be Biddy, even though he appeared to attach some unexplained importance to Miss Gilder's continued ignorance about himself. The day after leaving Luxor, there was no time for the heart-to-heart -heart talk I planned for Rachel Guest. Each hour, each minute almost, was taken up with my duties as conductor, which I was obliged to regard seriously whether I liked them or not. If I did not, the set growled, snapped, or clamored, which gave me even more trouble than doing my duty. For some reason best known to herself, but suspected by me, Mrs. East kept to her suite, nursing a grievance and the Siberian lapdog from a suet. This saved me a certain amount of brain strain, for among other places of interest we had to pass near was ancient Hermonthus, where in her Cleopatra incarnation she had built a temple with a portrait of herself adoring the patron bull of the city. If she had known how easy it would be to visit the ruins, she would have been capable of desiring the boat to stop, or telegraphing complaints to Sir Marcus if it hadn't. The two excitements of the day were passing through a huge lock, with sides like those of a canyon and scarlet doors such as might adorn the house of an ogre, in which we nearly stuck, and were saved by Antun seizing the pole from the inferior hands of a Nubian boatman, also a visit to Esna, a very Coptic town, starred with convents built by the ever-present St. Helena, sacred once to the Latos fish, now sacred to gorgeous baskets of every size and color, also somewhat over-beaded and over-scarabed. A ruined quay jutted into the wine-brown water, where Roman inscriptions could have spied out, if any one had had eyes to spare from the basket sellers, the sellers of grapefruit, and the other shouting merchants who flocked to head us off on our way to the temple, despite a flurry of rain that freckled the deep sand of the landing hill. But nobody did have eyes for anything Roman, now that Cleopatra sulked in her throne room, and our only archaeologist was as absent-minded as if he had been his own astral body. He had seen the wisdom of sticking to the trip, and not turning back by train with the Bronsons and somebody else, as he might have yearned to do, if Monty were right, but history had suddenly become as dry husks to Sheridan. His soul was no longer with us, journeying up the Nile, and I suspected his body of packing to join it, as soon as things had been arranged to un -hanim Mabel, and send her, freed from a marriage which was not marriage, freed from this fear or forcible conversion, home to the United States. It was just on the cards, Anthony and I thought, that there might be another demonstration at Esna. It was just on the cards, Anthony and I thought, that there might be another demonstration at Esna, that unruly town where Muhammad Ali banished the superfluous dancing girls of Cairo in the 1840s. If Rashid Bey had not discovered the truth about that hurried departure from Luxor for Asuet, as a matter of fact, Mabel and her guardians were almost thrown on board as the train began to move, he might have sent emissaries or come himself to Esna, where he must have known the enchantress Isis would land. As for Better and his employers, Anthony, who now knew Biddy's suspicions, was inclined to think that, even if she were right, we had seen the last of them. After such a setback as that in the Temple of Mut, he thought that they would not only be discouraged, but frightened. They had run away from us, in the temple, and despite the proverb concerning those who fight and run, to fight another day, it was probable that men of their caliber would see the wisdom of abandoning the chase. They had shown themselves cowards, Anthony thought, whatever their object had been in attacking Miss O'Brien and Miss Gilder, and though we must be on the watch during the rest of the trip, his idea was that the men had retreated in fear of arrest. In any case, we had no trouble at Esna, and saw no sinister faces peering out of low doorways in the bazaars, or over the heads of the pretty, sometimes fair and blue-eyed, dancing girls' descendants. Buried in the heart of the village, we came upon the temple. Only the portico was visible under piled houses and a triumphant mosque, but once we were down in the entombed temple itself, it gave a sense of secrecy and mystic rites, to look up from under the dark roof of heavy stone with its painted zodiac, 
out from hidden halls of carving and color to the clustered houses of dried brick built before the temple was uncovered. There was a sense of tragedy and failure, too, toiling up the steep slope to the town level and passing, on the half-buried walls, gigantic carved figures making thwarted gestures in commemoration of kingly triumphs forgotten hundreds upon hundreds of years ago. At night there was a fantasia on board, with our boatmen dancing each other down, like highlanders, and the next day brought us to Edfu, which all the women were wild to see because Robert Hitchens had called its green-blue the true color of love, an adorable temple sacred to Horus, as there he conquered and killed Set. It was only after we had passed Sir Ernest Castle's red house, with the smoky irrigation works where fourteen hundred Arabs have chased the desert into the background, and after we had visited the splendid twin temples of light and darkness at Kom Ambo, towering majestically above the Nile bank, that I found time to catechize and lecture Miss Guest. I contrived to separate her from her sculptor and lure her to a part of the deck unfrequented because it was windy. Rachel was looking happy, young, and prosperous in one of Monty's most becoming and expensive dresses. At first I think she felt inclined to be flattered by my desire for her society, for I had never yet wished her joy or formally congratulated Bailey. One look into my eyes, with those clever, slanting green orbs of hers, however, an instinct must have told her that my intention was different. She glanced round for an excuse to escape, but found none, for I hedged her in from all her friends. Then she quickly decided to shunt me off on an emergency track laid by herself. "'What a wonderful day it's been,' she remarked, "'and Kom Ambo is one of the best temples. The only thing I didn't like was those mummied crocodiles.' Their smiles look so hypocritical, and to think they've been smiling them for thousands of years. It must be unpleasant to smile the smile of a hypocrite, even for a few weeks, I seized the chance to work up to the business. Yes, indeed, agreed Miss Guest, a slight color staining her cheeks. And didn't you notice several new sorts of wall inscriptions? Yes, I admitted, but if you don't mind, I'd like to skip sixteen or seventeen centuries and come down to you. I've been wanting a chat. "'Why, I'm delighted,' she exclaimed, frightened, but all the more ingratiating. "'Oh, isn't the Nile beautiful as we come toward Nubia? "'And aren't the Sakiyas more interesting than the Shadifs, "'which they mostly use when the river is low? "'Willis said quite a lovely thing about the Sakiyas, "'that their chains of great water cups going up and down "'look like enormous strings of red and green prayer beads, "'being told by unseen hands. "'He ought to be a poet, he's so romantic.' "'No doubt everything about you, Miss Guest, must make an appeal to his romantic side,' I cut in, while she was forced to pause for breath. "'I hope I do appeal to him,' she said meekly. "'I never thought to be so happy.' This was a direct appeal to me, and it hit the mark. I didn't care a rap about Willis Bailey, or his sketches, or the wooden statues with crystal eyes, with which he was going to make the fashion. If Miss Guest chose to hook her shining fist with a false fly, it wasn't my business.' It was hers and his, and perhaps Monty's, for Monty had backed Rachel up in creating a wrong impression, as if they two had been playing together, like children, to trick the grown-ups. But I had to find out what had started the ball rolling, because it looked as if that ball had come out of the pocket of better. "'I'm glad you're happy,' I said, "'and my hope is that you'll remain so. I wish you so well that perhaps you'll give me the right to ask a few questions.' You see, I'm one of your oldest friends in Egypt, after Miss Gilder and her aunt and Mrs. Jones. You met Miss Gilder and Mrs. East traveling in France. They've told me. Yes, in a dining car. We were put at the same table and got talking. I just loved Monty at first sight, and she's been heavenly to me. What fun we've had. I never had any fun before. I hardly knew the meaning of the word. I suppose it must have amused you and Miss Gilder, I planted my arrow at last, though not remorselessly. "'This quaint idea that's got round about your having changed places.' "'Rachel's face crimsoned. "'Oh, Lord Ernest,' she sighed in an explosive whisper, "'with a glance round to see if any one were near. "'But we were alone with the beginnings of a sunset "'that flushed the dun hills as unripe peaches are flushed on a garden wall. "'I've promised Monty not to say a word and spoil her fun, "'as long as the trip lasts. "'She's finding out, you see, which people are really attracted to her for herself.' She says it's a wonderful experience, and it's given her such a rest from men, the silly ones, you know. It isn't my fault. I'd tell in a minute if she'd let me. 
Was it she who began the game, I dare to inquire, or was it better? Now this is a question I really have a right to ask. I'll tell you why afterward, if you don't know already, from Monty. No, I don't think Monty said anything to make me understand that, Rachel answered, stammering a little, and trying pathetically not to look anxious. But I'll answer you, of course. There's nothing to hide from you now that I can see. It was better who began. He was the most intelligent, extraordinary person. I don't believe anyone fully realized it except me. But from that first night at Alexandria, he seemed to feel that I saw something of value behind his poor face. He was very sensitive, and he attached himself to me in the most beautiful, faithful way. Really and truly, if there hadn't come that trouble about the hashish place, which wasn't his fault, because Monty wanted to go, and when she wants things, she wants them very much, I believe I could have made a Christian of him. He would have been a wonderful convert. We talked more about religion than anything else, but he used to like to chat about America, because he'd been there and hoped to go again. That was the way the joke about Monty and me started. He did not ask me to speak of it, but it can't matter now. He told me when he was in New York, with a family who took him from Egypt, one day the great Mr. Gilder's daughter was pointed out to him in the street. She was with her father in an automobile, but there was a block in the traffic. A policeman was keeping it back, so he saw her distinctly for several minutes, and he was interested because his employers told him how important the Gilders were, and how Mr. Gilder used to have his daughter guarded every minute for fear she might be kidnapped for ransom, as several rich people's children had been. Monty couldn't have been more than fourteen then, as it's seven years ago, and better said that the little girl he saw in the automobile was exactly like me, hardly at all like what Monty is now. He wanted me to tell him, for a reason which he vowed and swore was very important, whether I wasn't really Miss Gilder and she was Miss Guest. Well, well, I thought the idea so funny, so thoroughly quaint, you know, and like something in a book, that just for fun I answered that I couldn't tell him anything until I'd consulted my friend. Monty nearly went wild about it. She said she'd come to Egypt to have adventures, and she was going to have them, no matter whether school kept or not. That's just a little slang expression people use at home sometimes. I dare say you've heard her say much the same thing. She said this idea of betters was too good to miss, and we'd get bushels of fun out of it. So we have, in different ways. And she's been lovely about giving me dresses and things. When she and I talked the matter over, she understood why better should have thought she was more like me at the age of fourteen than like her present self. She'd had typhoid fever just before the time she must have been pointed out to him, and it had left her thin as a rail and as pale as a ghost. Her hair was short, too, and some of the color had been burnt out of it by the fever. Now you know she has a brilliant complexion, and her face is much rounder than mine, as well as more pink and white. Compared to her, I am sallow, I'm afraid, and lanky, and when she and I stand together, her hair looks bright gold, and mine light brown in comparison. Monty wouldn't let me tell better right out that he was mistaken about us. She said we wouldn't fib, but we'd act self-conscious, as if we had a secret, and he'd stumbled on it. He must have started the story. Oh, if you could call it a story. I don't believe anything has ever been put into words. It was in the air. People got the idea, but better must have put it into their heads. Neither Monty nor I did more than smile and look away, and change the subject if anyone hinted. We said, you mustn't breathe such things to Mrs. East or Mrs. Jones, or they'll be angry. Apparently nobody ever did dare to breathe it to them. And I think Monty mentioned you, too, Lord Ernest. She didn't want you to know. She was afraid you'd say that the whole thing was nonsense. I suppose it was Enid Biddle who came to you? She was afraid Mr. Snell, but it isn't worth talking about now. Only she is a cat. Miss Biddle had said exactly the same of Mrs. Guest. Naturally, however, I did not mention the coincidence. Now I told you everything you wanted to know, haven't I? Rachel went on. Or were there any more questions you'd like to ask, I mean, about better? Only one more, I think. Did it ever strike you that he was curious about you, or rather about Miss Gilder, who, you both let him suppose, was really Miss Guest? Anything about your name? Why, yes, he was curious. They say Arabs always are, if you let them be. Not that he is exactly an Arab, but I suppose Armenians are the same. He seemed to want to know things about me, what I'd done, where I'd lived, and, oh, lots of little questions he would ask. Monty and I made up our minds from the first, as I told you, that there mustn't be any fibs. I simply put him off. He never got anything out of me at all. 
I see, I said, and let myself drift away from her into thoughtfulness. Is that all, then? Yes, that is all, thank you. Her tone sounded as if she were relieved of a mental weight, and would like to go. I expected her to make some excuse. It would soon be time to dress for dinner, or she had to write a letter. But no, she lingered. She was trying to bring herself to say something. I waited in silence, my eyes on the shining river, looking back at the golden trail of the sun that was like a rich mantle draping a gondola on a fete day in Venice. I suppose you think, she forced the words out at last, that Willis Bailey wouldn't have fallen in love or proposed if he hadn't thought like the rest, that I, I, I don't see why he shouldn't, Miss Guest. He really does seem to care for me, as I am, you know, and I've never told him a single untruth. I've nothing to blame myself for. I'm sure of that. Yet you don't approve of me one bit. You think I'm a kind of adventuress. So does Mrs. Jones. Me. Why, what would the people at home in Salem say if anyone suggested such a thing? You don't know the life I've led, Lord Ernest. I can imagine. You don't want to go back to it again, do you? It does seem as if I couldn't now. It seemed so, even before Willis... Oh, I'm sure you think I never meant to go back once I'd broken free from the dull grind. No harm in that. I'm glad you say so. It took all my legacy to see the world a little. Well, nearly all. Not quite, perhaps, to tell the truth. And being brave has brought me this reward. The love of a man who can give me everything worth having. I shan't be outside life any more. And Willis won't have any reason to blame me when he... When he... No reason, of course. I fitted into her long pause. But men as well as women are unreasonable sometimes, you know. And if he should be so, uh, wrong-headed as to think you'd deceived him about yourself, then he ought to blame Monty, not me. He ought, perhaps, but the question is what he will do. And you can't like having a sword hanging over your head. Supposing he should be unjust and refuse to carry out... Oh, Lord Ernest, you don't think he will, after he's sworn that I'm the only woman in the world he could ever have loved. He thinks me much better looking than Monty. He says she hasn't got a soul yet. He doubts if she will ever have one. I didn't doubt it. I thought I had heard it stirring in the throes of birth, a soul such as would blind the eyes of a Rachel guest, with its white shining. Monty had said that she would find her soul in Egypt, but the mention of this was not indicated just then. I haven't the courage to tell him, even if there were really anything definite to tell, Rachel went on. It would be insulting a man like Willis to suggest that he'd been influenced, you know what I mean. But now we're talking of it. Oh, do advise me. We're planning to be married in Egypt at the end of this trip, and then settle down in Cairo for Mr. Bailey's studies at the museum. He came up the Nile only for me, you see, and he says I shall be his first model for the new style. My eyes are just right, as if they'd been made on purpose to help him. I lie awake nights wondering what if, before the wedding, when he finds out for certain that my name is really only Rachel Guest, and that I'm, oh, I daren't think of it. Then, if you want me to advise, why don't you, in some tactful, perhaps joking way, speak of the story better started, and I can't, I simply can't. Yet you feel it would be better? Yes, sometimes I feel it. You help me, Lord Ernest, you tell him. And then, see if you see any signs. You'll make him understand how dreadful it would be to throw me over because I'm poor and have been a nobody till now. I'll do my best. I heard myself weakly promising. No wonder I have earned the nickname of Duffer. End of chapter 24、Chapter、25, Part 1 of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt. By Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 25. Marooned. Part 1. Had any human fly ever buzzed himself so fatally into the spider webs of other people's love affairs? I asked myself sternly. As soon as Providence plucked me out of one web, back I would bumble into another, though I had no time for a love affair of my own. When the enchantress Isis had slipped past many miles of desert shore, black striped and tawny as a leopard's skin, and other desert shores so fiercely yellow as to create an effect of sunshine under gray skies, we arrived at Aswan. 
I had not yet kept my promise to Rachel, though whether from lack of opportunity or courage I was not sure. Here we were at historic Aswan, and nothing had happened, nothing which could be written down in black and white, since the excitement at Luxor. Nevertheless, some of us were different within, and the differences were due, directly or indirectly, to those excitements. Now that we were nearing Ethiopia, alias the land of Cush, though Monty said she could not bear to have it called by that name, except, of course, in the Bible, where it couldn't be helped. How would any of us like to register at an hotel as Mr. or Miss So-and-so of Cush? Oshkosh sounded more romantic. No land, however, could look more romantic than Aswan, city of the cataracts, Greek Syene, that granite quarry whose red cyanite made obelisks and sarcophagi for kings of countless dynasties. Swan, as the cops renamed it, a frontier town of Egypt since the days of Ezekiel the prophet, now appeared a gay place, made for pleasure pilgrims. Sky and river were dazzling blue, and the sea of sand was a sea of gold, the dark rocks lying like tamed monsters at the feet of Knum, god of the cataract, glittered bright as jet, over which a libation of red wine had gushed. The river front of the town, with its hotels and shops, was brightly colored as a row of shining shells from the southern sea, tints of pink and blue and amber, translucently clear in contrast with the dark green of lebbek trees and palms, in whose shadow flowers burned, like rainbow-tinted flames of driftwood. Between our eyes and the brilliant picture, a network of thin dark lines was tangled, as if an artist had defaced his canvas with scratches of a drying brush. These scratches were, in reality, the masts of moored feluccas, bristling close to the shore like a high hedge of flower stems, stripped of blossoms and bent by driving wind. On the opposite side of the river, the desert crouched like a lion who flings back his head with a shake of yellow mane, before he stoops to drink. And in the midst of the stream rose Elephantine Island, with its crown of feathery palms, its breastwork of Roman ruins, a medal of fame for the kings it gave to Egypt, and its undying lullaby sung by the cataract among surrounding rocks. Very strange rocks they were, black as wet onyx, though for thousands of years they had been painted rose by sunrise and sunset, shapes of animal gods, shapes of negro slaves, shapes of broken obelisks and fallen temples, shapes of elephants like those seen first by Egyptians on this island, shapes which one felt could never have taken form except in Egypt. Over our heads, armies of migrating birds made a network like a great floating scarf of beads, each bead a bird, and the blue water round the slow-gliding enchantress was crowded with boats of many hitherto unknown sorts, that they might have been visiting craft from another world. Feluccas with sails red or white, or painted in strange patterns, or awninged, some with rails like open trellis work of many colors, over which dark faces shone like copper in the sunshine, rowing boats, galleys with fluttering flags, and old soap boxes roughly lined with tin, in which naked imps of boys perilously paddled. Out from the boats rushed magic in clouds like incense, wild African music of chanting voices, beating tom-toms, or clapping hands that clacked together like castanets. Very old men and very young youths thumped furiously on earthen drums, shaped like the jars of elephantine, once so famous that they traveled the length of Egypt filled with wine. The breeze that fanned to us from beyond the palms and lebbics, the roses and azaleas, was soft and flower-laden. There was a scent in it, too, as of ripe grapes, as if a fragrance lingered from vanished days when wine for the gods was made from elephantine vineyards, and fig trees never lost their leaves. We ourselves and our big three-decked boat were alone in our modernity, if one forgot the line of gay buildings on the shore. Everything else might have been out of the time when the world supposed Elephantine to be placed directly on the Tropic of Cancer, and believed in the magic lamp which lit the unfathomable well, the time when quarries of red and yellow clay gave riches to the island, and all Egypt thanked its gods when Elephantine's nilometer showed that the two lands would be plentifully watered. Most of us were going to live on board the Enchantress for our three days at Aswan, but, hearing that lords and ladies of high degrees swarmed at the Cataract Hotel with its wild, watery view of tumbled rocks, 
and at the Savoy in its flowery gardens, some went where they might hope to cross the path of dukes and duchesses. The Moniites were not wild about the aristocracy, nor would royalty, of later date than the Ptolemies, have lured Cleopatra from her suite on the boat. But the whole party was eager for shore, and no sooner had the enchantress put her foot on the yellow sands than she was deserted by her passengers. The bazaars were the first attractions, for everybody said that they were as fine in their way as the bazaars of Cairo. So very soon we were all buying silver, ivory, stuffed crocodiles, and ostrich feathers from the Sudan, which now opened its gates not far ahead. The Sudan, mysterious, unknown, and vast. Cleopatra clung to me with a certain wistfulness, as if in this incarnation she were not so intimately at home in Upper Egypt as she had hoped to be. Perhaps this loneliness of her soul was due to the fact that instead of seeking her society, Anthony with an H seldom came near her now. Something had warned him off. He would never tell me or anyone on earth, but unused to the ways of women as he was, I felt sure that he had been uncomfortably enlightened as to Cleopatra's feelings. The cure, according to his prescription, was evidently to be absent treatment. But there was another which I fancied might be efficacious, the sudden arrival on the scene of Marcus Antonius Lark. I happened to know that he proposed a dash from Cairo to Aswan by train, for I had received two telegrams at the moment of walking off the boat. The first message announced his almost immediate advent, the second regretted unavoidable delay, but expressed an intention not to let us steam away for Wadi Halfa without seeing him. The alleged excuse was business, but I thought I saw through it, and sympathized, for he whom I once cursed as a brutal tyrant of money-bags now loomed large as a pathetic figure. Despite the lesson of the lotuses, I believed that his motive was to try his chance with Mrs. East, that life had become intolerable, unless Lark's luck might hold again, and that he could not wait till the cruel lady returned to Cairo. It was a toss-up, as we walked side by side to the incense-laden bazaar, whether I told her the news or left her to be surprised by the unexpected visitor. Eventually I decided that silence would help the cause, and in thus making up my mind I was far from guessing that my own fate and Monty's and Anthony's and Bridget's hung also on that insignificant decision. I was thankful that Mrs. East said no more of bringing her niece and me together, and that, on the contrary, she dropped dark hints about everything in life which she had wanted, being now too late and useless to hope for in this incarnation. Why she had changed her plans for Monty I could not be sure, enough for me that she apparently had changed them. Sir Marcus did not appear the next day or the next, and I heard no more. Indeed, between dread of breaking the truth to Bill Bailey, and self-reproach at letting time pass without breaking it, I almost forgot Lark's love affair. I salved my conscience by working unnecessarily hard, and even helping Kruger with his accounts, when Anthony too generously relieved me of other duties. How I envied Fenton at this time, because no girls asked him what men they ought to marry, or implored him to prevent men from jilting them, or urged him to enlighten handsome sculptors with wavy soft hair, and hard eyes resembling the crystal orbs which were to become fashionable in society. Anthony loved Aswan, and apparently enjoyed displaying its beauties. Not knowing that I hid a fox under my mantle, he meant to be kind in taking people off my hands, giving them tea on the Cataract Hotel veranda, escorting them to the ruined Saracen Castle which, with Elephantine opposite, barred the river and made a notable gateway, leading them at sunset to the Arab cemetery in the desert, and to the Bisharan village where wild, dark creatures, whose hair was pinned with arrows and whose ancestors were mentioned in the Bible, sold baskets and bracelets and what not. There were really, as Sir John Biddle remarked, a plethora of sights, not counting the magnificent rock tombs, since the set had definitely struck against tombs of all descriptions. But even with an excursion to the ancient quarries, for a look at half-finished obelisks, for once I had not enough to do, and Fenton had snatched Biddy from me as well as Monty. Mercilessly he had them sightseeing every moment, and I could no longer scold Rachel for letting things slide. To blame her would be for the pot to call the kettle black, 
It was on the day of the great dam that I screwed my courage to the sticking place and made Bailey understand that his fiancée was nobody but Rachel Guest, that she would be Rachel Guest all her life until she became Mrs. Someone or Other, preferably Mrs. Willis Bailey. Somehow it seemed appropriate to do the deed at the dam, and always in future, when people ask what impression the eighth wonder of the world made upon me, I shall doubt for an instant whether they refer to the American sculptor or to the barrage. The way in which we went was so impressive that it was comparatively easy to be keyed up to anything. Most travelers make the trip on donkey back, or else, as far as Shalal, in a white, blue-eyed desert train, where violet window glass soothes their eyes and prepares their minds for a future journey to Khartoum. After Shalal, they go on in small boats to the wide, still lake, which the great dam has stored up for the supply of Egypt. But we of the enchantress Isis were super-travelers. Our boat being of less bulk than her new rivals, she was able to reach the barrage by passing up through its many lots, and proceed calmly along the upper Nile, between the golden shores of Nubia to Wadi Halfa. We remained on board for the experience, and though I had the task of telling Bailey still before me, I would not have changed places with a king, as standing on deck, with Biddy by my side, I felt myself ascending the once impassable cataracts of the god Knum. If Biddy had been the only person by my side, I should have risked telling her the secret she ought always to have known. But there were as many others as could crowd along the rail, for once they were reflective, not inclined to chatter. Perhaps the same thought took different forms, according as it fitted itself into different heads. The thought of that marvelous campaign of the boats, which fought their way past these cataracts to relieve Gordon. The ascent was a pageant for us. For them it had meant strife and disaster and death. We admired the glimpses of yellow desert. We exclaimed joyously at the mad turmoil of green water, the blood-red and jet-black rocks below the dam. For us it was a scene of unforgettable majesty. For those others, the waste of stone-choked river must have yawned like a wicked mouth, full of water and jagged black teeth, which opened to gulp down boats and men. It was on the brink of the barrage itself that I spoke to Bailey, and there, looking down over the immense granite parapet, upon line after line of tamed cataracts breathing rainbows, we were so small, so insignificant, that surely it could not matter to a man whether the girl of his heart were an heiress or a beggar-maid. There was room in the world only for the mighty organ music of these waters, and the ever underlying song of love. I saw by the look in Bailey's eyes, however, as he gazed away from me to the long-necked dragon form of a huge derrick, that it did matter. I had been tactful. I had mentioned the mistaken identity as if it were a silly game played by children, a game which neither he nor I nor any one could ever have regarded seriously. He controlled himself and took it well, so far as outward appearance went, but soon he made an excuse to escape, and presently I saw him strolling off alone, head down, hands in pockets. Luncheon was being prepared on the veranda of a house belonging to the chief engineer of the dam. Its owner was a friend of Sir Marcus Lark, and being away had agreed to lend his place to our party, Kruger having done no end of writing and telegraphing to secure it. Many of our people had got off the enchantress Isis on one of the lots, and had walked up the steps to the summit level of the barrage, Bridget and I among others. And as we assembled for lunch, it was an odd sight to see our white, floating home rising higher and higher, until at last she rode out on the surface of the broad sea of Nile, which is held up by the granite wall of the barrage. She was to be moored by the dam, and to wait for us there until evening, when we should have exhausted the barrage and ourselves, and have visited Philae. By and by luncheon was ready, served by our white-robed, red-sashed waiters from the Isis, but Bailey did not return. Rachel begged that our table might wait for a few minutes. Perhaps he had gone the length of the dam in one of those hand-cars, on which some of our people had dashed up and down the famous granite mile, their little vehicles pushed by Arabs. He might be back in a few minutes. But the minutes passed, and he did not come. The dragon derrick stretched its neck from far away, as if to peer curiously at Rachel. The black and red and purple monsters, disguised as rocks for this wild, masquerade ball of the Nile, foamed at the mouth with watery mirth at the trouble these silly things called girls had always been bringing upon themselves, 
since earth and Egypt were young together. The look of the forsaken, the jilted, was already stamped upon Rachel's face. She tried to eat, when the picnic meal could be put off no longer, but could scarcely swallow. Monny glanced at her anxiously from time to time, perhaps suspecting something of the truth, and the eyes of both girls turned to me now and then with an appeal which made unpalatable my well-earned hard-boiled eggs and drumsticks. Bother the whole blamed business, thought I. Hadn't I done all I could? Wasn't I practically running the lives of these tiresome tourists as well as their tour? What did that adventuress out of a New England schoolroom want of me now, when I'd washed my hands of her and her affairs? But all through there was no real use in asking myself these questions. I knew what Rachel wanted, and that I should have to do it, if only to please Biddy, who would be broken-hearted if Monty's indiscretions should wreck the happiness of even the most undeserving young female. Darling Monty must be saved from remorse at all costs. One of the costs to me was luncheon as well as peace of mind. I excused myself from the table. I pretended to have forgotten some business of importance. I whispered to the enchantress dining-room steward, who had come to look after the waiters, that the meal must be served as slowly as possible. Drag out the courses, said I. Make them eat salad by itself and everything separate except bread and butter. Having given these last instructions, I was off like an arrow shot from the bow, a reluctant arrow sulking at its own impetus. Instinct was the hand that aimed me, the enchantress Isis was the target, and deck cabin number 36 was the bull's-eye. As I expected, Bailey was in his stateroom. I had not far to go, only to hurry from the engineer's house, along the river bank to the landing place, where a number of native boats were lying, jump into one, and row out a few yards. But the heat of noon, after the cool shade of the veranda, was terrific. I arrived out of breath, my brow richly embroidered with crystal beads, just in time to find Bailey squeezing his bath sponge preparatory to packing it, in a yawning kit bag already full. At such a moment he could squeeze a sponge. I hated him for this, as though the sponge had been Rachel's heart. On his berth lay a letter addressed to her and another to me. No doubt he told us both that he had received an urgent telegram. He was so taken aback at the sight of the taskmaster that he let me withdraw the sponge from his pulseless fingers. I laid it reverently on the washhand stand as a heart should be laid on an altar. End of chapter 25, part 1。Chapter 25, part 2 of It Happened in Egypt。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 25. Marooned, Part 2. My dear fellow, I began. Yes, to my credit be it spoken, I said, dear fellow. You don't know what you are doing. I speak for your own sake. Think what people will say. Everyone will see why you left her. And you don't want to leave her, you know. Of course you don't. You love Miss Guest. She loves you. Not all the crystal eyes in the world can make you the fashion if the eyes of your fiancé are red with tears because you jilted her when you found out she was only herself. People don't like such things. They won't have their artists cold and calculating. It isn't done. You can't afford to have squeezed us, but I mean break a heart in this fashion. It will ruin your reputation. So I argued with a certain eloquence, forcing conviction until with a fierce gesture Bailey snatched six collars from his bag and flung them on the bed. Seeing thus clearly what I thought showed him what others were sure to think, and the world's opinion was life itself to Bailey. He was code, then conquered. At last I dared to say, May I? He nodded. Instantly I tore the letters into as many pieces as there were collars. Afterward, when we walked off the boat, arm in arm, I dropped them into the water. We got back to the engineers before the picnickers had finished their belated Turkish coffee. Bailey took the vacant chair between Miss Guest and Monty Gilder. Biddy said that she had asked to have some coffee kept hot for me. I needed it. That is what delayed our start for Philae, and is, I suppose, why everything that took place there afterward happened exactly as it did. 
If we had left the dam an hour earlier, there would have been no excuse to stop for sunset at the temple, which those who love it call the Pearl of Egypt. As it was, but that comes afterward. When Strabo went from Syene to Philae, he drove in a chariot with the prefect of that place, through a very flat plain, and on both sides of their road, I fear for their bones it was a rough one, rose blocks of dark, hard rock resembling Hermes towers. Nearly two thousand years later we were rowed to the same temple, across an immensely deep, vast sheet of shining crystal. We lulled, I am fond of that word, though aware that it's reserved for villainesses, in galleys painted in colors so violent that they looked like tropical birds. They were a-winged and convulsively propelled by Nubians whose veins swelled in their full black throats, and whose ebony faces were plastered with a grayish froth of sweat. Each pressed a great toe, like a dark-skinned potato, on the seat in front of him for support in the fierce effort of rowing. Turbans were torn off shaved, perspiring heads, and even skull-caps went in the last extreme. Wild animals were chanted to all the handiest saints to grant aid in the terrible undertaking. An eagle-eyed child at the steering wheel gazed pityingly at his agonized elders. And then, just as you expected the whole crew to fall dead from heart failure, they chuckled with glee at some joke of their own. There was always breath and energy enough to spare when they wanted it. But what would you? The laborer must be worthy of his hire, and a little something over. When Strabo saw Philae, she was a distant neighbor of the mighty cataracts. Now the waters which once rushed down are prisoned by the great dam, and stand enslaved to wall the temple round like a great pearl in a crystal case. She is the true bride of the Nile, for, as long ago the fairest of maidens gave herself to the water as a sacrifice, so Philae gives herself for the life of the people. She drowns, but in death she is more beautiful than when the eyes of the old historian beheld her, glowing with the colors of her youth, yet already old, deserted by gods and priests and worshippers. Now she has worshippers from the four ends of the earth, and the greatest singers of the world chant her funeral hymn. For in all Egypt, with its many temples of supreme magnificence, there is nothing like Philae. None can forget her. None can confuse her identity for a moment with that of any other monument of a dead religion. And if she were the only temple in Egypt, Egypt would be worth crossing the ocean to see because of this dying pearl in its crystal case. Venus rose from the sea. Philae, the marriage temple of Osiris and Isis, Venus of Egypt, sinks into the sea of waters poured over her by Canum, god of the cataracts. Thus the great enchantress sings her swan song to touch the heart of the world, her fair head afloat like a sacred lotus on the gleaming water. I think there were few among us who did not fancy that they heard that song as our Nubian men rowed across the sea stored up by the great barrage. From far away we saw a strange apparition, as of a temple rising from the waters. It seemed unreal at first, a mere mirage of a temple. Then it took solid outline, darkly cut in silver, a low, column-supported roof, a pylon towering high, and to the south, separated from both these, a thing that might have been a huge wreath of purple flowers. We knew, however, from too many photographs and postcards, that this was Pharaoh's bed, the unfinished temple of Augustus and Trajan, standing on a flooded island. Our boat glided close to the flower-like stems of the columns supporting the low roof. Far down in the clear depths we could see the roots of the pillars, or their phantom reflections. And in the light of afternoon the water was so vivid a green that the color of it seemed to have washed off from the painted stones. Onto this roof we scrambled, up a flight of steps, and found that we were not to have Philae to ourselves. There were other boats, other tourists, but we pretended that they were invisible, and they played the same game with us. Ignoring one another, the rival bands wandered about, wondered what the place would be like with the water down, quoted poetry and guidebooks, and climbed the pylon. From that height the kiosk, called Pharaoh's Bed, showed a mirror double, like an old ivory casket with jeweled sides, piled full of a queen's emeralds. We loitered, we explored, and having descended sat down to rest, 
dangling irreverent feet over barrel depths, splashed with gold. Thus we whiled away an hour, perhaps. Then the set, impressed at first, had had enough of the mermaid temple's tragic beauty. Sir John Biddle reminded me that it had been a long day for the ladies, and very hot. Hadn't we better get back to the Enchantress before sunset? But that was exactly what some of us did not want to do. The matter was finally settled by retaining our one small boat with two rowers and sending off the two larger galleys with their full complement of passengers, excepting only Mrs. Jones, Miss Gilder, Antuna Fendi, the melancholy Cleopatra, and the guilty shepherd of the flock, who knew he had no business to desert his sheep. He did, nevertheless, feel, poor brute, that after such a day he had earned a little pleasure, and accordingly proceeded to snatch it from fate, despite disapproving glances. Punishment, however, fell as soon as it was due. I had stayed behind with the intention of amusing Bridget, but Monny took her from me, as if she had bought the right to use my childhood's friend whenever it suddenly occurred to her to want to chaperone. Instead of Biddy, I got Cleopatra, and by this time, so far as we knew, all tourists save ourselves had gone. I knew in my heart that, in accusing Monty Gilder of claiming Bridget O'Neill because she was paying her expenses, I did the girl an injustice. Monty was afraid of herself with Anthony. I saw that plainly, since the fact had been laid under my nose by Mrs. East. She feared the glamour of this magical place, perhaps, and felt the need of Biddy's companionship to keep her strong, not realizing that anyone else was yearning for the lady. This was the whole front of her offending, yet I was so disappointed that I wanted to be brutal. Without Biddy, I should wish but to howl at the sunset, as a dog bays at the moon. And feeling thus, I may not have made myself too agreeable to Cleopatra. In any case, after we had sat in silence for a while, waiting for a sunset not yet ready to arrive, she turned reproachful eyes upon me. "'Lord Ernest,' she said, "'I think you had better go and join Monny.' "'Why?' I surlily inquired. "'I thought you thought that idea of yours was too late to be of any use now.' "'I do think so,' she replied. "'Everything interesting is now too late. "'Still, you'd better go.' "'Are you tired of me?' I stupidly catechized her. "'Well, I feel as if I should like to be alone in this wonderful place. "'I want to think back.' I see, said I, scrambling up from my seat on the edge of the temple roof, and trying not to show by my expression that I was pleased, or that both my feet had gone to sleep. In that case, I'll leave you to the spooks. May none but the right ones come. Thank you, she returned dryly, and I limped off, walking on air, tempered with pins and needles. Joy! My luck had turned. At the top of the worn stone stairway, cut in the pylon, I met Biddy. She was dim as one of Cleopatra's Ptolemaic ghosts, in the darkness of the passage, but to me that darkness was brighter than the best thing in sunsets. "'Salutation to Caesar from one about to die,' I ejaculated. "'What do you mean?' she asked. "'I mean that both my feet are fast asleep, and I shall certainly fall and kill myself if I try to go one step further, up or down.' "'You, the climber of impossible cliffs after seabirds' nests,' she laughed. But she stood still. I'm after something better than seabirds nests now, said I. The question is whether it's not still more inaccessible. Are you talking about Monny? she wanted to know in a whisper. Sit down and I'll tell you, was my answer. Oh, not here at the top of the steps, if it's anything as private as that, Biddy objected, all excitement in an instant. Let's come into a tiny room off the stairway, which the guardian showed me a few minutes ago. There's a bench in it. You see, he's up there on the pylon roof now with Monty and Captain Fenton. I can't call him Antoon when I talk to you. It's too silly. And he'll probably be coming down in a minute. Then, if we stop where we are, we'll have to jump up and get out of the way to let him pass. And he's sure to linger and work off his English on us. I don't think we'll want to be interrupted that way, do you? No, nor any other way, I agreed. Oh, but what about the sunset? We may miss it. Hang the sunset. Let it slide down behind the dam if it likes. I don't wonder you feel so, you poor dear, Biddy sympathized, when it's a question of Monty and all our hopes going to pieces the way they are doing every minute. There isn't a second to lose. So we went into the little room in the tower, which was lit only by a small square opening over our heads. 
We sat down on the bench. It was beautifully dark. I began to talk to Biddy. We had forgotten my feet, and I forgot Mrs. East. But I must tell what was happening to her at the time, as I learned afterward through the confession of an impenitent, before I begin to tell what happened to us. Otherwise, the situation which developed can't be made clear. I left Cleopatra calling spirits from the vasty deep, or rather one spirit, the spirit of Antony. I am morally sure that any other would have been de trop. And sailing to her across the wide water from Shalal came Marcus Antonius Lark. I can't say whether she considered him an answer to her prayer or a denial of it. Anyhow, there he was, better perhaps than nobody, until she learned from his own lips, tactless though ardent lips, that he had come from Cairo to Aswan, from Aswan to Philae to see her. Then she took alarm and remarked in the old, conventional way of women that they'd better go look for the others. But Sir Marcus hadn't spent his time, money, and gray matter in hurrying to Philae from Shalal for nothing. Finding himself too late to catch us at Aswan, he had paid for a special train in order to follow his enchantress, the lady, and the boat. Taking a felucca with a fine spread of canvas and many rowers, which characteristically he bargained for at the Shalal landing place, he sailed across to the moored steamer, only to learn from Kruger that we had gone on our expedition to Philae. That meant a long sail and row for the impatient lover. For us, the longer it was, the better one of the chief charms of our best day. But for him it must have been tedious, despite a good breeze that filled the sails and helped the rowers. On his way to the temple he met galleys going home to the enchantress Isis. An instant shock of disappointment, and then the glad relief of realizing that the one he sought was still at the place where he wished to find her. There were only four obstacles which might prevent an ideal meeting. The names of these obstacles, in his mind, were Jones, Gilder, Fenton, and Borrow, and being an expert in abolishing obstacles, the great Sir Marcus began to map out a plan of action. Luckily for him, our small boat had moved out of Cleopatra's sight, as she sat and dreamed on the low temple roof, while we four obstacles disported ourselves on different paths of the high pylon. The two Nubians wished to play a betting game with a kind of Egyptian jackstones, and it was not desirable that the pensive lady should behold them doing it. Observing the graceful figure of Mrs. East silhouetted against the sky's eternal flame of blue, and at the same time noticing that she could not see the waiting boat, Sir Marcus got his inspiration. He knew that the four obstacles were somewhere about the temple. Now was his great chance while they were out of the way, and if he resolved to play them a trick, perhaps he salved his conscience by telling it that the obstacles male and female, ought to thank him. Cleopatra probably thought, if she glanced up to see his boat, oh dear, another load of tourists, and promptly looked down to avoid the horrid vision. By the time Sir Marcus came within how-do-you-do distance, he had bribed our waiting boatman to row away, this in order not to be caught in a lie. With our Nubians and their craft out of his watery way, he was free to fib when the time came. "'Go look for the others?' he echoed Mrs. East's proposal. "'Why, they've gone. I met them.' "'Gone? And left me behind when they knew I was here?' she exclaimed. "'They can't have done such a thing.' "'I'm afraid there's been a mistake,' replied Sir Marcus presently. "'They certainly have gone. I met the boat. "'Borrow was expecting me today, you know, or maybe you didn't know. "'And when he saw me in my felucca, he stopped his to explain that evidently there'd been a contretemps. I'm sure Lark mispronounced that word. The temple guardian said a gentleman had arrived and taken the lady who was waiting off in a boat. Of course, Borrow thought I had come along and persuaded you to go with me, after telling the guardian to let him know. I expect the guardians got mighty little English, and they say white ladies all look alike to blacks. He must have mixed you up with some other lady. I suppose my folks haven't been the only people at Philae since you came? Mrs. East admitted that a number of creatures had come and gone, but she thought all had vanished before the departure of the galleys. "'You see, you thought wrong. That's all there is to it,' Sir Marcus assured her, and having taken these elaborate measures to secure the lady's society for himself alone, Nubian rowers don't count, he proceeded to lure her hastily into his own boat, lest any or all of the obstacles should arrive to spoil his coup.' 
That was the manner of our marooning. At the time, we were ignorant of what was happening behind our backs. The sunset, for instance, and the only available boat calmly rowing away from the drowned temple of Philae. We were thinking of something else, and so was Sir Marcus, or he would not have forgotten the repentant promise he had made of himself soon to send back a boat and take us off. We were therefore in the position of unrehearsed actors in a play who don't know what awaits them in the next act, while those who may read this can see the whole situation from above, below, and on both sides. Four of us marooned at Philae, not knowing it, and night coming on. End of chapter 25, part 2「Chapter twenty six of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter twenty six. What we said, what we heard. Biddy, you were never wiser in your life, I exploded as I got her on the bench. You warned me there wasn't a second to lose. I've lost years already, and I can't stand it the sixtieth part of a minute longer without telling you how I love you. My goodness, gasped Biddy. Do be serious for once, Duffer. This is no time for jokes. Don't you know you've delayed and delayed in spite of my advice till you've practically lost that girl? And if there's any chance left, the only chance I want is with you, I said. Darling, I want you with my heart and soul, and all there is of me. Have I any chance? And how long since you were taken this way, demanded Biddy, at her most Irish, staring at me through the darkness of the little dim room in the pylon. Ever since you were an adorable darling of four years, I assured her. Only I was interrupted by going to Eton and Oxford, and your being married. But the love has always been there, in a deep undertone. The music's never stopped once. It never could. And when I saw you on the Laconia, you fell in love with Monty. Breathlessly, she cut me short. Nothing of the kind, I contradicted her fiercely. You ordered me to fall in love with Miss Gilder. I objected politely. You overruled my objections, or tried to. I let you think you had. And for a while after that, you know perfectly well, Biddy, the set gave me no time to think any thoughts at all, connected with myself. You poor fellow, you have been a slave. The soft-hearted angel was caught in the trap set for her pity. And a martyr, a double-dyed martyr. I deserve a reward. Give it to me, Biddy, promise, here in this beautiful marriage temple, to marry me. Let me take care of you all the rest of your life. My patience, a nice reward for you, she snapped. Let you be hoist by the same petard that's always lying around to hoist me. What do you think of me, Duffer, after all the proofs we've just had of the dangerous creature I am? Why, the whole trouble at Luxor was on my account. Even you must see that. Monny and I wouldn't have been let into Rashid's house if those secret men hadn't persuaded him to play into their hands and revenge himself on you men as well as on us for interfering with Mabel. It was their plot, not Rashid's, we escaped from, and it was theirs at the Temple of Mutt, too. Rashid was only their cat's paw, thinking he had played his own hand. Just what they wanted to do I can't tell, but I can tell from what one of them said to Monty in the temple that they took her for Richard O'Brien's daughter. Poor child, her love for me and all her affectionate treatment of me must have made it seem likely enough to them that she was Esme, safely disguised as an important young personage to travel with her stepmother. Better must have assured his employers that he was certain the pale girl was really Miss Gilder, so they thought the other one with me must be Esme. You can't laugh at my fears any more, and I ask you again, what do you think of me to believe I'd mix you up in my future scrapes? I think you're the darling of the world, said I, and my one talent, as you must have noticed, is getting people out of scrapes. It'd be wasted if I can't have you. Besides, under the wing of an embassy, no one will dare try and steal you or blow you up. We'll be diplomats together, Biddy. Come, you say I've duffed all my life to get what I wanted. Certainly I've done a lot of genuine duffing in love, but do bear out your own expressed opinion of the work by saving it from failure. Couldn't you try and like me a little, if only for that? You were always so unselfish. Hush, said Biddy, suddenly. Hush. Do you hate me, then? Is it by any chance, Anthony, you love? No, no, hold your tongue, Duffer. No, to both questions? I shan't stop till you answer. 
No, to both, then. Now will you be silent? Not unless you say you do care for me. Yes, yes, I do care, but shh. Don't you hear? They're talking just outside that window in the wall. If you can't keep a still tongue in your head, then for all the saints, whisper. Her brogue was exquisite, and so was she. I worshipped her. When I slipped my arm round her waist, she dared not cry out. The same when I clasped her hand. Things were coming my way at last, and if I put my lips close against her ear, I could whisper as low as she liked. I liked it, too, and I loved the ear. She was right. They were, indeed, talking just outside the window, Monty Gilder and Anthony Fenton. The prologue was evidently over, and the first act was on. It began well, with a touch of human interest certain to please an audience. But unfortunately for everyone concerned, this was a private rehearsal for actors only, not a public performance. Biddy and I had no business in the dark auditorium. We were deadheads. We had sneaked in without paying. The situation was one for a nightmare. For heaven's sake, let me cough or knock something over, I implored Biddy's ear, which, it struck me at the moment, was more like a flower than an unsympathetic shell, best similes to the contrary. Who could have imagined that it would be so heavenly a sensation to have your nose tickled by a woman's hair? There's nothing you can knock over but me, Biddy retorted, as fiercely as she could in a voice no louder than a mosquito's, and if you cough, I'll know you're a dog in the manger. Why? Curiosity forced me to pursue. Because, you donkey, you say you don't want her yourself, yet you won't give your best friend a chance. Can't be a dog and a donkey at the same time, I murmured. Choose which and stick to it if you want me to know what you mean. Why, you, you man, don't you see? If we interrupt at such a moment and such a conversation, they can never begin where they left off. If you'd wanted her, I'd have tried to save her for you at any cost. But as you don't, for goodness sakes, give the two their chance to come to an understanding. Now be still, I tell you, or they may hear us. We can't just sit and eavesdrop. Stop your ears, then. It'll take both hands. It would, which is the reason I didn't do it. That would have been asking too much of the most honorable men in the circumstances. Meanwhile, the two outside went on talking. Believing themselves to be alone with the sunset, there was no reason to lower their voices. They spoke in ordinary tones, though what they said was not ordinary, and we on the other side of the little unglazed window could not help hearing every word. I've been wanting to say it for a long time. In a voice like that of a penitent child, Monty was following up something we had fortunately lost. Only, how could I begin it? I don't see even how I did begin exactly. It's almost easy, though, since I have begun. I was horrid, horrid. I can't forgive myself. Yet I want you to forgive me for doing your whole race a shameful injustice, for not understanding it, or you, or anything. You've shown me what a modern Egyptian man can be, in spite of things I've read and heard, and been silly enough to believe. Oh, it isn't just that you come from some great family, and that you could call yourself a prince if you liked, as Lord Ernest says. He's told me how you could have had a fortune, and a great place in your country, if you'd reconcile yourself with your grandfather in Constantinople, but that you won't, because it would mean going against England. It isn't your position, but what you are, that has made me see how small and ridiculous I've been, Antun Effendi. Can you possibly forgive me for the way I treated you at first, now I've confessed and told you I'm very, very sorry and ashamed? I would forgive you if there were anything to forgive, Anthony answered, and it must have taken pretty well all his immense self-control to go on speaking to the girl in French, an alien language, just then. Perhaps there would be something to forgive if I weren't on my side a great deal more to blame than you. Will you let me confess? If you wish. Only you needn't, for I've deserved... I do wish. But first, will you answer me a question? I'm sure you wouldn't ask me a question I oughtn't to answer. It's only this. Did Ernest Burrow tell you anything else about me? Nothing, except his opinion of you, and you must know that by this time. I think I do, or Mrs. Jones, or Mrs. East. Neither have, for any reason, advised you to apologize to me for what you very nobly felt was wrong in your conduct? No, not a soul has advised me. If they had... She didn't finish, but Biddy and I both knew the Monty habit of conscientiously going against advice. Thank you. You've changed your opinion of me, then, without urging from outside. It has all come from inside, from recognition of, of what you are and what you've done for, for us all. 
You've been a hero, and you've been kind as well as brave. Antun Effendi, I think you are a very great gentleman, and I respect Egyptians for your sake. Wait, said Anthony. You haven't heard my confession. When I first saw you on the terrace at Shepherd's, I willed you to look at me, and you did look. How strange! Yes, I felt it. Something made me look. Why did you will me, Antun Effendi? Monny's voice was soft, but it was not like a child's now. It was a woman's voice. Listening with tingling ears, I knew what she wanted him to answer. Perhaps he also knew, but he boldly told the truth. It was a kind of wager I made with myself. There was some troublesome business I had to carry out in Cairo. A good deal hung upon it. I saw your profile. You didn't turn my way, and I said to myself, If by willing I can make that girl look at me, I'll take it for a sign that I should succeed in my work. Oh, it was nothing to do with me? Not then. Afterward I knew that, while I thought my own free will suggested my influencing you, it was destiny that influenced me. Kismet! It had to happen so. But you punished me for my presumption. You treated me as if I were a slave, a thing that hardly had a place in your world. I know. That's what I've asked you to forgive me for. And because you've asked me to forgive, I'm telling you this. I was furious, and I said, She shall be sorry. I will make her sorry. My whole wish was to humble you. I wanted to conquer, and though you classed me with servants, to be your master. I don't blame you, Antun Effendi, and you have conquered in a better way than you meant when you were angry and hating me. You've conquered by showing your true self. You are my friend. That's what you want, isn't it? Not to be my master when you don't hate me any longer? No, that is not what I want. I still want to be your master. Then you do hate me even now? No, I don't hate you, Mademoiselle Gilder, although you've punished me over and over again for being the brute I was at first. You have conquered me, not I you. But I don't want to be your friend. If you didn't look at me as being a man beyond the pale, you would understand very well what I want. Don't say that, cried Monny quickly. Don't say that you're a man beyond the pale. I can't stand it. Oh, I do know what you want. I do understand it. I think I should have died if you hadn't wanted it. And yet I could almost die because you do. You could die because I love you? Yes, of joy, and you care for me? Wait, I could die of joy and sorrow too. Joy because I do care, and my heart longs for you to care. Sorrow because, oh, it's the saddest thing in the world, but we can never be any more to each other than we are now. You say that so firmly because you think of me in your heart as a man of Egypt. Dearest and most beautiful, you are great enough if you choose to mount to your happiness over your prejudice. If you can love me in spite of what I am, I love you in spite of it and because of it too, and for every reason and for no reason. Thank God for that. You've said this to me against your convictions. I have won. No, for it's all I can ever say. There can be no more between us. You couldn't love me enough to be my wife, though I tell you now that you're the star of my soul? Never till I saw you have I loved a woman or spoken a word of love to one, except my beautiful mother. I've kept all for you, more than I dreamed I had to give, and it's yours forever and ever. But just because you've said to yourself that we're of stranger races, who mustn't meet in love, you raise a barrier between us. Are our souls of stranger races? No. Sometimes it almost seems as if our souls were one. You have waked mine with a spark from your own. I think I was fast asleep. I didn't know I had a soul, scarcely even a heart. But now I know. Learning to know you has taught me to know myself. And if I'm kinder to everybody all the rest of my life, even silly rich people I used to think didn't need kindness, it will be through loving you. I'm not afraid to tell you that. And though I used to be afraid I might love you, I'm glad I do now. Glad. I shall never regret anything, even when I suffer. And I shall suffer when we're parted. You're sure we must part? Sure, because there's no other way, being what we are, and life being what it is. Always, I thought, since my father died, that he was near me, watching to see what I did with my life. For he loved me dearly, and I loved him. We were everything to each other. Even if that were the only reason, I couldn't do a thing that would have broken his heart. It would be treacherous, now that he's helpless to forbid me. Don't you see? I see. And if it were not for that reason? 
If it were not for that, oh, I don't know, I don't know. But yes, I do know. The truth comes to me. It speaks out of my heart. If it were only for myself, if I felt free from a vow, nothing could make me say to you, go out of my life. That's what I wanted to be sure of. I could thank you on my knees for those words, for I too have made a vow which I won't break. And if I were free of it, I might tell you a thing now which would beat down the barrier. Well, we will keep our vows, both of us, my queen. Yes, we must keep them. But, oh, how are we to bear it? Fate has brought us together, and it's going to part us. We love each other, and we must go out of one another's lives. What shall we do when we can't see each other any more, ever any more? That time shall not come. But it must, soon. Will you trust me till Khartoum? I'll trust you always. I mean for a special thing, just till Khartoum. In the foolish days when I wished to conquer you and make you humble yourself to me, I vowed by my mother's love that I'd not tell you, or let Borrow tell, a fact about myself which might win your favor. It was a bad vow to make, a stupid vow, but a vow by my mother's love I could not break any more than you can break one to your father's memory. I'll abide by it, but trust me till Khartoum, and there you shall know what I can't tell you now. I always hoped you would find out there, if we went as far as Khartoum together. Then I hoped, because I was a conceited fool. Now I hope this thing, and all it means, because I am your lover. Ah, dear Antoon, don't hope, because it seems to me that nothing nearer than heaven can bring us the kind of happiness you want. If you hadn't told me you cared, nothing that may come at Khartoum could have brought us any happiness to me at all, for it would have been too late for that, for you to say you cared, and for the word to have the value it has now. You've said it in spite of yourself. Trust me for the rest, will you? If you ask me like that, yes, I trust you, though I don't understand. That's what I want. Say this. I believe that we shall be happy, and trust without understanding that it will be proved at Khartoum. Monty repeated the words after him. And although I was that vile worm, an eavesdropper, I was so happy that I could have picked Biddy up in my arms and waved her like a flag. Anthony was going to be happy, and that ought to be a good omen that I should be happy too. I am almost happy now, Monty went on, happier than I thought I could be with things as they are. I used to be miserable, partly about myself, partly because I thought you were in love with Biddy. You were so much nicer to her than me, and partly because I believed, till I knew you well, that you wanted to marry Aunt Clara for money, though you cared for someone else. I even told Lord Ernest that about you. I had to tell somebody. And besides, I felt it would be good for him to think you cared for Biddy. Being jealous might wake him up to see that he was in love with her himself. He really is rather a duffer at times. And, oh, talking of him and Biddy reminds me of them. Where can they be all this time? Heaven alone knows or cares, replied Anthony, and I realized the truth of the proverb about listeners, even where their best friends are concerned. I was obliged to kiss Biddy to keep from laughing out loud, and she couldn't scream or box my ears, or all our dreadful precautions would have been vain. We must find them, said Monty. Why? Oh, if we don't, they might find us. Anthony laughed, a giveaway, English-sounding laugh. But Monty did not recognize its birthplace. Her own laugh interrupted it too soon, ringing out so happily it probably surprised herself. If they find us here, quavered Biddy, clinging to me, they can't, if you'd only let me hold you tight enough, I whispered. If they look in, they'll just take us for a black spot in the dark. But they didn't look in. They went downstairs. And then there was the time to get in the rest of my deadly work with Biddy. We must wait a few minutes, or they couldn't help knowing we'd been near them, and I made the best use of those few minutes. Biddy wouldn't promise anything, but said she would think it over and let me know the result of her thinking in a day or two. To our great surprise, on arriving in open air at the level of the roof below, we saw that the sun was gone, and a slim young moon was sliding down the rose-red trail. It is indeed wonderful, say prophets of the obvious, how quickly time passes when your attention is engaged. And one comfort of being obvious is that you are generally right. We tried to flit forth from the dark recesses of the pile and stairway without being seen or heard, but as luck would have it, Monty and Fenton had had just time to discover that our boat was gone. The girl was hunting for us to see if we were anywhere, or if in some mad freak we could have gone off and left them to their fate. As we sneaked guiltily out, she caught us. 
Biddy, Lord Ernest, she exclaimed. Why, why, you've been upstairs. A good rule for diplomats, duffers, and others is never to tell a falsehood when there is no hope that anyone will believe it. We, uh, yes, we both mumbled. But there isn't any upstairs except where we were. Yes, there is, Biddy assured her hastily, too hastily. You were on the roof. We were in the little room of the guardian. He showed it to us. There's a window. Oh, we were under it. You must both have heard. Murder will out, I said, with the calmness of despair. But then it occurred to me that there was a way of using the weapon which threatened as a boomerang. Dearest, Biddy adjured her beloved, humbly, you wouldn't have had us spoil everything by moving, would you? I said to the duffer when he wanted to do something desperate, if we interrupt them, nothing will ever come right. Besides, we were too busy getting engaged ourselves, said I, to bother for long about what anybody else was saying or doing. You were? Oh, Biddy, that's what I've prayed for. Nothing of the sort, began Mrs. O'Brien, ferociously, but the boomerang had come to my hand, and I'd caught it on the fly. Before she could go on contradicting me, Anthony, followed by the guardian of the temple, had mounted the steps from the lower ledge of the roof, where we had landed in the afternoon. It wasn't you who took the boat, then, for a joke, said Fenton at sight of us, and the mystery of our Feluca's disappearance had to be discussed. Biddy saw to it that Monty couldn't edge a word in on the forbidden subject. How those two would talk later in Miss Gilder's stateroom. Nobody could explain what had happened, not even the guardian. He, it seemed, spent his night at the Siren Temple in the water, sleeping in the cell where I had blackmailed Biddy, and not even appearing to know that the custom scintillated with romance. By and by, his companion, who joined him for night work, would arrive in a small boat, bringing food, but this man rowed himself, and neither could leave the temple again that night. "'You will lend the boat to us,' said Anthony. "'We'll row and send it back to you by someone who is trustworthy.' "'We have no right to lend the boat,' returned the Nubian. "'Then I will steal it,' replied the Haji. "'But none of us cared how long a time might pass before deliverance came. "'The enchantress Isis couldn't steam away and leave her conductor behind. "'As Mrs. East had disappeared, "'I vaguely associated the puzzle of our missing craft with Sir Marcus.' And anyhow, curiosity wasn't the strongest emotion in my being just then. I thought that perhaps never in my life again would love and romance and beauty all blend together into one, as here at Philae in the moonlight. The sharp sickle of the young moon cut a silver edge on each tiny wave that murmured against the submerged pillars like a chanting of priests under the sea. The temple commemorating love triumphant was carved in silver and drowned in a silver flood. The flowering capitals of the columns, as they showed above the water, blossomed white as lilies bound together in sheaves with silver cords and placed before an altar. Yes, Egypt was giving us what we asked, but would she give us all we asked? Just as there might have been a renewed chance of getting an answer to this question, black men in a black boat hailed us. Sir Marcus had deigned at last to remember our plight. End of chapter 26《Chapter 27 of It Happened in Egypt》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson — Chapter 27 — The Inner Sanctuary — We made a sensation when we returned to the fold. Everybody wondered so much that they gave us no time to answer their questions, even if we would. But somehow it seemed to be taken for granted that the whole thing was my fault. Perhaps Mrs. East or Sir Marcus had spread the report. I let it pass. As for Sir Marcus, he stayed only long enough for a talk with me. It began with a trumped-up business and ended in a confession. She had snubbed him, it seemed. Snubs being new to Sir Marcus, he had been dazed and had forgotten for a while to send us a boat. I assured him that we bore no grudge, really none whatever. It had been an adventure. "'but I tried to cheer him up. "'Better luck next time. "'Why wouldn't he go on with us? "'Fenton and I could chum together to give him cabin room, "'and Neil Sheridan, the American Egyptologist, "'had let me know that he was obliged to leave us at Wadi Halfa. "'There would be an empty cabin going down again. "'But no, the boss refused his conductor's hospitality. 
I think the less she sees of me, the better she likes me, he said dismally. She was civil enough until I... But no matter. I suppose a man can't expect his luck to always hold. Don't split your infinitives till things get desperate, I begged. It hasn't come to that yet. If you must go back, I'll take it on my shoulders to watch your private interests a bit, as well as the rest. Look out for a telegram one of these fine days, saying, Come at once. You'll know what it means. I will, bless you, my boy, he said heartily, though I am hanged if I know what you mean by a split infinitive. I hope, if it's improper, I've never inadvertently done it before a lady. There seemed to be an atmosphere of suspense for everybody who mattered, as we steamed on between strange black mountainettes and tiger golden sands toward Wadi Halfa. Anthony was in suspense about the way his fate might arrange itself at Khartoum. I was in suspense as to Biddy's decision, which nothing I was able to say could wheedle or browbeat out of her. He and I were both in suspense together about the mountain of the Golden Pyramid. It would be ours now, we knew that. But what would be in it? Would it be full of treasure, or full of nothing but mountain, just as a crusty baked pudding is full of pudding? The doubt was harder to bear, now that Anthony was in love with a very rich girl, and desired something from the mountain more substantial than the adventure, which would have once have contented him. Harder to bear for me, too, wanting Biddy, and wanting to give her luxury as well as peace, such as she had never known in her life of tragedy and brave laughter. Monty was in suspense quite equal to Anthony's about Khartoum, and what could possibly happen there to give her happiness. Bridget was in suspense about the two men who had so strangely and secretly worked together with their spy, better, and whom she expected to meet again later. Rachel was in suspense about Bailey, although I had told her it was going to be all right, and he had said not a word of the business to her. What she wanted was to make sure of him, and there was the difficulty at present, since we had failed to arrange for a registry office or a clergyman on board. Other hearts were no doubt throbbing with the same emotions, but they were of comparatively small importance to me. Our feelings were all so different, and so much more intense than they had been, that the extraordinary difference in the scenery gave us a vague sense of satisfaction. We were in another world, now that we had heard the first cataract's roar and left it behind, a world utterly unlike any conceptions we had formed of Egypt. But we did not, for a long time, leave the influence of the barrage. Black rocks ringed in a blue basin so lake-like that it was hard to realize it as the Nile. Now and then a yellow river of sand poured down to the sapphire sea, and where its bright waves were reflected, the water became liquid gold under a surface of blue glass. The sky was overcast, and, through a thick silver veil, the sun shone with a mystic light, as of a lamp burning in an alabaster globe. Yet the flaming gold of the sand created an illusion of sunshine. It was as if the treasure of all lost mines of Nub had been flung out on the black rocks, and lay in a glittering carpet there. We passed small, submerged temples, with their foreheads just above water, drowning palm groves whose plumes trailed sadly on the blue expanse, and deserted mud villages where the high Nile looked in at open doors to say, This is for Egypt's good. Then there was a the little temple of Dendur, whose patron goddess was prayed to spit if rain were needed, and so many other ruined temples that we lost count, though one was the largest in Nubia, until we came to Wadi Asabua, the Valley of the Lions. This we remembered, not because it was imposing, or because it had a dromos of noble-faced sphinxes, the only hawk-faced ones in Egypt, or because of its prehistoric writings on dark boulders, or because it had been used as a Christian church, but owing to the fact that the ladies bought rag dolls from little Nubian girls, who wore their hair in a million greased braids. Here the influence of the dam faded out of sight. Forlorn trees and houses no longer crawled half out of water. Mountains crowded down to the shore, wild and dark and stately as Nubian warriors of ancient days. Then came Carrasco, point of departure for the old caravan route, where kings of forgotten Egyptian dynasties send for acacia wood, and Englishmen in the campaign of the cataracts fought and died, deserted now with houses dead and decayed, their windows staring like the eye sockets of skulls, and the black tortured mountain shapes behind, lurking in the background as hyenas lurk to prey. More temples and many sakias, no shadoofs here on the upper Nile, but few boats.
The spacious times were past when loads of pink granite, honey-colored sandstone, fragrant woods, and spices from the land of Punt went floating down the stream. There were tombs as well as temples which we might have seen, savage gorges and mild green hills. There was the great grim fort of Kasser Ibrim, and at last there was Abu Simbel. Somehow I knew that things were bound to happen at Abu Simbel. I didn't know what they would be, but they hovered invisible at my berth side in the night, and whispered to warn me that I might expect them. A few people rose stealthily before dawn to prepare for Abu Simbel, because it had been hammered into their intellects by me that this rock temple was the great thing of the Upper Nile. Also, that every he, she, or it, who did not behold the place at sunrise, would be as mean a worm as one who had not read the Arabian Nights. Not everybody heeded the advice, though at bedtime most had resolved to do so. We had anchored for the night not far off, in order to have the mysterious light before sun-up, to go on again, and see the grand approach to the grandest temple of the old world. But after all, most of the cabin eyelids were still down when we arrived before dawn at our journey's end, and only a few intrepid ghosts flitted out on deck, elderly male ghosts in thick dressing gowns, youthful ghosts of the same sex, fully clothed and decently groomed because cloaked girl ghosts with floating hair, if there were enough to float effectively, others made a virtue of having it put up, and middle-aged female ghosts with transformations apparently hindside in front. No ghost's looks matter much, however, for good or ill, since the slowly moving enchantress had swept aside a purple curtain of distance and shown us such a stage setting as only nature's stupendous theater can give. It was a stage still dimly, but most effectively revealed. Lights down, pale blue, lilac and cold green, a thrilling, almost sinister combination, no gold or rose switched on yet. Turned obliquely toward the river, facing slightly northward, four figures sat on thrones, super-giants, immobile, incredible against a background of rock, whence they had been released by forgotten sculptors, released to live while the world lasted. These seated kings gave the first shock of awed admiration, then lesser marvels detached themselves in detail from the shadows of the vast façade, the frieze, the cornice, the sun-god in his niche over the door of the great temple, the smaller temple of Hathor, divided from her huge brother by a cataract of sand, whose piled gold dust already called the sun as a magnet calls iron. The stage lights were still down when the enchantress moored by the river bank, within a comparatively short walk of the mountain which Ramesses II had turned into a temple, as usual glorifying himself. But though the walk was comparatively short, on second thoughts elderly ghosts, chilled to the bone, funked it on empty stomachs. They made various excuses for putting off the excursion. The boat was to remain till late afternoon, until finally the sun worshippers were reduced to a party of ten. Since Philae, Biddy had kept out of my way when she could do so without being actually rude, but as our small, shivering procession formed, she suddenly appeared at my side. Thus we two headed the band, save for a sleepy dragoman who knew the rather intricate paths through scaly, dried mud, sand, and vegetation. "'I want to say something to you, Duffer,' she murmured, and the roughness of the way excused me for slipping her arm through mine. "'Not as much as I want to say something to you,' I retorted fervently. "'But this is serious,' she reproached me. "'So is, please listen, there isn't much time. I heard this only last night, or I'd have spoken before, and asked you what you thought. "'Do you happen to know whether Captain Fenton wrote a note to Monty, "'asking her to wait for him in the inner sanctuary of the temple "'till after the people had gone, "'as he wanted to see her alone about something of great importance?' "'I don't know,' I said. "'Anthony hasn't mentioned Miss Gilder's name to me since Philae. "'As a matter of fact, he's been particularly taciturn. "'You haven't quarreled, surely. "'Anthony and I, thank goodness, no, "'but I'm afraid he misunderstands and is a bit annoyed. "'Miss Gilder, of course, told him we'd overheard a certain conversation, "'and he's never given me a chance to explain. "'After Khartoum it will be all right, if not before, "'but meanwhile, I see.' Then let me tell you quickly what's happened. When we came back on board the boat, after climbing about the fort of Kasser Ibram, Monty found on the table in her cabin a note in French, typewritten on Enchantress Isis's paper. It had no beginning or signature, only an urgent request to grant the writer five minutes just after sunrise, 
in the sanctuary at Abu Simbel as soon as everyone was out of the way. There's only one typewriter on board, isn't there? Yes, Kruger's. And nobody but you and he and Captain Fenton ever use it, I suppose. Nobody else, so far as I know. Captain Fenton didn't land with us to see the fort, but came up later, just as we were ready to go down. Well, for all these reasons and the note being in French, Monty thinks it was written by Antoine Effendi. It was only in chatting last night about the Sunrise Expedition that she mentioned finding the letter. I begged her to make certain it was from him before doing what it asked, because, you see, I'm still afraid of anything that seems queer or mysterious. But she laughed and said, What nonsense! Who else could have written it except Lord Ernest, unless you think Mr. Kruger's in a plot? And she refused to question Antoon, because if he'd wanted the thing to be talked over, he'd have spoken instead of writing. As for doing what he asked, she pretended not to have made up her mind. She said she'd see what mood she was in after the others had finished with the sanctuary. Well, what I want is for you and me to stay in the place ourselves when the others have gone. With the greatest of pleasure on earth, said I. Don't be foolish. You aren't to torment me there. That depends on what you call tormenting. If I'm to be made a spoil sport for Fenton and Miss Gilder, a kind of live scarecrow, I mean to get something out of it for myself. There was no time for more. We had arrived at the foot of the long flight of stone steps which lead up to the rocky plateau of the great temple. In the east, a golden fire below the horizon was sending up premonitory flames, and the procession must bestir itself or be too late. The whole object of arriving at this unearthly hour would be defeated if, before the sun's forefinger touched the faces of the altar statues, we were not in the sanctuary. No time to study the features of the Colossi or to search for the grave of Major Tidwell. These things must wait. The dark-faced guardian examined our tickets and let us file through the rock-hewn doorway whose iron grill he had just opened. As we passed into the cavernous hall of roughly carved osiride columns, the huge figures attached to them loomed vaguely out of purple gloom. There was an impression of sculptured rock walls, with splashes of color here and there, of columns in a chamber beyond, and still a third chamber, whence three rooms opened off, the side doorways mere blocks of ebony in the distance. But already the sun's first ray groped for its goal, like the wandering finger of a blind man. We had only time to hurry through the faintly lit middle doorway and plaster ourselves round the rock walls of the sanctuary when the golden digit touched the altar and found the four sculptured forms above, Harmarchus, Ramesses, Amun, and Ptah. Night lingered in the temple, a black brooding vulture, but suddenly the bird's dark breast was struck by a golden bullet, and from the wound a magic radiance grew. The effect, carefully calculated by priests and builders thousands of years ago, was as thrilling today as on the morning when the sun first poured gold upon the altar. The sightless faces of the statues were given eyes of an unearthly brilliance to stare into ours and search our souls. But with most of the party, to be thrilled for a minute was enough. As the sun's finger began to move, they found it time to move also. There was the whole temple to be seen, and then the walk back to the boat before dressing for breakfast. Soon Biddy and I had, or seemed to have, the sanctuary to ourselves. Even the sun's rays had left us, mounting higher and passing above the doorway of the inner shrine. The momentarily disturbed shadows folded round us again, with only a faint glimmer on the wall over the altar to show that day was born. "'Did you notice that Monty wasn't with the others?' asked Bridget in a low voice. She lingered behind, I think, and never came near us. I wasn't sure till I watched the rest filing out of this room. Then I saw she wasn't among them. Neither was Captain Fenton. If they're together, it's all right, I assured her. Yes, but are they? That affair of the typewritten note has worried me. You're very nervous, darling, but no wonder. You mustn't call me darling. Why not? It's no worse than Duffer. I like your calling me that. I wonder if we ought to go, as she never came or to stay and wait. If we go, we shall be playing into Miss Gilder's hands. If we stay, we shall be playing into mine. Which do you prefer? Oh, I suppose we'd better stay, for fear of something. But you must be good. Then abruptly I attacked her with a change of weapons. I had fenced lightly, knowing that Biddy liked a man who could laugh. But now I threw away my rapier and snatched a club. I told her I would stand no more of this. 
Did she want to spoil my life and break my heart? She was the one thing I needed. Now she would have to say whether she'd put me off because she didn't love me and never could, or because of that trash about not wanting to involve me in her troubles. No use prevaricating. I should know whether she lied or told the truth by the sound of her voice. But I might as well confess, before she began, that I'd rather be loved by her and refused than not loved and refused. Women seemed to think the unselfish thing was to pretend not to care if a man had to be sent away, because in the end that made it easier for him. But in real life, with a real man, it was the other way around. I think you're right, Duffer, Biddy said softly. That's why I wouldn't answer you for good and all that night at Philae. I felt then it might be kinder to tell you I could never care. But I've thought of nothing else since, except a little about Monty, and I decided that if it were me, I'd rather be loved, whatever happened. Men can't be so very different where their hearts are concerned, so I'm going to tell you I do love you. It was hard to give you to Monty, but I thought it would be for your happiness. I nearly died of love for you when I was a little girl. I kept every tiniest thing you ever gave me. I was in love with your memory when you went up to Oxford, and it was then that Richard O'Brien came. He swept me off my feet and made me think that my heart was caught in the rebound. When it was too late, I realized that it hadn't been caught at all, only hypnotized for a while. I've loved you always, Duffer dear. The thought of you is my one comfort, often, although I hardly expected to see you again, or maybe for that very reason. No, don't touch me. Please let me go on now, or I'll not tell you any more. I wonder if you never guessed what I had in that chamois skin bag you're so worried about. Why, I did guess, Biddy, right or wrong. And I bet you it was wrong. What did you think, when I wouldn't understand any of your hints to tell what I wore over my heart? I thought then, I answered after a moment's deliberation, that you kept compromising documents which might be of interest to the organization you and I have talked about. Now I think differently. I think you kept a lock of my childish hair, or my first tooth. You conceded, Duffer. Not so bad as that, because I never had a chance of getting either. Once I did keep in that bag just what you said, compromising documents that the organization would have given thousands of dollars to get. And my life wouldn't have stood in their way for a minute, I'm sure. But that was before Richard died. He was afraid. I mean, I thought it would be better and less suspicious if I had charge of the papers. And if the society had ever got hold of him, he believed the letters and list of names I had might have bought back his safety if I played my hand well. He told me just what to do. But when he was ill, he had a nurse whom I began to suspect as a spy. Once, when I was called into Richard's room suddenly, half-dressed, the chamois skin bag showed as my wrapper fell open at the breast. I caught her looking at it with an eager look, and that very night I had it locked up in a bank. It was only a few days later that Richard died, and with him gone, I felt that there was no more need to keep papers which might cost the lives or liberty of men. Richard had wronged his friends, and I wanted none of them to come to harm through me, though they'd made me suffer with him. I burned every scrap of paper I had, every single one, and it wasn't till there was an attempt to kidnap Esme that I asked myself if I'd been right. Still, even now, I am not sorry. I wouldn't hurt a hair of their heads. For a while the bag was empty, but coming away from America and feeling a bit lonesome, I thought it would do me good to look now and then at the only love letter you ever wrote me. It was on my ninth birthday, but I don't believe you could write a better one now. There was a photograph, too, of my lord when he was seventeen. I stole that, but it was all the dearer. At this very minute the letter and the picture are lying on my heart. So now you know whether I care for you or not, and you can understand why I wouldn't put the bag into a bank. Oh, Biddy, darling, I said, you've made me the happiest man in the world. Well, I'm glad, she snapped, twisting away from me, that it takes so little to make you happy. So little when I'm going to have you for my wife? But you're not. You said you'd rather be loved and refused. I would if I had to choose between the two. That's not the case with me, for I shall marry you now I know the truth, in spite of fifty or fifty thousand refusals, or any other little obstacles like that. Never, Duffer, not for all the world would I be your wife, loving you as I do, unless the organization would forget or forgive Esme and me, and that I can't fancy they'll ever do till the millennium. I shall be past the marrying age then. Oh, Duffer, I almost wish you had fallen in love with Monty as I wanted you to do. Honest Injun, you really wanted that to happen? 
Well, I tried to want it for your sake, and in a way for my own, too. If I'd seen you caring for Monty, I should have found some medicine to cure my heartache. Oh, it would have been a very good thing all around, except for your friend, Anthony Fenton. And I was a half afraid he was in love with you. I can tell you I've had my trials, Biddy. It's my turn to be happy now, and yours, too. Just think, nearly everybody in the world is engaged, but us, or next door to being engaged. Miss Gilder and Anthony, who's the only man on earth to keep her in order, and Rachel Guest and Bailey, and Enid Biddle and Harry Snell, and even your stepdaughter, Esme O'Brien. Duffer, she's married. What, to young Halloran? How did they manage it? I don't know yet. I've had only a telegram. It came to Aswan too late, and Sir Marcus Lark brought it to the boat. I found it that night when we got back from Philae. But I haven't told, because I dared not be with you alone long enough to speak of private affairs, till I could decide whether to let you know I loved you, or make believe I didn't care a scrap. As if I could have believed your tongue, unless you had shut your eyes. So Esme is married, and off your hands? Not off my hands, I'm afraid. This may be visited on me. They must have known of her meeting Tom Halloran at St. Martin Vestibule last summer. They find out everything, sooner or later. Probably they thought I'd whisked her off to Egypt with me, helped by my young friend Miss Gilder, for whom they took Rachel Guest, in order to let her meet Tom Halloran again and marry him secretly. Well, she has married him secretly. When they discover what's happened, they are sure to put the blame on poor me. And indeed, it is a shocking thing for the son of that man in prison, and the daughter of the man who sent him there, to be husband and wife. I don't see that at all, I argued. Why shouldn't their love end the feud? It can't, for strong as it may be, it won't release prisoners, or bring back to life those who are dead. Anyhow, don't borrow trouble, said I. If Esme's married, the more reason for us to follow her example. After Khartoum, when Miss Gilder... "'Who's taking my name in vain?' inquired the owner of it at the sanctuary door. "'Oh, then you have come, Monty,' Bridget exclaimed. "'I... I'd given you up.' "'I haven't come for the reason you thought,' returned the girl promptly. "'I was sure you meant to head me off, and I've learned without asking that Antun Effendi didn't write that note.' "'Who told you so? Who did?' "'He's trying to find out. Probably it was a silly practical joke someone wanted to play on me. "'There are lots quite capable of it on board.' Antun Effendi said the sunrise was much finer, really, from on top of the great sand hill, so we climbed up. And it came out that he hadn't asked me to meet him here. If anyone not on the boat wrote the letter, some steward must have been bribed to sell a bit of writing paper and allow a stranger to come on board while we were away at Kasser Ibram. There was a steam to Habia moored not far off, if you remember, with oriental decorations, so we fancied it must belong to an Egyptian or a Turk. It could easily have been hired at Aswan, Biddy exclaimed, and it could have beaten us. We've stopped at such heaps of temples where other boats only touch coming back. If there were a plot, as you were always imagining, the Dahabia would have to be near here too, Monty laughed incredulously. And so it may be. We haven't seen round the corner of the great temple yet. One would think, to hear you talk, that you'd expected this poor little sanctuary to be stuffed with murderers, or, at the least, kidnappers. Ugh, don't speak of it, Biddy shuddered. Let's go out into the sunlight again, as quick as ever we can. End of chapter 27、Chapter、28 of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 28. Worth Paying For. When Anthony says that he will find things out, he seldom fails. Perhaps nobody but a green turbaned Haji could so speedily have screwed information out of secretive Arabs, paid to be silent. And he had to fit deductions into spaces of the puzzle left empty by fibs and glib self excusings. What he did learn was this. A dragoman had come, in a small boat, from a steam dahabia to the enchantress Isis while we were away at Kasser Ibram. He presented credentials written out for him in Cairo by Miss Rachel Guest, and dated a few weeks ago. Inquiring for her, he seemed sorry to hear that she had gone on the excursion. The dragoman refused to disturb Antun Effendi on hearing that the haji was riding in his cabin. His errand was not of enough importance to trouble so illustrious a man. 
All he wanted was permission to type one or two letters for his employers on the neighboring Dahabia, which possessed no machine. In the absence of Mr. Kruger, who had gone on shore for exercise, the dragoman was given this privilege. Possibly he had taken some of the boat's letter paper. Who could be certain of these trifles? Possibly, also, he had walked about with one of the cabin stewards to see the luxury appointments of the enchantress Isis. As for paying money for these small favors, who could tell? And nobody knew if the steam dahabiyah had hurried on before us to anchor out of sight round the oblique façade of Abu Simbel. In any case, when we went to look for the suspicious craft seen near Kasser Ibram, she was not among the two or three small private dahabiyahs of artists and others moored within a mile of the great temple. Notwithstanding her absence, however, Anthony and I, suddenly confidential friends again, thought it likely that the shadows in the sanctuary had not been its only tenants when we entered there. The invaluable better knew enough of the Nile temples to know that the sun's first light strikes only the altar and the statues over it, in Abu Simbel's inner shrine, that the four corners of the small cavern room remain pitch black unless the place is artificially illuminated, and that this is never done at sunrise. The dragoman and one or both of his employers would have had no difficulty in getting into the temple before the first streak of dawn, if they had warned its guardian the night before. So far, our deductions were simple, after learning how the trick of the typewritten note had been managed, but it was not so easy to guess the object of the plot. Was Monty Gilder to have been murdered in the dark sanctuary, or was she to have been kidnapped? Either seemed an impossible undertaking unless the plotters were willing to face certain detection and arrest. As it was, we had no more tangible proof against the man than we had before at the house of the crocodile, in the desert near Medinet, at Asuit, and at Luxor. With a sly cleverness which did better, or those employing him, much credit, they had screened themselves behind others. Even if we had the names of the tourists, better had served as dragomen, and if we could lay our hands on their shoulders, we had not enough evidence of what they had done to obtain a warrant of arrest, and this, of course, they knew. Our best chance, Anthony thought, lay in springing a surprise on them, as they had vainly, so far, tried to do with us, and when we got them somehow at our mercy, force out the truth. It was almost certain that a steam dahabiyah could not unseen have passed the enchantress Isis at Abu Simbel in broad daylight, going back toward Aswan. Therefore, since it was not moored near the temple, if it had been in the neighborhood at all, it must have dashed on ahead of us in the direction of Wadi Halfa. With pleasure would we have given immediate chase, had not the enchantress been pledged to remain at Abu Simbel till afternoon. Even as it was, I expected to catch up with a boat so much smaller than our own, but Anthony damped my hopes, explaining the difficulties of navigation between Abu Simbel and Wadi Halfa. There were, he said, great shifting sand makes in the water, which looked so transparently green, so treacherously clear. Without the most prudent piloting, the river was actually dangerous, as new sand banks had a habit of forming the minute you shut your eyes or turned your back. The enchantress would have to pick her way slowly through the silver sands of the Nile, which mingled with the spilt gold dust of the desert shore. All the same, these impudent rascals would find it hard to hide from us at Wadi Halfa, especially if we stopped the boat and wired from the next telegraph station to have them watched on the arrival of their dahabiyah. Perhaps, as they're so clever, they'll be clever enough not to arrive at all, was my suggestion, and Anthony could only shrug his shoulders. Wait and see had to be our policy. Happily, the set wandered in and out of the two temples, big and little, all the morning, ignorant of our worries, which even to us seemed small under the benign gaze of the great Colossi. The three stone Ramesses who had faces wore expressions no one could ever forget, and there was a sense of loss in turning away from them. A crocodile swam past the enchantress as she steamed up river, a long, dark, prehistoric shape. He seemed an anachronism, but so did better, with his plottings, yet both were real, real as this Nile dream of dark rocks, of conical black mountains shaped like ruined pyramids, and yellow sand hills whose dazzling reflections turned the blue-green river to gold. The next day at noon we came to Wadi Halfa, and the enchantress Isis, who had brought us eight hundred miles from Cairo, was now to be deserted by those with Khartoum in view. 
All save three of the party were going on through this gate of the Sudan, where the river way ended and the desert way began. Neil Sheridan was turning back immediately in a government steamer, and a bride and a groom who cared not where they were, if with each other, would wait on board the Enchantress until the band of passengers should return from Khartoum. These things had to be thought of, but I meant to let Kruger do most of the thinking when we landed at the neat, colorful town of Halfa, which lies, as Aswan lies, all pink and blue and green along the river bank, sentineled with trees. From a distance, Anthony and I caught sight of the steam dahabiyah seen near Kasser Ibram, and we could hardly wait to get on shore. The camp was but a mile and a half away, and I had wired in Lark's name to an officer whom he was sure to know, asking as great a favor to have the passengers on board a boat of that description watched, and requesting him, if possible, to meet the Enchantress on her arrival. "'There he is,' said Fenton, standing at the rail. "'I mustn't seem to recognize him, of course. Can't give myself away. But you—good Lord, there's better,' I broke in, hardly believing my eyes. And there better was, looking as if butter would by no means melt in his mouth. Better, smiling from the pier, evidently there for the special purpose of meeting us. His ugly, squat figure and the tall, khaki-clad form of the officer were conspicuous among squatting blacks, male and female in gay turbans, veils and mantles, muffled babies in arms, and children dressed in exceedingly brief fringes. "'I'll attend to him while you powwow with Ereton, said Anthony, ready for the unexpected situation. And while the indispensable, if humble, Kruger showed the passengers how to get to the desert train, superintending the landing of the luggage, and made himself perspiringly useful, I thanked Major Arrington in Sir Marcus Lark's and my own name. His news was astonishing. There were no passengers on board the steam dahabia Mahmoudier. She had arrived with none save her crew, and the dragoman now talking with that good-looking Haji there. As I murmured, yes, and no, and indeed, really, to the officer, who had kindly worked on our behalf, I was saying to myself, my dear Duffer, what an ass you were not to think of that. For of course the men had remained at Abu Simbel, hiding till we should be out of the way, and sending their boat on to put us off the track. A cook steamer and a Hamburg American boat were due to stop at the temple. We had passed both on the river. By this time the two men were doubtless on their way north, making for Cairo and safety. Still, here was Better, looking like a fat fly who had deliberately come to pay a call on the lean and hungry spider. I was impatient from the moment when the need for genuine gratitude and faked explanation was over, and Major Ayrton had gone about other business. Then I could follow the Haji and the Armenian, who had mounted the steps leading up from the river level to the town. Not far off I could see the blue-windowed, white-painted desert train, round which, on the station platform, buzzed and scolded the set, demanding their hand luggage and their compartments. But Anthony and his victim, or was it by chance vice versa, were keeping out of eyeshot and earshot of the late passengers of the Enchantress. Bridget and Monty, who must have seen better, were too tactful to hover near. Also, they knew Antun Effendi too well to think it necessary. Better gave me no time to speak. He rushed forward to greet me with effusion, as if I were a long-lost and well-loved patron. "'I've been so glad to see you after these days, my lord. Sure,' he began. "'Antun Effendi, he tell you I come here on purpose to do you good. I find out those gentlemen's very wicked men, so I leave them quick. They want to pay me for go back with them, but no money big enough now I know they try to do harm to my nice young lady. She wasn't so good to me as the other nice young lady, but that makes no matter.' I not stand for any hurt to her, sure I will not, my lord. The meaning of this rigmarole, Anthony cut him short, speaking in German, which he knew I understood, and trusted better didn't, is that the fellow wants us to buy information from him. He pretends to have broken with his employers on our account, though his explanation of getting here to Halfa on their dahabia is ridiculous, and that, having come for our benefit against their wishes, he is without pay, penniless, and stranded. A lie, of course, I took for granted, also in German. The part about being broke, certainly, but it's certain, too, that he must know some things we'd like to know. Could we trust a word, he says? No, as far as his moral sense is concerned, but my idea is to bargain with him. We to pay according to value received. 
That might be bait for a fish worth hooking. Yes, that's our line. We haven't much time to hear and digest his story, though. The train will start in less than an hour. We shan't waste a minute. Without waiting for you, I began to bargain on the line I've just suggested. How far did you get? A good way, for I was able to scare him a bit. You see, he earns his living in Cairo, and I've persuaded him that I have some influence there in quarters that can make or break him. He hasn't much more time to spare than we have if it's true he wants to start back on the government boat. You know they take natives third class. My suggestion, subject to your approval, is this. In any case, we give a thousand piastres, ten pounds. But if what he can tell us is of real use or even interest, we rise to the extent of ten times that sum. It's a good deal for a beastly baboon like him. Remember, he has been doing services lately for which he probably got high pay. All right, whatever you say goes, I agreed. I trust to your honors, my gentlemen, remarked the beastly baboon in question, in a manner so apropos that I guessed him not entirely ignorant of German, after all. Thanks for the compliment, I responded gratefully. We shall have to talk here. There is no time to find a more convenient place, said Fenton, returning to Arabic as a medium of communication. Fire away better, but don't start your story in the middle. Begin where you took service with those Irish-American gentlemen. Was the gentleman's Irish? I never know that, purred the guileless better, but Fenton brought him to his bearings. All questions were to be from us to him. So better fired away, and there, within a stone's throw of the train getting up steam for Khartoum, we listened to a strange tale, as strange and as great an anachronism as that dark crocodile shape we had seen, except in the Nile country, where live crocodiles and many other dark things can easily happen any day. Blount's name, according to Better, was not Blount, but something else well known in America. It was a name already associated with that of O'Brien, which inclined us to hope for some grains of truth in the chaff of lies we expected. Better said that in New York, years ago, he had known the man Blount. He was related to the American family who took Better from Cairo. Later, when the Armenians had returned to Egypt, Blount had come with them for a rest cure. He had engaged Better as a dragoman, and, on leaving, had asked for Better's card. That was years ago, and nothing had been heard from him since. But before the Laconia was due to arrive, Better had received a telegram from Blount instructing him to meet the ship, and wire to Paris whether Miss Gilder of New York and a Mrs. Jones were on board with a party. Blount knew that Better had seen Miss Gilder as a child, and might now be able to recognize her. On the day in New York when a block in traffic had given a glimpse of the little girl in a motor car with her father, Better and Blount had been together. As soon as possible after Better's reply, Blount and another man, who called himself Hannah, had arrived in Cairo. Better knew that they had a fixed theory in regard to the young lady who passed as Miss Gilder. Who they supposed her to be he could not tell, but once he had happened to be near, when they were not aware of his presence, and had heard one of them mention a woman's name, which sounded like Esne. They accepted his word that he had been able to identify the so-called Miss Guest as Rosamond Gilder, and in her they appeared to take no further interest. Their attention was concentrated on Mrs. Jones and the lady who, according to their belief, was but posing as Miss Gilder. Apparently they imagined her to be quite another person, one whom they had taken a great deal of trouble to reach. Also, they had an idea that Mrs. Jones possessed something of which they were anxious to get hold. It was a something which ought to be theirs, and they had been after it for years, but she had contrived to hide herself in it until lately. Why he had been told to guide the two younger ladies to the House of Crocodiles, Better pretended not to know. Perhaps, only perhaps, Blount and his companion, Hannah, wished to kidnap the one we call Miss Gilder, and they called Esne. But good, kind Better had never dreamed that they meant any real harm. There had been a plan of some sort for that night. Blount and Hannah were to arrive at the house of the crocodile for a close look at the young ladies, when the latter had gone to sleep under the influence of the hashish they intended to smoke. But the two gentlemen had not kept the appointment. At first, Better had not understood why, and had not known what to do. And afterward, of course, when he had heard of the row in the street, which had caused the closing of the house for many tedious hours, he had guessed. And later, when he learned that poor Mr. Blount lay wounded in a hospital, it had all become clear. 
Mr. Hanna, who seemed to work under Mr. Blount's orders, had not been able to act alone. Then, as to all the traveling up the Nile, Better had never been told why his gentlemen made the journey. Every one who came to Egypt went up the Nile, only he had been instructed to find out always where we were, and to arrange their arrival at about the same time. At Medinet they had not camped or gone to a hotel, but had stayed in the house of a friend of Better's. It was convenient, though not as comfortable as he could wish for his clients. The advantage was that from the roof it was possible to see into our camp. Better had made friends with one of the camel boys who went to the market to buy the black lamb, and while we were away had found out which was the tent where Mrs. Jones and Miss Gilder, or Esney, slept. What happened in the night he could not say. He had stayed at his friend's house while the two gentlemen went out. He had done nothing at all for them in Medinet except to discover the lady's tent and also to buy a bottle of olive oil. When the gentlemen came home in the middle of the night, they were angry with him because they said he had shown them the wrong tent. But that was unjust. It was the only time they had been unkind. Except for that, they had been good and had given him plenty of money for a while. At Asuet and Luxor, they had been pleased with him. All they wanted at Rashid Bey's house was to get the thing Mrs. Jones had, which ought to be theirs. They had not told him this, but he heard them talk sometimes. He knew more languages than they thought. If they wanted to steal the young lady, they had never said so. When the plan failed, they did not blame better. It was not his fault. They saw that. The Mahmoudier had been engaged as long ago as just after Medinet, when the thing the gentleman wanted to do there could not be done. But Better thought that, if the Luxor plan had been a success, the steam dahabia would have gone north from there instead of south. It was because of that failure the boat had followed us up the Nile. At Abu Simbel, Better had quarreled with the gentleman, because he had began to suspect that they meant to harm the ladies, or to one of them. He had been clever and got on board the Enchantress, as they told him to do. He had obtained writing paper and typed a copy of a letter. In America, he had learned to do typing. Often he could make better money in an engagement now, because he knew how to use a machine. And when the steward showed him over the boat, he left the letter in the stateroom, which the Arab boy said was Miss Gilder's. In spite of all these good services, which no other dragoman in Egypt could have given, those gentlemen would not listen to a word of advice. Better heard them speak with the guardian of the temple about going in before anyone else came to see the sunrise. And afterward they talked of hiding in the sanctuary. First they had asked him if it were always dark there, as the guidebook said. After hearing this he had put two and two together, and when he remembered what was in the note he typed for Miss Gilder, Better feared for her and Mrs. Jones. He begged the gentlemen not to do anything rash, and they were so angry at his interference that they sent him off with no more pay, nothing at all since Luxor. Oh no, they were not afraid of him and what he could tell, because they said nobody would believe a dragoman's word against rich white gentlemen. People would say he lied for spite, but Better thought maybe we should believe, because we knew already that something strange had been going on. The gentleman paid off the men on the Mahmudia and ordered her to go on to Wadi Halfa. They did not know that Better had slipped on board and hidden there on purpose to find us and tell his story. A part of this tale carried truth on its face. But Anthony and I agreed that there was a queer discrepancy at the end. If Better spoke the truth, Blount and his comrade must have had a reason for wishing to get rid of the fellow, or for not caring what become of him, a reason unconnected with a quarrel. And it was certain that, if there had been a quarrel, it was not because of virtuous, plain speaking from Better. It seemed impossible that he could have got on board their hired boat to follow us without his employer's knowledge. Was his appearance at Wadi Halfa and his apparent betrayal of his clients all a part of their plan? We could not decide this question in our minds, or by cross-questioning Better while the train waited, for only time could prove. But what we had heard was interesting enough to be worth the promised thousand piastres, and the fair north on the government boat just starting. To make sure that Better did start, we called Kruger, put the whole sum into his hands, asking him to help the dragoman by buying his ticket and getting the notes changed into gold and silver. This little maneuver left the Armenian so calm, however, that we fancied his wish must really be to depart on the government boat. 
Such inquiries as we had had time to make concerning the Mamudia seemed to show that she must remain at Halfa for slight repairs to her engine, and instructions from her owner, who was staying at Aswan. It was just at this last minute of grace, with the station master adjuring and the set reproaching us, that Anthony and I jumped on board the train. Strange that two rows of blue glass windows should have the power to turn the whole world topsy-turvy, or to create a new one of entirely original color scheme. But so it was. Those people seated in their grand, traveling bed-sitting rooms had only a superficial resemblance to the passengers of the enchantress Isis. Monty, for instance, had pale green hair, with immense purple eyes, and showed every sign of rapid transformation into a mermaid. Cleopatra's auburn waves had turned to a vivid magenta, Biddy's black tresses had a blue, grapey bloom on them, and Anthony's dark eyes were a sinister green, with red lights. Ghostly, mother-of-pearl faces with opal shadows peered through the violet glass at an unreal landscape, which would instantly cease to exist if the windows were opened. But the windows could not be opened, or a rain of sand would pour in. So we gazed out on an impossible fairyland consisting of golden sea, with mountainous shores carved from amethyst, through which shone the glow of pulsing fires. Always we carried with us an immense shadow, like a trailing purple banner, unfurling as we moved. Men and women and animals seen at the numbered white stations in the sand were but fantastic figures in a camera obscura. The shadow of the train was torn with fiery streaks, and when the sun had burned to death on a red funeral pyre, the moon stole out to mourn for him. Her coming was sudden. She seemed abruptly to draw aside a hyacinth curtain, and hold up a lamp over the desert when the sun's fire had died. And the lamp gave forth an unearthly light, which poured over the endless sands a sheet of primrose-yellow flame. The warm sun shadow was chilled from purple to gray, and flowed over the magic primrose fields like a river of molten silver. At number six station, where we stopped for water after dinner, a hyena came galumping over the sand like a humpbacked dog, to stare at us as we strolled in couples away from the train into the desert. Next morning, everyone was up early to see the gray hornet's nests, which were Sudanese villages, and the villagers themselves, who urged us to buy straw rugs, baskets, fans, oranges, dried beans, live birds, and milk in wooden bowls, whenever the train stopped. Respectable old ladies dressed in short fringes, and small, full-stomached boys dressed in nothing at all. I had not told Biddy about our bargain with Sir Marcus, Anthony's and my services in exchange for the mountain of the Golden Pyramid. Why should she be forced to share our suspense? For she would share it if she knew, even though she didn't yet yield to me in the matter of a united future. I wanted to wait before telling her the story until Fenton and I had made sure if there were anything golden about the mountain except its name. If we were doomed to disappointment, I could then give the tale a humorous turn, easier to do in retrospect than anticipation. Now, when in blinding light of noon we pointed out, in an impersonal matter, to all who cared to see, the pyramid field of Marot, it seemed strange to think that no heart but Anthony's and mine beat the faster. The sun was so hot that most people, blinking dazedly, retired behind their screens of blue glass almost as soon as the train stopped, close to Garstang's camp. I had informed the set, casually, that wonderful things were being found in the rocky desert, that the few neat white tents sheltered men who were going to make of Moreau a world's wonder, that not only had the army of stunted black pyramids visible from the train yielded up treasures, but three tiers of palaces were being unearthed, or rather, unsanded. I said nothing, however, of the more distant dark shapes, like the pyramids, yet unlike them. Among those low, conical mountains, which perhaps gave inspiration to the pyramid builders, was our mountain. And I was not sorry when the burning sun smote curiosity from eyes and brains, and sent nearly all my flock back to their places, while the train had still some minutes at the station. Cleopatra had not come out. She had frankly lost interest in scenic history, and did not want to be intelligent. But as Anthony and I stepped off the train, we saw that Bridget and Monty stood arm in arm in the doorway. "'Would you like to jump down?' I asked reluctantly. For the first time, I did not wish Biddy O'Brien to give me her society. 
I hoped she would say, No, thank you, for I wanted Fenton to point out our mountain, which he had told me could be seen, and it would be inconvenient to answer questions. Yes, we should like it, they both replied together, so Anthony and I had to look delighted. It really was a pleasure to help them down, but even that we could have waited for till our arrival at Khartoum. And the first remark that Biddy made was too intelligent. What are those weird things off there in the distance that look exactly like ruined pyramids, sort of mud pie pyramids? Mountains, said Fenton. What, didn't anybody make them? The legend is that jinns, or evil spirits, created them to use as tombs for themselves. But they're almost precisely like the main pyramids, only a little more tumble down. Have they names? Some have, I believe, Anthony returned, with his well-put-on air of indifference. That blackest and most ruined-looking one of all, for instance, between two which are taller, there, away to the left, I mean, that is called the Mountain of the Golden Pyramid. Our eyes met over the girls' veiled hats. After all, he had found an opportunity of telling me what I wanted to know. What a fascinating name, said Monty. It sounds as if there were some special story connected with it. Is there? Yes, Anthony was obliged to admit. There is a legend that it was used as a tomb by the first Queen Candace, who lived about two hundred years B.C. after Ptolemy Philadelphus. She used to reign over what they called the Island of Moreau. It was this once fertile kingdom between the Atbara River over there and the Blue Nile. They say she wished to be buried with all her jewels and treasure, and was afraid of her tomb being robbed, so she wouldn't trust to a man-made pyramid. She ordered a secret place to be hollowed out in the heart of a mountain, and that's the one they pretend it is. What a lovely legend, but I suppose there's nothing in it, really, or clever people like those who are digging here now would have found the tomb and the treasure long ago, said Monty. I don't know, I left Anthony to answer, wondering what he would say. Only a very few have ever put enough faith in the story to search, and they have never been able to discover traces of an entrance into that mountain or any other. Of course, in trying to enter the Great Pyramid of Giza, they looked a long time before they succeeded. But that was different. There was never any doubt of there being something worth seeing inside, whereas this black lump may be solid rock and nothing more. It's many years since anybody has tried to get at the secret. I beg your pardon, politely said in French, an elderly man in a pith helmet, blue spectacles and khaki clothes who stood near. I couldn't help hearing your conversation, and it may interest you and these ladies to learn that at this very moment work is going on at the so-called Mountain of the Golden Pyramid. I envied Anthony the brown stain on his face, for I felt the blood rushing to mine. Indeed, I ejaculated in English, we are very much interested. Work, actually going on? Yes, it was begun about four or five weeks ago by an agent of Sir Marcus Lark, the well-known financier who got the concession for which some other party was said to be trying for. I am here, went on the helmeted man, gazing benevolently through his blue spectacles at the two pretty women. I am here with my son, who is one of Garstang's men. We have nothing to do with the mountain of the Golden Pyramid. Luckily for Sir Marcus, it was a judge to be off our pitch. Still, we are interested. They are keeping their work very secret, but these things are in the air. The talk here is that they're on the point of making, if they haven't already made, some very startling discovery. All aboard, if you please, shouted the Greek guard. End of chapter 28、Chapter、29 For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 29 Exit Antun. If there had been no Bridget and no Monty in the world, we should have let that train go on without us and hang the set and its feelings. But there was a Bridget, there was a Monty, and they were more to us than all the treasures Sir Marcus was apparently stealing while we slaved. What fools we had been to trust in such a man! And I had actually wasted pity on the fellow. Now, as we were borne away from Marot, we saw our hopes, which had begun to seem certainties, dissolving into air. They were like the mirage of the desert, which lured us with siren enchantment and mystery in this never-never land which thousands of brave men had died to win. 
shimmering blue lakes that mirrored green trees and low purple mountains, and the gold of sand dunes, so real, so near, it seemed we might walk to them in a few moments, only mocking dreams, like our belief in a famous financier's loyalty, like our hopes of fortune. For if Sir Marcus Lark had secretly begun work at the Mountain of the Golden Pyramid, it meant that he intended to seal everything best worth having for himself. It was maddening to realize that we might be too late to thwart him, but we had to risk this, or risk losing something dearer than the jewels of a Queen Candace. Anthony was staking the happiness of his future on the events of the following night. Now that the small cloud of misunderstanding had passed from the clear sky of our friendship, we were once again in confidence, as we had been before the Philae eavesdropping, and I knew the plan he meant to carry out at the Sirdar's ball. It was rather a melodramatic plan, perhaps, but somehow it fitted into the circumstances of his queer courtship, and I could see why Anthony preferred it to any other more conventional. As for me, too, I counted on Khartoum to give me a present of happiness. Better's story, largely false as it might be, must have a basis of truth. I'd cease to argue with Biddy. We'll leave the subject of the future alone till we get to Khartoum, I had said. She thought, maybe, that she had half convinced me of her worldly wisdom. But this was far from being the case. I was only waiting to see whether my theory were right or wrong. I couldn't know until Khartoum, and nothing on earth, or hidden under earth, would have induced me to put off the moment of finding out. North Khartoum was standing in a mirage as we approached, and Fenton and I were superstitious enough to wonder if it were a bad omen, that lovely lake which was not there, reflecting clearly each white and ochre-colored house of the city in the sand. Only the blue glitter of the Nile was real, as the train crossed the river on a high bridge, and landed us in the surprising garden of beauty which is Khartoum itself. Wide streets, bordered with flowering trees, rose-pink acacias and coral pendants of pepperberries, lawns green as velvet, big verandaed houses of silver-gray or ruddy stone, roses climbing over hedges and wall, scent of lilies and magnolias floating on an air as clear as crystal, droning sakias spraying pearls over the warm bodies of slow-moving oxen, white sails like butterflies' wings dotting the blue Nile. This was the new city created as if by magic in sixteen years upon the sad ruins of Gordon's stronghold. On the wide veranda of the Grand Hotel, where pretty girls were giving tea to young officers in khaki, Fenton came up to Bridget and Monty, who were questioning me about letters. The look on his face struck the girl into silence. "'What is it?' she asked almost sharply. "'Don't let me interrupt you,' he said. "'I can wait a few minutes.' "'No,' Monty insisted. "'Please speak. I know it's something important.' "'Important only to myself, perhaps,' he answered, with a smile that was rather wistful. "'I have to say good-bye now.' "'Good-bye?' echoed Monty, surprised and even frightened, more by his look and tone than the words themselves." My engagement with Sir Marcus Lark ended when our train stopped at Khartoum. I have other business to attend to, here. I've just made my adieus with everybody else. I saved you till the last. Monty was pale. Even the fresh young rose that was her mouth had blanched. Otherwise, she controlled herself perfectly. Was this part of Anthony's plan, I wondered? He had told me what he intended to do at the palace ball tomorrow night, but he had said nothing about this preliminary scene. I understood, however, why he had not maneuvered to get Monty to himself, in a deserted corner of this big ground-floor balcony of the hotel. Even when, with the set, it was a question of getting their tea, or looking at their rooms, eyes were always ready to observe Miss Gilder, especially since it was in the air that she really was Miss Gilder, the Miss Gilder. He did not want Miss Hassett Bean and Mrs. Harlow to be saying, Look, my dear, at the tragic, private farewell Antoon Effendi and our American beauty are having. Since Philae, there would have been no use in trying to conceal his feelings for Monty from Bridget or me. Therefore, we made useful chaperones and could be regarded as dummies. You never told me that you were leaving us at Khartoum, the girl stammered. I thought... But though we knew what she thought, she could go no further before an audience. My business prevents me from staying at the hotel, Anthony explained. And, though I shall see you, never again will you see poor Ahmed Atun. I don't understand, Monty said. I know, but that was what we agreed upon. You promised to trust me without understanding. Tomorrow night, at the Sirdar's ball, you will understand. 
I've arranged with Lord Ernest that you and Mrs. Jones and Mrs. East and he shall write your names in the book at the palace. Then you will all receive invitations for the ball, the four of you only of the party. And you will be there? I've just told you, Anthony repeated, that Antoon is saying good-bye to you forever. Yet you told me, too, that after Khartoum I should be ha- She cut herself short and shut her lips closely. I was angry with Fenton for what seemed cruelty to one who had very nobly confessed her love for him. Biddy's eyes protested, too, but the man and the girl cared no more for us or our criticism at that moment than if we had been harmless, necessary chairs for them to sit upon. "'There are many paths to happiness,' Fenton answered. "'I shall see you tomorrow night, and I shall know whether you are happy. "'Meanwhile, I say again, trust me, and good-bye.' He held out his strong, nervous hand, so browned by the sun that it needed little staining for the part he had played, and was to play no more. As if mechanically, Monty Gilder laid her hand in it. They looked into each other's eyes, which were almost on a level, so tall was she. Then Antoine Effendi turned abruptly away, forgetting apparently that he had not taken leave of Bridget or me. "'Let's go upstairs at once, dear, and see our rooms,' Biddy said quickly. An instant later I stood alone on the veranda. But I knew well enough where to find Captain Anthony Fenton when I wanted him, although the death knell of Antoon was sounding. I was not in the least melancholy, and despite the tense emotion of that short scene, I had never felt less sentimental in my life. My whole being concentrated itself in a desire to visit the post office and to bash Sir Marcus Lark's head. When Anthony came up for his farewell, I had been asking Bridget and Monty if they expected letters at the post restaurant. Both said no, but advised by me they gave me their cards, armed with which I could ask for letters and obtain them if there were any. It's very unlikely anyone will address me there, Biddy had assured me. The only letter I'm hoping for will come to the hotel. I was not jealous, because I was sure the said letter was from Esme O'Brien. Now for weal or woe, Mrs. Halloran. The letter I hoped for would be from a very different person, though if it materialized it would certainly mention the runaway bride. And if such a letter came to Khartoum, the place to look for it, I thought, would be the post restaurant. The writer, not being a personal friend of Mrs. O'Brien's, and presumably not knowing Khartoum, could not be certain at which hotel she would stop. I was hurrying away a few minutes later to prove once and for all whether I were a budding Sherlock Holmes or merely an imaginative fool when a servant came out from the hotel and handed me a telegram. Lark, I read the signature at the end with a snort of rage, I wonder he has the cheek to... But by that time I was getting at the meat of the message. What the de... By Jove, here's a complication, I heard myself mutter of running accompaniment to Marcus Lark's words. This is what he had to say on two sheets of paper. Lord Ernest Burrow, Grand Hotel, Khartoum. In train leaving Aswan, met man from Moreau, told me work begun at our place. Strange news, don't understand, but sure you two haven't gone ahead of bargain. Must be foul play or else mistake, but thought matter too serious to go north. Left train, returned Aswan, caught government steamer for Halfa, just arrived too late for train deluxe, but will proceed by ordinary train to camp. Better meet me there as soon as possible, leaving boat people take care of themselves. Wire Kabushia, Lark. His loyalty to us shamed me. We had not given him the benefit of the doubt, but had at once believed the worst. He, though not a gentleman in the opinion of Colonel Corcoran and some others, was chivalrously sure that we had not gone ahead of the bargain. A revulsion of feeling gave me a spasm of something like affection for the big fellow whom his adored Cleopatra sneered at as common. I longed to show the telegram to Anthony, but he would now be at the palace reporting to the Sirdar. Later he would be at his own quarters, transforming himself from a pale brown haji in a green turban into a sunburned young British officer in uniform. Meantime, I would go to the poste restante, and then, whatever the result of the visit, I would return, collect Bridget and Monty, and take them back to the palace to write their names in the book. I dare not think what my blood pressure must have been as I waited for a post office official to look through a bundle of letters. Mrs. B. Jones, he murmured. No, nothing for B. Jones, unless it's O'Brien Jones. Here is a letter addressed to Mrs. O'Brien Jones. That's it, said I, swallowing heavily. Mrs. O'Brien Jones, I think the letter must be postmarked Aswan. Without further hesitation, the post office man handed me the envelope, 
on the strength of Mrs. B. Jones's visiting card. Going out of the office, I walked on air. Sherlock Holmes it is, I congratulated myself, and I ventured to be wildly happy, because it seemed to me that a letter sent to Mrs. O'Brien Jones from Aswan could only mean one thing, a justification of my theory. I went straight to Biddy's door and knocked. There was no answer, and I stood fuming with impatience on the upstairs balcony, upon which each bedroom opens. It seemed impossible to live another minute without putting that letter into Biddy's hand, and not for the world would I have let it come to her from any one else. I was tempted to tear open the envelope, but before I had time to test my character, Biddy appeared on the balcony, coming round the corner from Monty's room. "'Why, Duffer, you look as if the sky had fallen!' she exclaimed. "'It has,' I returned. "'It's lying all over the place. "'There's a bit of it in this letter, a bit of heaven, maybe. "'A letter for me? "'Yes, and if you aren't quick about opening it, I'll commit Hari Kari.' "'She was quick about opening it. "'As she read, almost literally my eyes were glued to her face. "'It went white, then pink. "'Thank heaven,' I said within myself. "'If she had been pink first and white afterward, I should have been alarmed.' For a woman's color to blossom warmly from a snowfield means good news. Duffer, she breathed, do you know what's in this? I thought it would come. My voice sounded rather queer. I'd fancied I had more self-control. That's why I wanted your card for the post restaurant. Read this, she said, and gave me the open letter. It was written on paper of a hotel at Aswan, near the railway station, and was as follows. Madam, let me explain frankly before I go further that my name is Thomas McMahon. You may remember it. If you do, you will not think it strange that I, as a private person as well as a member of a society, whose name it is not necessary to mention, wanted certain papers you were supposed to possess. For a long time I, and others almost equally interested, tried to trace you, after learning that you had the documents, or in any case knew where they were. Naturally, we were prepared to go far in order to make you give them up. We believed that your stepdaughter was with you. As the need was pressing, and as we had failed more than once, we would, if necessary, have worked upon your feelings through her. Had we questioned you, and had you replied that we were mistaken concerning the young lady in the papers, we should have been incredulous. But accident enabled us to hear from your own lips details which we could not disbelieve. As a woman, we wish you no harm. Therefore, we rejoice in this turn of events for your sake." Your stepdaughter must now be one of us through her husband. She has nothing further to fear, much as we regret her marriage into a family so deeply injured by her father. As for you, madam, you may be at rest where we are concerned. You said to Lord Ernest Burrow in the Temple of Abu Simbel that you could never be happy until the organization Richard O'Brien betrayed, forgot, and forgave his daughter and yourself. Through me, the organization now formally both forgives and forgets. Wishing you well in future, yours truly, T. McMahon, alias Blount. P.S. Kindly acknowledge receipt of this letter in care of Better Algamali, whose address you have at Cairo. Not hearing from you, we shall try to communicate this news in some other way. The present method has occurred to us, as you may find it useful to know the state of affairs without delay. Oh, Biddy, do you find it useful? I asked. She held out her hands to me. There was no one in the veranda just then, and I kissed her. Mine, I said. What a gorgeous place Khartoum would be to be married in. Monty was very brave next day. She went to Omdurman with the rest of us, and it was the chance of a lifetime, because, through Anthony, Slatin Pasha himself took us to the place of his captivity. Slatin Pasha, slim, soldierly, young, vital, and brilliant. It was scarcely possible to believe that this man, who looked no more than thirty-five, and radiated energy, could have passed eleven years in slavery terrible beyond description. He spoke of those experiences almost lightly, as if telling the story of someone else, and it was all in the day's work that he should have triumphed over his persecutors in a way more complete, more dramatic, than any author of romance would dare invent for his hero. He took us from the river steps in front of his own big verandaed house, down the Blue Nile in a fast steam launch. It was a Nile as blue as turquoise, and after the low island of Thule had been left behind, it was strange to see the junction of the blue and white Niles, in a quarrelsome swirl of sharply divided colors. Landing on the shore at Omdurman, we met carts loaded with elephant tusks, and wagons piled with hides. 
Giant men, like ebony statues, walked beside pacing camels white as milk. The vegetable market was a town of little booths. The grain markets had gathered riches of green and orange gold. Farther on, in the brown shadows of the roughly roofed labyrinth of bazaars, were stores of sandalwood and spices smelling like Araby the Blessed. Open-fronted shops showing splendid leper skins, crocodile heads bristling with knives, carved tusks of elephants, shields, armor said to have been captured from crusaders, Abyssinian spears, swords, and strange headgear used by the Matis and Khalifa's men. The bazaars of Cairo and even Aswan seemed tame and sophisticated compared to this wild market of the Sudan, where half the men and all the bread-selling women who were old enough had been the Khalifa's slaves. With Santan Pasha we went to the Khalifa's palace to gaze at the saint's carriage, the skeleton of Gordon's piano, and scores of ancient guns which had cut short the lives of Christian men. Slatin's house we saw, too, and the gate whence he had escaped, the Mahdi's shattered tomb, and the famous open-air mosque. Then we had run up the Blue Nile as far as Gordon's tree, and lunched on board the launch. In the afternoon, back at Khartoum again, there was still time to group round the statue of Gordon on his camel, holding the short stick that was his only weapon, and gazing over the desert. The set were allowed to walk through the palace gardens, to behold the spot at the head of the grand staircase, where Gordon fell, and to have a glimpse in the Sirdar's library of the Khalifa's photograph taken after death. This was a special favor, and as they knew nothing about the four invitations to the ball, they were satisfied with their day. Dinner was in the illuminated garden of the hotel, and when it was over I smuggled Bridget and Monty and Cleopatra inconspicuously away. No one suspected, and if the lovely dresses worn by Mrs. East and Miss Gilder were commented upon, doubtless aunt and niece were merely supposed to be showing off. Never, I think, had Monty come so near to being a great beauty. In her dress of softly folding silver cloth she was a tall white lily. She wore no jewels except a string of pearls, and there was no color about her anywhere except the deep violet her hazel eyes took on at night, and the brown gold of her hair. Even her lips were pale as they had been when Antun bade her good-bye. Hers was no gay, dancing mood. She was going to the ball because Antun Effendi had ordered, rather than asked, her to go. But she was like some fair, tragic creature on trial for her life, waiting to hear what the verdict of the jury might be. End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of It Happened in Egypt – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 30 The Sirdar's Ball Biddy, radiating joy, walked beside me with wide-open, eager eyes, taking in every detail of the historic house. She admired the immense hall, whose archways opened into dim, fragrant gardens. She was entranced with the Sudanese band, ink-black giants uniformed in white, playing wild native music in the moonlight. She wanted to stop and make friends with the shoebill, a super stork, apparently carved in shining metal, with a bill like an enormous slipper, eyes like the hundredth part of a second stop in a Kodak, and feet that tested each new tuft of grass on the lawn, as if it were a specimen of some hitherto undiscovered thing. No question, but she was happy. I was proud of her, and proud of myself because my love had power to give her happiness. What matter now if I were being robbed at the mountain of the Golden Pyramid by some unknown thief? Neither he nor any one could steal Biddy. Even Cleopatra seemed pleased to be coming to the Sirdar's ball, though gloom lay heavy upon her. She wanted to look her best. She wanted to be admired by the officers she was to meet, and to have as many partners as she could split dances for. To be admired by someone was essential to her just now, a soothing medicine to heal the smart of hurt vanity. Monny, I felt, had made herself look beautiful only because she thought that Antun, unseen, would see her. As we entered the ballroom, her eyes were wistful, searching, yet not expecting to find. He had said that she would never see Antun again. I found friends in the ballroom, men I knew at home, and a few pretty women I had met in England or abroad, 
but there was no more than time to be received by the aide-de-camp, and to introduce a few officers to my three ladies, when the moment came for the formal entry of our host and hostess, the soldier Sirdar and his graceful wife, the royalties of the Sudan. We were presented, and I guessed at once that the Sirdar had been prepared in advance to take a special interest in Rosamond Gilder. Anthony has told him the whole thing, and has asked his help, was my thought. From the instant of his kindly greeting for the girl, I found myself suddenly, excitedly assuming the attitude of a spectator in a theater on the night of a new play. I knew the plot of the play, but not how it would be presented, nor how it would work out. I saw that the Sirdar had made up his mind to a certain line of action where Monty was concerned. And by and by, when he had time to spare from his general duties as host, I heard him ask if she would like to go on the roof, where Gordon used to stand watching for the English soldiers to come. I will take you, he said, and if you like to stay longer than I can stop away from our guests, I'll give you another guide. He turned to Biddy and me. Cleopatra was dancing with Baron Rudolph von Slatten Pasha, gorgeous in medals and stars. Bridget and I had just stopped. Would you like to come too? the Sirdar asked. I answered for Biddy, knowing what she would want me to say. And still the sense of being a spectator in a wonderful theater was dreamily upon me. Stronger and stronger the impression grew as the Sirdar led us out onto a wide loggia white with moonlight and up a flight of stairs to a flat roof. Overhead a sky of milk was spangled with flashing stars. Beneath our eyes lay the palace gardens, where the torches of the Sudanese band glowed like transfixed fireflies in the pale moon rays. Palms and acacias and jeweled flower beds were cut out sharply in vivid color by the lights which streamed from open windows. Beyond, past the zone of violet shadow so like a stage background, was the sheen of the river, bright as spilt mercury under the moon. And beyond again, on the other side of the Nile, the tawny flame of that desert across which came the Khalifa's fierce army. This is where Gordon used to stand, the Sirdar stopped us near the parapet. Only the roof was one story lower then. He climbed up here every day, till the last, to look out across the desert, saying, The English will come. There's a black gardener I have, who thinks he meets him now, on moonlight nights like this, walking in the garden. It wasn't much of a garden in his day, only palms and orange trees, but a rose bush he planted and loved is alive still. I've just asked one of my officers, one whom I particularly want you to meet, Miss Gilder, to pluck a rose from Gordon's bush and bring it here to you. He knows where to find us, and when he comes I must go back to the ballroom and leave you, all three to his guidance. Lord Ernest and he used to be friends as boys, I believe. Perhaps you've heard him speak of Captain Anthony Fenton? Perhaps, I don't remember, Monty answered apologetically. She, so self-confident and self-possessed, was charmingly shy with this great soldier who had made history in the Sudan. If you don't remember, Lord Ernest can't have done justice to the subject. Fenton's one of the finest young officers in Egypt, or indeed in the service. We're rather proud of him. Lately he's been employed on a special mission, which he has carried out extremely well. Few others could have done it, for a man of great audacity and self-restraint was needed, a combination hard to find. He has been in the Balkans, and since he has had a particularly delicate task entrusted to him to be conducted with absolute secrecy. No kudos to be got out of it in case of success, and failure would almost certainly have cost his life. It was a question of disguise and getting at the native heart. It sounds like something in a storybook, said Monty, while Bridget and I kept mum, drinking in gulps of moonlight. Yes, the Sirdar agreed, or the autobiography of Sir Richard Burton. Fenton has the same extraordinary gift of language and dialect that Burton had. The art of makeup, too, and he's been to Mecca, a great adventure I believe he had. Perhaps you can get him to talk of it, though he's not fond of talking about himself. Altogether, he's what I sometimes hear the ladies call a romantic figure. His father was a famous soldier. If you were English, you would have heard of him. He broke off a brilliant career in Egypt by running away with a beautiful princess. She was practically all Greek and Italian, though her father called himself a Turk. No Egyptian blood, whatever. But there was a great row, of course, and Charles Fenton left the army. Now Anthony Fenton's grandfather, who lives in Constantinople, would like to adopt his grandson, but the young man is in every sense of the word an Englishman, devoted to his career, and doesn't want a fortune or a Turkish title. 
Why, that sounds, Monty faltered, like a man of character and a born soldier, doesn't it? Here he comes now. There was a sound of quick, light footsteps on the stairs. In silence, we turned to see a tall young officer in uniform walk out upon the flat roof. The moon shone straight into a face, grave yet eager, so deeply sunburned as to be brown even in that pale light. Long eyebrows sketched sharply as if in ink, the black lines running down toward the temples. Large, sad eyes, a slight upward hitch of the mouth on one side, clear-cut Roman nose, aggressive chin. "'Miss Gilder, let me introduce Captain Anthony Fenton,' the Sirdar said. "'I've brought you a rose,' said Anthony. They stood looking at one another for a long moment, the sun-brown British officer and the pale girl. We, Biddy and I, stared at them both from our distance, and when the spell of the instant had broken, we saw that the Sirdar had gone. We too would have gone, though the man and the girl were between us and the stairway, and we should have had to push past them. But Anthony, seeing our hesitation, spoke quietly. "'Don't go,' he said. "'I may want you.' Never until tonight had Monty Gilder heard him speak English. "'You see,' he said to her, "'why I told you yesterday you would never see Antoon again. "'I had to tell you that, to make sure you would trust me, "'fully through everything. "'You have trusted me, and so you've made it possible for me to keep my vow, "'a wrong and stupid vow, but it had to be kept.' When I was angry because you treated me like a servant, I swore that never, no matter how I might be tempted, would I tell you with my own lips who I was, or let Boro tell. I was going to make myself of importance in your life as Ahmed Atun, if I could, not as Anthony Fenton. But long before that night at Philae I was ashamed. I... But you said then you would forgive me. Now, when you understand what you didn't understand then, can you still say the same? "'I hardly know what to say,' she answered. "'I don't know how I feel about anything.' "'Well, I know, you goose,' exclaimed Biddy, "'rushing to the rescue, where angels who haven't learned to think with their hearts "'might have feared to tread. "'You feel so happy you're afraid that you're going to howl. "'Why, it's all perfectly wonderful. "'And only the silliest, earliest Victorian girls would sulk because they'd been deceived. "'If anybody deceived you, you deceived yourself.' I knew who he was from the first. So did your Aunt Clara. We've kept our ears open and heard the duffer talk about his friend Anthony Fenton, who was coming to meet us. You were mooning, I suppose, and didn't listen. We didn't give him away partly because it wasn't our business, and partly because each of us was up to another game, never mind what. Captain Fenton never tried to play you a trick. You threw yourself at his head, you know you did, from Shepherd's Terrace. He had his mission to think of, and you'd be very conceited if you thought he ought to have let you interfere with it. As it happened, you worked in quite well with the mission at first. Then fate stepped in and made the band play a different dance tune. No military march, but a love waltz. That wasn't his fault. And I have to remind you of all this, because you're glaring at Captain Fenton now as if he'd done something wrong instead of fine, and he can't praise himself. As she finished, out of breath, having dashed on without a single comma, the giant black musicians in the garden began to sing a strange African love song, in deep, rich voices, their instruments, which had played with precision European airs, suddenly pouring out their primitive, passionate souls. "'Biddy, dear,' said the girl in a small, meek voice, "'thank you very much, and you're just sweet. But I didn't need even you to defend him to me.' I was only just stopping to breathe for fear my heart would burst because I was dizzy with too much joy. I worship him, and and you can both go away now, please. We don't want you. We went. Biddy would have fallen downstairs if I hadn't caught her round the waist. Needless to say, I didn't look back, but Biddy did, and should, by rights, have been turned into a pillar of salt. My gracious, but they're beautiful, she gasped. For goodness sake... Let's dash as fast as we can down into the garden and do the same thing. What? I floundered. Why, you duffer, kiss each other like mad. Boiling with excitement, when I met Cleopatra later in the ballroom, I told her what was going on above, in the moonlight on the roof. At last, your niece knows what I think you have guessed all along, but so wisely kept to yourself, I said. About Fenton, I mean. It's all right between those two now. They will come downstairs engaged. "'Everybody is engaged,' Cleopatra stormily retorted. "'That's exactly what I remarked to Bridget "'before I could persuade her to follow the general example. 
Everybody in the world is engaged except ourselves, are the words I used. And except me, added Mrs. East. You forgot me, didn't you? Never, I insisted. You can be engaged to a dozen men at any moment, if you'd wanted to. I think you're exaggerating a little, Lord Ernest, Cleopatra replied modestly and unsmilingly. But her countenance brightened faintly. Of course there are a few men. There were some in New York. You don't need to tell me that, I assured her. I feel as if I'd like to tell you something else, she went on, if you can spare a few minutes. Will you sit out the next dance? I asked. It isn't a bunny hug or a tango or anything distracting for lookers-on. Aren't you dancing with Bridget? No such luck. I mean, fortunately not. She has grabbed Slatin Pasha and forgotten that I exist. By Jove, there come Miss Gilder and Fenton. What a couple. They're rather gorgeous waltzing together, what? "'Very nice,' said Cleopatra, trying with all her over-amuleted heart not to be acid. "'But, oh, Lord Ernest, that settles it. I must be engaged myself before Monny brings him to show me, like a cat with a mouse it's caught. Otherwise I couldn't stand it, and afterward would be too late.' Hastily I rushed her out into the garden, where the shoe-bill regarded her with one eye of prehistoric wisdom. If she really were a reincarnation, I'm sure he knew it, and had probably belonged to her in Alexandria when she was queen. "'There's a Mr. Talmadge in New York,' she went on, wildly. "'He said he would come to me from across the world at a moment's notice if I wired. Only it would be awkward if I announced our engagement tonight, and then found he'd changed his mind. Besides, he'd be a last resort, and Saida Sabri said I ought. Why not wire Sir Marcus?' I ventured. If his telegram had not come yesterday, I would have as soon advised Cleopatra to adopt an asp. Oh, well, I was thinking of it. That's one thing I wanted to ask your advice about. I believe he does love me. Idolizes is the word. And then, now and then, in the night, I've had a feeling it was almost like a wasting something providential to refuse a Marcus Antonius. Saida Sabri warned me to wait for a man named Anthony, whom I should meet in Egypt. That's why I... But no matter now. The lark is a dreadful obstacle, though. How could I live with a lark? Lady Lark has quite a musical lilt. Do you think so? There's one thing, even if you're the wife of a marquise or an earl, you can only be called Lady This or That. You might be anything. He's taller than Antoon, I mean Captain Fenton, and his eyes are just as nice in their way. They quite haunt me since Philae. But Lord Ernest, he has some horrid, common little tricks. He scratches his hair when he's worried. If you look up his coat sleeves, you catch glimpses of Grey Yager, a thing I always felt I could never marry. And worst of all, when he finishes a meal and goes away from the table, he walks off eating. I don't suppose, said I, that your first Marcus Antonius ever went away from a table at all, on his feet, anyhow, while you were doing him so well in Egypt. He had to be carried. I call Sir Marcus, and I stole the Sirdar's epithet for the other Anthony, a romantic figure. His adoration for you is a sonnet. There's no H in his name to bother you, and he fell in love at first sight like a real sport. I mean, like the hero of a book. If he has ways you don't approve, you can cure them, redecorate and remodel him with the latest American improvements. Why, I believe he'd go so far as to give his lark a tail if you asked him to spell it with an E. "'Well, I suppose you're right about what I'd better do,' she sighed. "'A bird in the hand—oh, I'm not making a silly pun about a lark—is worth two in New York. "'Please tell everyone you see I'm engaged to Sir Marcus, for he is my bird in the hand, "'and I'll send off a telegram the first thing tomorrow morning, "'for fear he hears the news that he's engaged to me prematurely. "'Where is he, do you know?' "'By tomorrow morning he'll be at Merrow Camp,' I said. "'But I did not add, so shall we.' End of chapter 30。Chapter 31 of It Happened in Egypt。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter 31 The Mountain of the Golden Pyramid. There was not much room in our hearts for mountains or gold just then. Yet somehow, before we left the palace, Anthony and I had told Bridget and Monny the secret which had been the romance of our lives, until they came into it to paint dead gold with a living rose of love. 
Victorian women would have been grieved or angry with men who could leave them at such a time, but these two, instead of reproaching us, urged us on. Naturally, they wanted to go with us. They said if there were danger, they wished to share it, and if there were to be a find, they wished to be among the first to see what no eyes had seen for two thousand years. But when Anthony explained that there wasn't time to get tents together and make a decent camp for ladies, even if we were sure not to tumble into trouble, they said no more. This was surprising in Monny, if not in Bridget. I supposed, however, that she was being on her best behavior as a kind of thank offering to Providence for its unexpected gift of legitimate happiness. Our secret was to be kept. Only the Sirdar knew, and gave Fenton leave of absence for a few days. The set did not suspect the existence of a mountain at Moreau more important than its neighbors. They did not even know what had become of Antoine Effendi after he bade them farewell and good luck. From the first, he had given it out that he must leave the party at Khartoum. The object of returning to Meru was to meet Sir Marcus, and I promised to be back in plenty of time to organize the return trip to Cairo. My departure, therefore, was all in the day's work, and the great sensation was Mrs. East's engagement. Even though, for obvious reasons, Monny's love affair was kept dark, Cleopatra could not resist parading hers the minute her wire to Sir Marcus had been safely sent. I got an invitation for all the members of the set to a tennis party in the palace gardens, at which the Sultan of Darfur and a bodyguard armed with battle axes would be the chief attraction. Also, I induced the landlord of our hotel to promise special illuminations, music, and an impromptu dance for the evening. This was to make sure that none of our friends should find time to see me off at the train. Anthony was to join me there in Mufti and might be recognized by sharp eyes on the lookout for mysteries. Once we got away, that danger would be past unless Cleopatra told. But I was certain that she would not to anyone ever again mention the name of Antoun. It was a full train that night, but no one in it who knew Antoun. Many people who had been visiting friends or staying at an hotel for weeks were saying goodbye. The narrow corridors of the sleeping cars had African spears piled up on the floor against the wall, very long and inconvenient. Ladies struggled in with rainbow-colored baskets almost too big for their compartments. Seats were littered with snake skins like immense decayed apple parings, fearsome crescent-shaped knives, leopard rugs in embryo, and strange headgear in many varieties. Stuffed crocodiles fell down from the racks and got underfoot. Men walked about with elephant tusks under their arms. Dragoman solicited a last tip. A six-foot-seven dinka, black as ink and splendid as a Greek statue, brought flowers from the palace for some departing acquaintance of the Sirdar and his wife. Officers in evening dress dashed up through the sand on donkey back to see the last of friends, their mess jackets making vivid spots of color in the electric light. All the fragrant blossoms of Khartoum seemed to be sending farewell messages of perfume on the cool evening air. No more fantastic scene at a railway station could be imagined. If the world and its doings is but a moving picture for the gods on Olympus, they must enjoy the film of a train departing from Khartoum. Anthony did not join me until just as the train was crawling out of the station, for we had asked Bridget and Monny not to see us off, and they had been startlingly acquiescent. We had a two-berthed compartment together, and talked most of the night, in low voices, of the mountain, of the legends concerning it, and the papers of the dead Egyptologist Ferlini, which indirectly had brought Fenton into Monny Gilder's life, and given Bridget back to me. There was the out-of-doors breakfast party, too, on the terrace at Shepherd's. Had it not been for this incident, Antun, the green-turbaned Haji, would never have been selected by Miss Gilder in words she might now like to forget. I'll have that. But had not a distressed artist called on me one morning in Rome, some months ago, with an old notebook to sell, I should not have come to Egypt for my sick leave, and none of us would have met. I had visited the artist's studio to please a friend, and bought a picture to please him, not myself. Therefore he regarded me as a charitable dilettante, likely to buy anything if properly approached. Bad luck had come to him. He wanted to try pastures new, and needed money at short notice. Therefore he wished to dispose of a secret which might be the key to fortune. 
Why didn't he use the key himself? was the obvious question, which he answered by saying that a poor man would not be able to find the lock to fit it. The notebook he had to sell had been the property of a distinguished distant relative, long since dead, the Italian, Ferlini, who about 1834 ransacked the ruins of Mero in the kingdom of Candace. Ferlini had given treasure in gold, scarabs, and jewels to Berlin, all of which he had discovered in a secret cache in the masonry of a pyramid, in the so-called pyramid field of Mero. But he had been blamed for unscientific work, and in some quarters it was not believed that he had found the hoard at Mero. This jealousy and injustice had prevented Ferlini's obtaining a grant for further explorations he wished to make. He claimed to have proof that in a certain mountain, not far from the Moreau pyramids, and much resembling them in shape, was hidden the tomb of a Candace who lived two hundred years earlier than the queen of that name mentioned in the New Testament, mistress of the eunuch baptized by St. Philip. In the notebook which had come down with other belongings of Ferlini the Egyptologist to Ferlini the artist was a copy of a certain demotic writing of a peculiar and little-known form. The original had existed, according to the dead Ferlini's notes, on the wall of an antechapel in one of the most ruinous pyramids at Maro, decorated in a peculiarly barbaric Ethiopian style. The wall writing described the making of the mountain tomb, ordered by Candace in fear that her body might be disturbed, according to a prophecy which predicted the destruction of the kingdom if the jewels of the dead were found. Ferlini, a student of the demotic writings which had superseded hieroglyphics, doubted not that he had translated the revelation aright, though he admitted supplying many missing words in accordance with his own deductions. He was in disfavor at the time he tried to organize an expedition in search of the queen's hoard, and, though legends of the mountain confirmed the writings which Berlini was the first to translate, the Italian could induce no one to finance his scheme. The one person he succeeded in interesting had a relative, already excavating in Egypt, but eventually addressed on the subject, this young man replied that the antechapel in question had fallen completely into ruin. It would be impossible, therefore, to find the wall writing, if indeed it ever existed. This verdict had put an end to Ferlini's hopes, and nothing remained of them save the translated copy of the writing in his notebook, the missing words inserted, and the legends of the Negroes who, generation after generation since forgotten times, had told the story of the mountain of the Golden Pyramid. Nobody within the memory of man had ever searched for the problematical tomb, and as tales of more or less the same character are common in Egypt, I did not place much faith in the enthusiastic jottings of Ferlini. However, my love of the unknown, the mysterious and romantic, made me feel that the possession of the notebook was worth the price asked, two thousand lira. When I had brooded over it myself, I posted it to Fenton at Khartoum, and his opinion had brought me to Egypt. Thinking of the matter in this way, it seemed to me that we owed our love stories to the impecunious artist who had probably spent his eighty pounds and forgotten me by this time. In a few hours or a few days we might owe him even more. Anthony, acquainted with Mero, its pyramids and pyramidal mountains, since his first coming to the Sudan, had been able to plan out our campaign almost at an hour's notice. He knew where to wire for camels, to take us to our destination, eighteen miles from Kabushia, also for trained excavators and he knew one who, if the white men were in ignorance, could tell us all the most hidden happenings of the desert for fifty miles around. This was the great character of the neighborhood among the blacks, the wise man of the Merotic Desert, who claimed to be over a hundred years old, had a tribe of sons and grandsons, and practically ruled the village of Bakarawiya. For countless generations his forebears had lived under the shadow of the ruined pyramids. Family tradition made them the descendants of those Egyptian warriors who revolted in the time of King Psammeticus, migrating from Elephantine Island to Ethiopia. They were well received by the sovereign, given lands in Upper Nubia, and the title of Atolomi or Asmak, meaning those who stand on the left side of the king. Anthony's friend and instructor in the lore of legends rejoiced in the name of Asmak, which, he proudly said, had been bestowed on the eldest son in his family since time immemorial. Asmak the old and wise was to meet us at Kabushia station with camels, 
one for each and one for Sir Marcus, in case he had arrived and wished to ride to the Mountain of the Golden Pyramid. It was red-orange afternoon when our white train slowed down to pause for a moment at Cabuchia Station, and the first face we saw was that of Sir Marcus Antonius, a radiant face whose beaming smile was, I knew, not so much a welcome sign for us as a sign that he had received the telegram from Cleopatra. He hurried along the platform to the steps of our sleeping car, and Anthony, ready to swing himself down before the train stopped, pointed out Asmak not far off, a thin, old black man who must have once have been a stately giant, but bent forward now as if searching the earth for his own grave. He had got to his feet from a squatting position in the coal-stained, alluvial clay of this strange desert, and was gazing toward us, his few rags fluttering in the warm wind. Beside him stood a mere youth of fifty or so, and two or three young men, with several sulky camels. Sir Marcus began to shake hands almost before we were on the platform, and so did he engross himself in us and absorb our attention that none of us quite knew when the train went out. "'My dear boys,' he addressed us, nearly breaking our finger-bones. "'Lord Fenton, you're even better looking as a true Britisher than a false Arab. "'But never mind that now. Borrow, you're a trump. "'I believe I owe everything to you. "'I mean, in the matter of Mrs. East. "'Clara, it was always my favorite name. "'Fenton knows. Thanks for the congratulations. "'Thanks to you both. "'You must be my best men. "'What? Can't have but one? "'Well, it must be Borrow, then, I suppose.' "'Oh, about the mountain. Why, of course you're anxious. "'Don't think I have not been busy. I have. "'Got here by special train. "'Cost me a lot of money, but who cares? It's worth it. "'I want to hurry things up and get to Khartoum. "'What your blessed mountain is to you, that is a certain lady to me.' "'What have you found out?' I managed at last to cut short his rhapsodies. "'Why, not much, I'm bound to confess, but I've only had a few hours.' Someone, heaven knows who, came here, it seems, with Arabs he's engaged, heaven knows where, and pretended to be my agent, empowered by me to work at the Mountain of the Golden Pyramid, where it was well known I'd got the right to excavate. Well, the chap was armed with credentials and had a contract signed by me, so the authorities thought that was all right, of course, and let him go on. This was more than a month ago. He pitched his camp out by the mountain, and nobody disturbed him. Fact is, from what I hear, I don't believe the excavating men from Liverpool School of Archaeology, or whatever you call it, thought much of his chances of success. A case of looking for Captain Kidd's treasure. He and his men were excavating round the mountain, and he'd engaged some more fellows from the neighborhood to make the work go faster. But a few days ago, not yet a week, he discharged the lot, paid them up, and sent them off, saying he'd abandoned hope of finding any entrance to an alleged tomb. The Arabs departed by train, but the fellows from hereabouts gossiped a bit, it seems, and the story was started that they'd been got rid of because the boss had hit on something and wanted to be left to himself. "'You haven't yet told us the name of the man,' Anthony reminded him. "'By Jove, no more I haven't. I'm so excited about everything. You won't know it, but Borrow will. Colonel Corcoran.' Anthony gave me a look. "'I do know the name,' he said. "'It's the man of my dream.' The man of your dream? Corcoran, a dream? A dream which has kept repeating itself till I grew superstitious about it. A red-faced man with a purplish sort of mustache I saw coming between you and us, or looking at me out of a dark recess, something like a deep doorway. Borrow said when I told him I was describing your man, Corcoran, whose place he took on your yacht, Candace. Well, I'm hanged, if that's not the rummiest go. I only hope he's not in that recess or deep doorway now, if it leads into your mountain. You remember, Varro, my telling you he'd been alone for a while in the sitting room I use as an office at the Sami Ramis Hotel, and had had a good chance if he wanted to browse among my papers? Well, I didn't mention this to you at the time, but an unsigned contract with you for your services, in return for all my rights in the Mountain of the Golden Pyramid, was lying on the desk. As for the contract he's showing here, it could have only been for the trip, but it showed him to be my agent right enough. And there were two confidential letters on my desk, one from a man I'd written to, an Egyptological chap, saying in his opinion there might be a tomb in the mountain, the other, an answer, not finished, telling him I meant to run the risk and had secured the rights. You know how queer I thought it, Corcoran should throw up his job, which was paying him pretty well? 
But it wasn't my business, and I was jolly glad to be rid of him as it happened. Well, here we have the mystery explained. Not quite yet. I wish we had, I said, thinking of the sly old poacher on our preserves, who had perhaps by this time skimmed the cream off the secret. It was easy to guess why he had sent away his workers, if indeed he had imagined himself on the eve of a discovery. Rights to Dick are given on the understanding that the Egyptian government shall have half of everything found, worth the taking. Corcoran's scheme to be alone must mean that he intended annexing what treasure he could carry off, and then getting out of the bad business. Already six days had passed since the Arabs and the Nubians had left him alone in his camp, and, though it was lucky that we had learned what was going on, it might be too late to profit by the information. Even if we caught Corcoran red-handed, he might have hidden his spoil where none but he, or some messenger, could ever find it. "'You'll go with us out to the mountain, Sir Marcus?' I went on. "'We'll be ready to start.' But Sir Marcus had suddenly become deaf. He had turned as if to gaze after the long-ago departed train. Instead of answering me, he was stalking off toward a group of people at the far end of the platform, three ladies and two men in khaki. For a second I felt an impulse of indignation. Cheek of him to march away like that, not caring much that we had been robbed, largely through his carelessness and by one of his own men. But the indignation turned to surprise, sheer incredulous amazement. I glanced at Anthony to learn whether he had seen, but he was beckoning the old wise man of the desert. Fenton, said I, it seems we weren't the only passengers to get off here. There are three people we know, talking to two we don't. Anthony looked. Great Scott, said he, and in another instant we were following Sir Marcus hastily along the platform to greet, or a skull, we weren't sure which it ought to be, the big-hatted, green-veiled, khaki-dressed, but easily recognized figures of Bridget O'Brien, Monty Gilder, and Mrs. East. We couldn't help it, Monty cried in self-defense to Anthony, before he had time to reach the group. We knew you wouldn't let us come, so we came, because we had to be in this with you. Even Biddy wanted to, and she's so wise. As for Aunt Clara, I believe she'd have started off without us if we hadn't been wild for the journey. So you see how it was. We did see, and we couldn't help rejoicing in their pluck, as well as in the sight of them, though it was all against our common sense. We've ordered our own camels and a tent and things to eat and drink, so we shan't be any bother to you, Monty went on, as Anthony rather gravely shook hands, his eager brows lifted, his eyes smiling in spite of himself. We couldn't have done it if it hadn't been for Zlatan Pasha. We first went and confided everything to him, because we knew he loved adventures and would be sure to sympathize. These gentlemen from the camp are his friends, and they've organized our little expedition at his request. More than one person can use the telegraph, you know. And, oh, won't it be lovely going with you out into the desert? It was not yet evening when we set forth, but it was the birth of another day when we arrived within sight of Corcoran's camp. The tents glimmered pale in the light which comes up out of the desert before dawn, as light rises from the sea, and so deep was the stillness that it might have been a ghost camp. There was not even the howling of a dog, and this silence was more eerie than the silence of sleep in a lonely place, because of the tale a grandson of Osmax had brought to the village. He was one of the Nubian men Corcoran had engaged to help his Arab workmen from the north, and when the whole gang had been discharged, he, suspecting that some secret thing was afoot, hid in the desert scrub that he might return by night to spy. He had wished his brothers to stay with him, but they, fearing the jinns who haunt the mountain and have power at night, refused and begged him to come away lest he be struck by a terrible death. The legend was that Queen Candace, the queen who ordered the making of the tomb, had been a witch. When she died, by her magic arts learned from the lost book of Thoth, she had turned all those aware of the tomb's existence into jinns to guard the secret dwelling of her soul. Even the great men of the court, who, by her wish, hid in the mountain her body and jewels and treasure, became jinns the moment they had closed and concealed the entrance to the tomb. They could never impart this secret to mortals, and because of the knowledge which burned within their hearts, and the anguish of being parted forever from those they loved, the tortured spirits in prison grew malevolent. While the sun, still worshipped by them as Ra, was above the horizon, they had no power over men. But the moment that Ra died his red death, 
the djinns could destroy those who ventured within such a distance of the mountain as its shadow might reach and if any man ventured nearer in the darkness of night he heard the wailing of the spirits camp had been pitched beyond the shadow's farthest reach but the night after the workmen were discharged asmak's one brave grandson had been led by curiosity to approach the haunted mountain when he had crept within the trench most lately dug he had heard the wicked voice of the jinns raging and quarrelling together there had been a threatening cry when they knew how a man had defied their power and the nubian had escaped a fate too horrible to put into words only by running running until his breath gave out and the sun rose the story gave the silent desert power even over european minds as we came where the small camp glimmered just outside the shadows wicked circle not one of asmak's men would go with us to the tent which was evidently that of the leader he might be lying there dead struck by the jinns they said and all those who looked upon the body would be accursed the three women would not have gone to corcoran's tent even had we allowed them to do so and sir marcus already a slave though a willing one stayed with his adored lady and her friends inside the ring which the nubians proceeded to make with the camels carrying a lighted lantern anthony and i walked alone to the tent the flap was down but not fastened and the canvas moved slightly as if trembling fingers tried to hold it taut colonel corcoran i called out sharply but there was no answer end of chapter 31 Chapter Thirty Two of It Happened in Egypt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It Happened in Egypt by Charles Norris Williamson and Alice Muriel Williamson. Chapter Thirty Two: The Secret. Anthony lifted the flap, holding up the lantern, and we both looked in. No one was there, but the tent had the look of recent occupation. It was neatly arranged as the tent of an old soldier should be, but on the table stood a half-used candle stuck in a bottle, and beside it a book lay open, face downward. Entering the tent, the first thing I did was to glance at the title of this book. It was a learned archaeological treatise. Here and there, a paragraph was marked, and the leaves dog-eared. Three other volumes of the same sort were piled one upon the other. Anthony and I had read all four during the last few months since our minds had concentrated on the subject of pyramids and rock tombs. "What do you think has become of Corcoran?" I said to Anthony. "I think the jinns have got him," he answered gravely. "You mean, I don't know quite what I mean, but he must have hit upon something and then have been prevented from coming back." Why should he have had such luck after a few weeks' work, an unscientific fellow like him, if the secret of the mountain has been inviolate for over two thousand years? Wait and see what's happened to him before you call it luck, Duffer. But you must remember that nobody except Ferlini and a few superstitious blacks ever believed that the mountain had a secret. Incredulity has protected it, and Corcoran had to work like a thousand devils if he hoped to get hold of anything before he was found out. I believe he has got hold of something, and that it then got hold of him. But we shall see. Yes, we shall see. I repeated, and before long, if we too have luck, I hope it won't be the same kind as his. But come along out of this. We must get to work before sunrise and try for a result of some sort before the worst of the heat. If he's found anything, we ought pretty quickly to profit by his weeks of frantic labor. That maybe will be our revenge. We had to tell the party what we had found in the tent and what we meant to do next. Sir Marcus was now excused by Mrs. East, but until summoned by us, the ladies were to remain where they were, under shelter of the tent which the camel boys were getting into shape. When exhorted to be patient, they received the advice in sweet silence, but we did not until later attach much importance to this unusual mood. Perhaps at that moment we were too preoccupied to notice expressions. Even in the eyes we loved best, we took with us two men whom Asmak had provided as diggers, and in five minutes we were at the base of the little dark conical mountain, which for weeks had been the object of our dreams. Now, standing face to face with it, the glamour faded. The mountain of the Golden Pyramid was exactly like a dozen other tumbled shapes of black rock, 
grouped or scattered over the dull clay desert which many centuries ago had been the fertile realm of Candace. Why should a queen have selected it from among its lumpish fellows to do its secret honor? But Corcoran had had faith. Here were traces of what Fenton called his frantic labors. A parallel trench had been dug with the evident object of unearthing a buried entrance into the mountain. Down it went through hardened sand and clay to a depth of eight or ten feet, and descending we found, as we expected to do, several low tunnels driven at right angles toward the mountain itself. One after another we entered, crawling on hands and knees, only to come up against a solid wall of rock at the end. Each of these burrows represented just so much toil and disappointment. But Corcoran, whose undertaking could be justified even to his own mind only by success, had not been discouraged. The trench went round three sides of the mountain, as we soon discovered, and the corner of the fourth facade, not having yet been turned, it seemed a sign that Corcoran had, as Anthony said, hit upon something, or thought that he had done so. Otherwise he would not have discharged his men before the fourth gallery was begun. We had started from the south because our camp faced the long trench on that side, and it was quicker to jump into it than to walk round and examine the excavations from ground level. On the east, the plan of the work was the same as on the south, except that the tunnels leading mountainward were driven at different distances, relatively to each other, and each of these also ended in a cul-de-sac now remained in the trench on the north side of the mountain, which was the most promising direction for a find, and as we turned the corner which brought us into the third trench the sun rose, making the sky blossom like the primrose fields of heaven. On this side, sand driven by the northerly wind, which never rests itself, had banked itself high against the mountain, and the excavation had been a more serious task. There were only two tunnels, and into both sand had fallen. One was nearly blocked up, and impossible to enter without reopening, but we took it for granted, hopefully, that the second had been made later. This ran toward the mountain with a northeasterly slant, and, though it was partly choked by sand, it was possible to crawl in. Anthony insisted on going first. I followed, at the pace of my early ancestor the worm, and Sir Marcus comfortably waited outside. He wanted to be a pioneer only in financial paths, and after all, this was our mountain now. It wasn't worth his while to be killed in it. Besides, as he pointed out, if anything happened to us, there must be someone to organize a rescue and break the news to the ladies. Anthony had a small electric torch and I a lantern, but, going on hands and knees, we could use the lights only now and then. When we had crept ahead, descending always, for twelve or fifteen feet, Anthony stopped. Hello, I heard him call, in a muffled, reverberating voice. Here's the reason why Corcoran sent his Arabs away. What is it? I yelled, my heart jumping. The rock's been cut back by the hands of men. His men, perhaps. No, it isn't done like that nowadays. The tunnel turns here, dips down, and goes on along this flat wall. I bet Corcoran always kept ahead of the men. When he saw this, he discharged his workers, and yet it may be nothing of importance after all. Only a flat surface for some old wall inscription, such as Romans and even Egyptian soldiers made constantly on the march. The rumbling voice ceased as Anthony crawled round the turn of the passage. I followed, literally close on his heels, the burrow descending like a rabbit hole. Suddenly Anthony stopped again. I've come into a sort of chamber Corcoran scooped out, I heard him say. It's high enough to sit up in, no, to stand up in. This is the end of the passage, I think. By Jove, look out! He had disappeared in the darkness behind a higher arch in the roof of the gallery. As he cried out, I slipped through after him, slid down a steep, abrupt slope, and by the light of my agitated lantern saw Anthony standing waist-deep in a well-like hole, into which he had evidently stumbled. Let me give you a hand up, I said. No, thank you, he answered in a tense, excited voice. This is where I want to be. Look! I looked and saw, at the bottom of the scooped-out hole, a crevice in the flat wall of rock which we had been following down the passage, after its turn from the right angle to creep along the mountainside. Out of this crevice protruded a large iron crowbar, apparently jammed into place, the first tool we had seen anywhere. 
The chamber in which I stood was littered and piled up with hard masses of earth, which had been thrown out of the hole, and on the rough floor of the ladder I stepped on the spade which had done the work. It nearly turned my ankle as I jumped onto it, but I hardly felt the pain. Torch and lantern showed clearly that the crevice in the wall was not a natural crack, but a man-made opening. It was as if a slab of rock fitted roughly into grooves had first been lifted and had then fallen heavily onto the crowbar. I set the lantern on the earthy floor and its yellow light streamed through the crack whence the crowbar protruded, like a black pipe in a negro's mouth. It was all darkness on the other side. From behind the screen of rock, set in its deep grooves, came the strangest sound I ever heard or shall ever hear. It was a voice, groaning, yet it was not like a human voice. The horrid idea jumped into my head that it was the howl of an evil spirit sitting in a dead man's skull. "'He's alive, then,' exclaimed Anthony, pale in the sickly light. "'Is that you, Corcoran?' he called. The only answer was another groan. "'I see the whole business now, don't you?' Fenton said. "'This passage is very steep. Already it was far underground level before we got to the cutting on the mountain wall, and it must have been underground level for many centuries. They dug deep down to make the tomb, and then covered up the entrance with earth. When Corcoran got to his portcullis, he thought he'd reached the reward of his labors. Well, so he had, the punishment. Here's the heap of stone he used as a fulcrum for his lever. The heap tumbled when he was on the other side, and the slab of rock came down to trap him. We'll have to build up his fulcrum again before we can do anything ourselves. Together we forced the flat end of the crowbar into the crevice, pressed a piece of rock under it, and exerted all our strength. The slab moved upward an inch or two, grating in its rough grooves. The crack, no higher than the diameter of the crowbar, plus a stone or two when we first saw it, was now twice its original height. In went another stone, and so on. We worked like demons in hell, and in an atmosphere almost as hot and breathless. Yet we could breathe. Whether all the air we got came through the long, twisting passage Corcoran had made, or whether there were ventilation from the other side of the rock curtain, some opening in an unseen cave, we could not tell. All we knew was that the mountain had a secret, and that the man who had tried to rob us of our rights to it was caught in the trap of the djinns. Our rights! How fragile as spider webs! How almost laughable they seem down here! Rights we had bargained for with men, which they, not owning them, had gravely given. I suddenly realized, and I think Anthony realized, as sweating and silent we piled up the fulcrum of stone thrown down by the djinns, that they alone, or the sleeping queen they guarded, had rights in this hidden place. When we had raised the slab to a height of about two feet in its grooves, and had made sure that the stones held it firmly in place, we told each other that it was time to cross the threshold. The rock door was scarcely more than a yard in width, and we crawled through in single file, Anthony going ahead as before with his torch. I passed my lantern in after him and then followed. As I crept through the narrow aperture, I was conscious, among other emotions, of vague disappointment. If this is the way to a tomb, and the only way, there can't be anything very fine to discover, I said to myself, why the entrance isn't big enough to let in a decent-sized sarcophagus. It's the man of my dreams, all right, and he's lying close to a deep-set doorway, like the one where I've seen him so often. I told you so, Anthony was saying in quite a commonplace voice, as I picked myself up on the other side of the rock screen. We were in a small chamber, more roughly hewn, and not so large as the inner sanctuary of Abu Simbel, which I had such good cause to remember. Exactly opposite the entrance by which we had come in was, as Anthony had said, a door, deeply set in the rock, a door of the same type as that through which we had passed, and in the shadow of the overhanging arch lay the heavy figure of Colonel Corcoran, dressed in khaki. His eyes were open, but he did not stir as we bent over him. Only his lips moved slightly, as if he were making a grimace. "'He's trying to ask for something to eat or drink,' said Fenton. "'What a confounded fool I am! I've nothing, not even a flask. Have you?' "'No, I'll go back at once and get something,' I answered. "'Strange, but I was not in the least angry with Corcoran, whom I had been execrating. Perhaps this was partly because the impression that the djinns had sole rights here was growing stronger every moment.' We were all interlopers, usurpers. 
Without stopping for more words, I turned my back to the secret still unsolved. To my surprise, however, I saw a light, stronger than our own, shining outside the partly raised screen of rock. Getting on my knees to crawl out, my face almost met the face of Monty Gilder, about to crawl in. Involuntarily I gave way, and in she crept like a big baby, Biddy coming after. Then we laughed, though I had seldom felt less like laughing. And the echo of our laughter was as if the spirits laughed behind our backs. We never promised we wouldn't come, Monty hastily began, before Anthony could speak. We just kept still, and Sir Marcus thought you wouldn't much mind, because the two nicest Nubians brought us quite safely. Oh, isn't it wonderful? And to be here when you open that door. But, why, it isn't one of our men with you. It's, it's the thief. Don't call him names now, dearest, Bridget begged. Poor wretch, he looks nearly dead. What a good thing we brought the biscuits and brandy. I was going for some, I said. Not only had I got to my feet again, but had helped Biddy to hers, and Anthony had snatched his tall Monty up as if she had been a bundle of thistle down. The angels! It would never have done to tell them how glad we were that they had disobeyed us. It was Providence, apparently, not Marcus Lark, who had sent them to the rescue. We thought perhaps if you found anything interesting, you'd want to stay with it a long time, explained Monty. That's why we brought you food and drink. It's a good thing we came, isn't it? Fenton and I did not answer. Indeed, we occupied ourselves with ministering to the enemy, a few bits of crumbled biscuit, a few drops of brandy to moisten them. He mumbled and swallowed and choked, and slowly the venous red came back to the flabby gray cheeks, with their prickles of sprouting beard. "'It's fresh air he needs now,' said Anthony. "'He won't die from two or three days fasting, not he. "'And it can't be more, for it would have taken him days and nights of hard work to get here "'after his men were sent off. "'Jove, I believe it's more funk than anything else that's laid him low. "'Thought he was done for and all that. "'Look, there's his candle lantern upset on the floor. "'It couldn't have been very gay for him when the light went out. "'Lend a hand, Duffer, and we'll give him to the Nubians the girls have brought.' They'll carry him to his own tent. He never got as far as the second door here, so we needn't search him. Otherwise I would, like a shot. Yes, it was something higher than a mere financier who sent the girls to us in the antechamber of the secret. We could not, for their own sakes, have risked bringing them. But here they were, and we should always have this memory together, we told ourselves, though we did not tell the disobedient ones. That would have been a bad precedent. What there was to see, they would see with us, and even the jinns could not work harm to angels. We went out and collected more stones with which to prop up the second screen of rock, which was not so thick as the first, and used Corcoran's spade to hold it up at last. Beyond was another roughly hewn chamber, and at the far end, set in a curiously fitted frame of wood, a wooden door, looking almost as new as though it had been made yesterday. Anthony flashed his electric torch over it, and we saw the grain of deal. There was a bronze lock and a latch of strange, crude workmanship which Monty touched deprecatingly. May I? she half whispered, for to her also the place was haunted. She seemed to ask permission of spirits rather than of her lover. But the latch did not move. It would be sacrilege to break the lock, she said. What shall you do? Take the door off its supports. They're not hinges, Fenton answered. In the queer low tone, which somehow we all instinctively adopted. We've got one or two implements that may help to do the trick. He worked cautiously, even tenderly, for this queen's secret was our secret in the finding, even if the right to it was in the keeping of the gins. Monty held my lantern, and it was a good half hour before Anthony and I together could carefully lift the deal door, unbroken, from its place. Still Monty held a lantern, and at the threshold of a dimly seen room beyond, we all drew back, for on the sanded floor were footprints. To them the girl pointed, her eyes turning to Anthony's face, as if to ask, How can it be that anyone came in when the door was locked and there was that screen of rock to raise? But as we looked, over one another's shoulders, we realized that the prints were not made by modern boots. They were the marks of sandals, and they went across the floor to a thing that glittered in the middle of the room, a vague shape like a draped coffin, with something high and pointed on top, crossed to a glittering table on which a ray from the lantern revealed offerings to the dead, a loaf, a roasted duck, its wings neatly tied with string, 
cakes and fruit, all dried and blackened, but perfect in form, and a saucer of incense, from which a little ash had fallen from a ghostly pastille onto the table. There the sandaled feet had paused, while the incense caught a spark, and moving on had walked straight to the door. A faint fragrance from perfume jars came to our nostrils, a strange, subtle fragrance still, though most of its sweetness had gone, leaving more marked the smell of fat which had held the perfume all these years, while civilizations grew up and perished. The man who had lit the incense and locked the door seemed to have hurried back from who knew where to stand behind us, saying, I forbid you entrance in the name of the ancient gods. We could not see him nor hear his voice, but we could feel that he was there, and something in us revolted against the ruthlessness of disobeying, of forcing our way into the room in spite of him to crush his footprints with ours. Why does the sand glitter so? Monty asked. Everything glitters. Everything looks as if it were made of gold. The mountain of the golden pyramid, Biddy murmured. Go in first, you two, and bless the place, I said, my heart wildly beating. They obeyed for once, moving delicately as if to music, which ears of men were not fine enough to hear. They went hand in hand, and as Monty, in her straight, pale-tinted dress, held up the lantern, I thought of the wise virgin. When this room had last been lighted, the parable of the virgins of the lamps was yet unspoken. It is not sand, said Monty, gasping a little in the heavy air. It is sprinkled gold dust. Now it is on the soles of our feet. It shines, it shines. Anthony and I followed, still with that curious sense of hesitation, as if we ought to apologize to someone. The room of the dead was very close, and we drew our breath with difficulty for a moment. But the discomfort passed. Mechanically, we avoided the footmarks printed in gold, avoided them as if they had been covered by invisible feet. Monty was right. Everything was gold, and it shone, it shone. Dust from the terrible mines of Nub, whence the convict miners never returned, lay thickly scattered over the rock floor. The walls of rock were plastered with gold leaf, as high as the low ceiling, and upon the ceiling itself, on a background of deep blue color, was traced in gold the form of Nut, goddess of night, her long arms outspread across an azure sky of golden stars. The table of offerings was decorated with gold in barbaric patterns, and the saucer which held the burnt pastille of incense was of gold, crudely designed but beautiful. Cloth of gold, soft as old linen, draped a coffin in the center of the room, and hid the conical object on the coffin's lid. On a sudden, half-savage impulse I lifted the covering, with a pang of fear lest the fabric should drop to pieces. But it did not. Its limp yet heavy folds fell across my feet, as I stood looking at the wonderful thing it had concealed. There was no sarcophagus of stone. The doors leading to the rock tomb were not large enough to have emitted one. Instead, there was an extraordinarily high, narrow coffin or mummy case, richly gilded and decorated with intricate designs different from any I had seen in the museum at Cairo. The top of the case represented the figure of a woman, with a smiling golden face, painted lips, and hair. But the strangeness and wonder were under the long eyelids and in the woman's hands. The slanting eyes had each an immense Kabuchan emerald set for its iris, set round with brilliant stones like diamonds, curiously cut, and the carved, gilded hands of wood, with realistic fingers, wearing rings, were clasped round a pyramid of gold. This it was which had betrayed its conical shape through the drapery of gold cloth. The opening in the miniature pyramid was not concealed. There was a little door, guarded by a tiny golden sphinx, and on the neck of the sphinx, suspended by a delicate chain, was a bell. It is to call the spirit of the queen if a profane touch should violate her tomb, Fenton said dreamily. He was beginning to look like a man hypnotized. Perhaps it was the close air with its lingering perfume of two thousand years ago. Perhaps it was something else, more subtle, something that we could all feel, as one feels the touch of a living hand that moves under a cloak. No one spoke for an instant. I think we half expected the bell to ring. Then Fenton said, Monty, you and Mrs. O'Brien must choose which is to have the privilege of finding out the secret of the Golden Pyramid. The Duffer and I want it to be one of you. Oh, no, not I, cried Monty, almost angrily. Nor I, Biddy firmly echoed. Duffer, the papers were yours. Will you... Anthony began, 
No, I... It was your faith in the mountain that brought us to it, I reminded him. It ought to be you. If... If it ought to be any of us, Monty broke in, with a little breathless catch in her voice. If... But what do you mean? Anthony turned, an odd, startled look upon the girl. I hardly know what I mean. Only, I couldn't touch anything here. They are hers. They've been hers for two thousand and two hundred years. I never thought I should feel like this. I'd rather drop dead this minute than try to take that little pyramid out of those golden hands. They've clasped it so long. She wanted so much to keep the secret, Anthony. This is the strongest feeling that ever came into my heart, except love for you, this feeling that we have no right, that it would be monstrous to rob this queen. It wouldn't be robbing, Anthony said heavily. We have the right. Oh, I wonder, Biddy whispered. What would become of museums if everybody felt as you suddenly feel, or think you feel, Fenton went on. If it were wrong to open tombs, the best men in Egypt... Not wrong, perhaps, Monty explained. But, oh, I'm sure you understand. I'm sure in your hearts you both, you men, feel just as we do now we're in this wonderful secret place. That something forbids. I don't know whether it's something in ourselves or outside, but it's here. It says, no, whatever others do, you cannot do this thing. If you didn't feel it, you would have taken the pyramid out of those poor hands and tried to tear off the rings and open the coffin itself to get at the mummy. But you haven't, either of you. You don't want to do it. You can't. I dare one of you to tell me it's only for Biddy and me that you've kept your hands off. We've come a long way and have done a good deal to find this secret that we expected Egypt to give us, I said dully, instead of answering her challenge. Monty had no argument for me. She turned to Anthony. The secret you expected Egypt to give, she echoed, and hasn't Egypt given you a secret? Yes, said Anthony. Egypt has given us a secret, the greatest secret of all. But, is there a but? I wonder if that isn't the only secret which one can open and learn by heart, without breaking the charm. Biddy seemed to be speaking to herself, but we heard. The secret of love goes on forever being a secret, doesn't it? The more you find out about it, just as the world and its beauty grows greater and more wonderful the higher you climb up a mountain. But other secrets, you find them out and they're gone, like a bright soap bubble. Nothing can mend broken romance. If we didn't touch anything here, what a memory this would be to carry away, Monty said. Don't you remember, Anthony, my saying once how I loved to dream of all the beautiful lost things, hidden beneath the sea and earth, never to be found while the world lasts, and stuck miserably under glass cases? You said you felt the same in some moods. I love those moods. I felt... I feel so about things in general, Anthony admitted. It was my romantic side you appealed to. Have you a better side? No better, but more practical. This isn't things in general. It's a thing particular, personal, and definite. If we should be chaotic enough not to take what we've earned the right to take, we should be called fools. Instead of claiming our half, the Egyptian government would get all. Let it, Monty cried. A government is a big, cold, soulless impersonality. It could never know the thrill that's in our blood this wonderful minute, or miss the thrill if it were destroyed. Do you mind being called a fool, Anthony, and you, Lord Ernest? Anthony was silent, but something made me speak. I don't mind. You know, I've always been a duffer. Our future largely depends on this, Fenton persisted, with a conscientious wish to persuade us and himself. I believe it does, Monty strangely agreed with him. What do you mean? Anthony's voice was suddenly sharp with some emotion, which sounded more like anxiety than anger. Do you mean that if Ernest, Borrow, and I insist on our rights to whatever treasure is hidden here, you and Mrs. O'Brien will think less of us? Not less. Nothing you could do would make us think less after all that has happened to us together. But could it ever be as it has been, as beautiful, as sweet, with all the dearest kind of romance in our thoughts of you? You see, you have the glory of finding the secret. Queen Candace saved it for you. She wouldn't give it to such a man as Colonel Corcoran. She knew he wouldn't respect her. Maybe she hoped you would. I seem to hear her saying so. All this gold and the treasure we haven't seen is hers. It's been hers for more than two thousand years. Why should we steal it? We aren't a horrid, cold government. It won't be our fault, whatever a government may choose to do. She'll know that, and so shall we. Besides, we can beg to have the tomb kept like this for a great shrine of the Marot. 
Our memory of this place can't have the glamour torn away, whatever happens. Nothing sordid will come between it and us, as it would if... Why, after all, where's the great difference between opening the coffin of a woman dead thousands of years ago, or a few months? Supposing people wanted to dig up Queen Elizabeth to see what had been buried with her. Or Napoleon. What an outcry there'd be all over the world. This poor queen is defenseless because her civilization is dead too. Could you force open the lid of her coffin, Lord Ernest, and take the jewels off her neck? Just now I feel as if I couldn't, I confessed humbly. And you, Anthony? What if I died and asked to have the jewels I loved because you'd given them, put on my body, to lie there till eternity, and... Don't, Anthony cut her short. There are some things I can't listen to from you. And some things you can't do. You may think you could, but go ahead and take the golden pyramid out of those golden hands if you can. I shall not take it, said Anthony. I shall never take it now. You must know that. I'm not saying I shan't go on loving you if you go against me. I shall love you always. I can't help that. But that's it, the but. Let it all go. At least we've had the adventure, and we've got love. I don't want the treasure now, or the secret. I give up my part in them forever. For me? Yes, for you, but there's something more. Another reason? I think so. Frankly, it isn't all for you. Only you've made me feel it. Without you, I might have felt it, but too late. If there's a drop of Egyptian blood in my veins, why, yes, it must be that, telling me the same thing that you have told. This Egyptian queen may lose her treasure, and must lose her secret, but it won't be through me. And because you wouldn't steal them, she has given you the secret and the treasure, the best of both with her royal blessing, Biddy said. This is what Ferlini's papers and the legends really meant for you in earnest. Everything that's happened, not only in Egypt, but in our whole lives, has been leading up to the discovery of the treasure and the secret that we can take without stealing. Do you know what I'm talking about? And if you do, was it worth coming so far to find, this treasure that I mean and the secret? We know very well, Anthony said, and you know that we realize it was worth journeying to the end of the world for, or into the next. Or into the next, Monty echoed. Here we're on the threshold of the next. That's why the Queen's blessing feels so near. The End End of Chapter 32 End of It Happened in Egypt Read by Sibella Denton in October-November 2007 in Carrollton, Georgia. Thank you.